Oh my goodness. Hello, everybody. We're so excited to be back for another Own Your Growth. Normally, you would see Colin and myself up here at the beginning, having a little chat with you guys, letting you know what's to come, trying to be funny, trying to like warm up that whole host duo comedy act that we have not quite nailed. So we actually figured that we'd have somebody who is funny for a living come and uh, talk to you guys first and said. So without further ado, I would like to introduce you to the incomparable corporate bro. Ah, thank you. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. And welcome to the Own Your Growth Conference brought to you by, well, of course, Predictable Revenue, where for the next two days, you will learn how to improve your revenue strategies from the high level, like marketing ideation sessions over some frosty kombuchas down to the tactical, like salespeople making cold calls in the trenches. I don't know about y'all, but I am, oh God, quaking with excitement. I'm talking Addy on an empty stomach during finals week type jacked up. Truth is, I took some pre-workout powder, so I am on one right now and sweating profusely, but I'm here, so let's do this. My name is Corporate Bro, or as my mom calls me, her happy little mistake, I am the self-described master of the persuasive arts and purveyor of the acronym SADNESS, which stands for Sales Are Dope, Never Ever Stop Selling. For those of you who have never heard of me, um, <laughs> Mm, well, that's a you problem. And you either miss quota or you've never carried a quota. But for those of you who have heard of me, ah, it's so lovely to see you. Yes, as the schedule states, I am a comedian, apparently strictly in the B2B sales space, an awfully narrow point of view. I certainly didn't write that. But I guess what comic doesn't want to be strictly tied to arguably the most annoying profession on earth? Just saying. So yes, Given I've clearly limited my own growth opportunities, I am the perfect candidate to kick off a conference about growth. So what's my relationship to revenue? Well, this may shock you, but I was a sales guy. Enterprise life. In fact, I sold for Oracle. Ever heard of him? Practically built that place. Of course, Larry would never admit it. He was probably just threatened by my power grab after hitting 119% in Q3. So I had to go. And now look at him. <laughs> only made 10.4 billion this past year. So it's safe to say they miss me. Case in point, Larry. I also dipped my toe in the proverbial waters of the startup sales game. And that was a real treat. We were all paid 20% under market, but it was okay because we were on a rocket ship to the IPO stratosphere. Of course, rather than being Apollo 11 and landing on the moon, we ended up like the challenger in a ball of flames cascading elegantly back to earth in front of the eyes of TechCrunch and BuzzFeed. But don't worry, in this story, not everybody got hurt. Our CEO did receive a massive payout, hashtag blessed, thank God. So yeah, I've spent some time in the revenue game. Through the ups and downs, I can confidently say that I am a shining example of just how far mediocrity can go. If you wanna know more, you can Google me like an adult, or you can check me out on Instagram at corporate bro, where I post sketch comedy every week like a machine. But enough about my colorful history. I love speaking at these events, especially when we're talking about revenue because, you know, making money is super tight. I love it because I get to speak to the most critical functions of a business as well as marketing. But perhaps most importantly, I get to tell boomer executives to stop doing TikToks because no, it's not cool. And no, watching them move with the rhythm of a three-legged hippo is not exactly good for business. Now, we're here today because as the program says, in these overflowing times, everything just feels noisy and unfocused. We wanna help you reconnect with yourself, get centered and rebuild your revenue strategy. Now, if that event description doesn't wear a saggy beanie unironically and drink oat milk, I don't know what does. But how are we going to rebuild our revenue strategies? It's a fair question. And I think we're all asking ourselves that. Maybe not full rebuilds, but I think we all have room to grow. We've got Poor BDRs, SDRs, MDRs, ADRs, XDRs, or whatever acronym your company calls them being just churned and burned. We look at them with disdain and, dis and disgust and we say, why aren't you doing better? We tell them to pick up the phone, make more calls. You're the tip of our revenue spear and we need to start generating that shit or else we're all gonna be on the streets cold calling for, flute, for food. This of course coming off the heels of a year that was dark, trying, I mean, dare I say, unprecedented. Last year got weird out there, fam. And only recently have things begun to shift back to normalcy. But we can't just get back on the bike and expect to be Lance Armstrong just like that. Unless, of course, you're 
me, who's been hitting the Peloton every single day for months. Shakira said her hips don't lie. Well, thanks to Alex Toussaint and Cody Rigsby, my thighs don't lie, people. They make up 42% of my body weight. Think about that. It's honestly insane. And it kind of grosses people out, but I like them. Anyway, what was I even saying? Oh, yes. Precedented times. They're back, right? No, they're not back. They'll never be back. And we have to adjust accordingly. Adapt or die, as they say. And who's they? The adapters, obviously. But how do we do that? Well, over the next two days, you're going to learn from people far more qualified than I. Right after my incoherent diatribe, you'll get to hear David Premier talk about how sales reps need to stop selling value. Because at this point, I think it's pretty apparent to everyone that more often than not, we don't provide any. He says, we got to stop trying to convince buyers that spending money on a product or service will result in tangible financial return, aka ROI. I think that's personally because prospects know we can't do math. So those numbers are obviously made up. And frankly, salespeople numbers have always had a tough relationship. Forecasts made up, discounts, arbitrary, quotas, stressful. The only time you'll see a salesperson do well with numbers is when it comes to calculating commission. And then suddenly they're certified CPAs with data science certificates from Harvard. It's not our fault though. We spent all of our years in elementary and middle school with the expectation that we wouldn't need to learn math because we were gonna be professional athletes and movie stars. By the time we realized that wasn't gonna pan out, it was too late. Someone should have crushed our dreams a lot earlier because with no hard skills and a penchant for conversation, we were left with one option, get on the phones and make strangers buy stuff from us. And it's a tough gig, no lie. But as far as I'm concerned, sales is the most important skill you can have on earth. You're all selling something, a product, a service, an idea, your politics, your mom on why you deserve to stay on the family cell plane at 32 years old. We are winning that battle, by the way. A CEO sells a vision. Marketers sell a brand. IT sells you on why you shouldn't click on a phishing email even when they're advertising discounted Coachella tickets. Sales isn't just convincing someone to buy a pen. It's all the little things. Staying on top of next steps, logging call notes, booking the next meeting, looping in other stakeholders, telling your manager it's going to be fine even though it's not. It's all about the details where the devil lives and my manager. And I've actually never seen them in the same room, so I'm just saying. My manager is right, though, because the sum of all these little closes leads to the big close. Revenue. So what does the predictable revenue team have in store for y'all? At 12.15 today, you will hear a keynote from Mark Roberge. Mark is the managing director at Stage 2 Capital, named after all the qualified meetings he set back when he was an SDR. He got his MBA from MIT's Sloan School of Management, and he's a visiting lecturer at Harvard, which means only one thing, people. He couldn't get into Stanford. Sorry, Mark. I'll talk slow for you. But Mark is going to teach us uh, how to avoid growth potholes and I really can't miss that one because I find myself in a growth pothole nearly every single night at this point. It's a dark, dark pothole where I can't stop eating munchies. And the next thing I know, I've watched seven episodes of Too Hot to Handle. I can't even believe Chloe and Bryce were, you know what? I'm not going to get into that right now. Okay. Not getting into it. Instead, I'm going to listen to that keynote by Marky Mark. And another big keynote on the sketch, John Miller, CMO of Demand Base, who apparently predicted marketing automation, which is crazy because, you know, the fact that he's a fortune teller, but unsurprising because he did get into Stanford, go card. But he's gonna tell y'all what's next on the marketing horizon and how to prepare for it. I'm assuming it's more webinars and shitty leads, but what do I know? I'm just a sales guy who can barely read. And speaking of reading, for those of you who've gotten your greasy paws all over Aaron Ross's predictable revenue book, you know it's a page turner. And I don't wanna ruin the twist at the end, but let's just say people's revenue was a bit more, God, how do I say this? Predictable. And it was sick, M. Night Shyamalan-esque. Seriously, though, people, this is going to be a live stream AMA where some folks will be asking Aaron questions about his book. If you have questions, you can get them answered either in the live chat or in the Slack community. Regardless, tune in unless you want unpredictable revenue, your choice. In addition to the keynotes, there will be several other talks throughout the conference. But if you're worried about spending all your brain power and not being able to absorb all of this priceless information, don't. Because in classic marketing form, Predictable Revenue's own Julia Heeson will be leading a yoga class to recharge your minds, bodies, and souls all from your desk. No need to change clothes, but it is BYOI. Bring your own incense. And finally, there's a giveaway going on, people. Free shit. Yes. Unfortunately, no donuts in the break room. I wish. But it's called Conversation Starter. Think of it as the virtual showroom floor at this conference, but instead of booths, 
You can actually find other attendees to connect with and learn from, or just cyber bully if you're in a bad mood. I'm kidding, don't do that unless you want to. You'll have the ability to browse relevant participants and send invitations for 12 minute video calls. It's super easy to use and there's nothing to install. So if you logged into this video conference then you are fully capable of using Conversation Starter. But because after all that, like I said, there is a giveaway folks. So yeah, if two or more people from the same company sign up for Conversation Starter, then you have a chance to win a consultation by one of the in-house predictable revenue experts and one of 10 digital copies of the best-selling predictable revenue book by the man, the myth, the legend, the revenue smarty pants, Aaron Ross. And since we're all here for revenue and numbers and all that shit, I should point out that the total value of this prize is 5,000 US American dollars. Or if you live in San Francisco, one month rent at a quaint studio apartment in the Tenderloin. So with that, let's send it back to Colin and Sarah, who love revenue and hate unpredictability. Thanks, man. All right. Sarah, you ready for this? Oh, you're on mute. I am on mute. There we go. All right. Two of us. Now let's get it done. That was much more energetic uh, intro than I think I could have accomplished. I got to respect the 400 cups of coffee he had to drink. Uh, that's yeah. what I would have taken to drink to get up to that level. Yeah. The pre-workout that he snorted before. <laughs> before starting that session for sure that was great solid good find good find i hadn't seen much yeah. of his, his stuff before and uh, I, I think i've seen a couple and it pop up my in my linkedin occasionally and yeah yeah that was good appreciate that it. that was really funny i love that love the personalized it's that's great that's something that can go down in the in the predictable revenue history book you know like we had our personalized comedic session to open our well, from our conference. Yeah, I'm a little chap. We got to bring our own incense to yoga. I thought, like, Julia sent us these t-shirts. The least you could have done. <laughs> some patchouli. Throw it in there. Make my it's room true. smell like a hippie. Yeah. That's what I would have liked. <laughs> awesome. Hey, Chad, you showing up to this yoga thing? This is definitely a different, I don't know. To me, it's a different thing that, that I've seen at a, at a virtual conference. You're going you're gonna to join us and watch Sarah and I make fools of ourselves while we try and stretch? Yeah, you've got to. You've got to, it's gonna be so fun. Yeah, this this whole conference is, is bigger and better and more fun and more interesting than the last ones. We're just getting better at this every single time. So I'm so excited that all of you guys have joined us for this one. <clears throat> having, yeah, a comedic intro, having Julia do yoga. It's becoming more and more like a real event, you know? It's not just, it's not just watching speakers. It's like interactive, it's got other stuff going on. So it's an exciting one to be a part of them. Yeah, I'm excited for this one, you guys. Totally. I'm being told that your name is not Mark Roberge. And so I've got that wrong. Um, <laughs> me? Yeah. Mark, yeah. yeah that's Going me. up to YouTube. That's I'll, me, Mark I'll Roberge. I'll find it. I'll find it. I'll find it. <laughs> Guys, give me a... All good. While you're doing that, Colin, I want to give a very well-deserved shout out to our sponsors. So Sales Hacker and Rev Genius, they helped us make this event possible. We're super happy that we all also get to share the virtual stage with both of these amazing companies. So please keep an eye out for their events that are coming up. Um, so don't miss the event with first Jared Robin. <clears throat> That is Rev Genius's co-founder. That is today at 1130 AM. And then tomorrow with Brooklyn Nash, who is Sales Hacker's head of content. So super exciting. Once again, thank you so much to those guys for partnering with us on this event, helping to get the word out. And we're so excited to have them grace the virtual stage with their intelligence and their presence. So yeah, exciting, exciting day. Lots coming up. I, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm super pumped. I, I was sitting there thinking like, okay, Where's the setting to, to nuke this and get, get our proper, our names back up. But, uh, I think I, I think I lost it. Yeah. Now I'll just be Sarah. You'll be corporate bro. I'll just bro. be Mark. Yeah. Okay. No, great. now you're corporate okay. bro. I'm Sarah. Now corporate bro. That's fine. I, I could swap them around. Big shoes to fill, but. There we go. No. Even bigger shoes to fill for it, you, Colin. No, it didn't work for me. Okay. Well, good. Yeah. No. All right. Well, I'm Sarah for day for today. That's okay. That's okay. You know what? I'm okay with that. Perfect. So coming up first, it's. David, right? I'm looking forward to this. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I had a good conversation with him last week. And uh, yeah, he's got an interesting, interesting history. We're going to talk a little bit about the cerebral selling. I know I'd, this is one of those things I've heard 
people talk about it. I've seen a lot of his content. I hadn't had a chance to actually have a conversation with him. Super interesting background. Sold a company to Salesforce, led, and then not like lots of people, I shouldn't say lots of people. There have been many people that have Salesforce has purchased, but there aren't that many that Salesforce purchased and then put in charge of like all of their sales for right. a very large group. That's a pretty unique skill set. And one that I'm confident I don't possess. <laughs> so I'm really looking forward to get a chance as like, get a chance to talk to this guy. He started his life as a research scientist and then got into sales by accident, as cool. I think we all did. Yeah, I think that's pretty safe to say. I, I think pretty much unanimously, any person that I speak to on the podcast or on an event, when I'm like, tell me about your history. Like, tell me how you got where you are today. They're like, well, I... I wanted to be this and then I stumbled into sales mm -hmm. and it's funny because lots of people tell it like, you know, like it's possibly a surprise. And then as time goes on, you're like, nobody ever deliberately got into sales. Actually, I, I don't know a single person who was like, I'm going to be a salesperson. And then I did it. No, I, I started off in marketing and chat. Let us know. Where did you did you start directly in sales? Sandra, good to see you. Rodrigo, Julio. I'll get to see all these regulars. Arthur. Yeah, Colin, tell us where you started. Lisa, Where'd you get your get your start. I don't want to admit it. Are you gonna make me say I started marketing? Yeah. <laughs> I think like corporate bro said, it's he was like, not not one of the one of the key functions of the business. But that's yeah. a lie. We know that's a lie. Julia, it's a lie. Started, Julian Vero, lie. I started at the very bottom in the deep dark corner. I think it was it might have even been like customer service, but I reported into the marketing manager. Okay. Basically, okay. I was I was a guy that they had this like corner filled with paper and then they had a spreadsheet and they're like, you see that? I was like, yeah. They're like we so want data entry. We want that in there. And they pointed <laughs> at the computer. I was like, okay. And do you have like scanners or this or that? And they're like, nope. Manual data entry, baby. Yep. Fun. Yeah. So that was fun. So I did that. Yep. Then I, I wrote, so once we got it in, I had to distribute it to the proper dealers because we were getting the lead. This is how old school this business was and how long ago I started. We were getting leads faxed to us. Wow. Yeah. What was that, like 19, <clears throat> 1942, 1943? That's how uh, old you 48, 48, actually. Okay, right, yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. My bad. Yeah, I'm secretly like a thousand years old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they were they would send us like faxes and I'm like, well, there's gotta be a better way than that. And then we I found there was this thing called email that uh, <laughs> they didn't know how to use. I was like, oh no. Yeah, this wasn't well, They that... probably didn't know how to get the, they were like, I put it in the fax, I don't know how to get it in the email. It's a piece of paper, how am I supposed to email it to you? Yeah, so I basically, I did some stuff with my Outlook and then I was able to like get it forwarded and pull it from my Outlook. I, I basically wrote a macro, I shouldn't say wrote, I copy and pasted a macro into, um, from like the internets into this sheet and it took six hours to run but it basically automated my job like once i did that i didn't actually have to do much work and the only thing i could do was play solitaire because nice. and even still it still took like i had no ram to the point where i brought in ram from home at and like when everybody had gone home i like upgraded i took my computer part and i upgraded my ram i mean it's not that hard you just like put a stick in it's like adult lego then i almost got fired the it lady yelled at me why? Because like, I tampered with company property and it was a security okay. risk. I was sure, like, fair enough. in in RAM? You could have like, yeah, inserted your your like diabolical virus that was going to go and steal all their information via RAM. You know, like USB sticks are a thing, right? Like that would be a much easier <laughs> way to steal shit. That's how they steal information. Yeah, in the totally. movies. So I don't know about this RAM thing. Not RAM, where when you <laughs> unplug it, it loses all its data. Like it's basic. I think, uh, yeah, I think it's wiped-ish. Yeah. Well, so anyway, I, I got into sales because I was sitting there playing solitaire and I almost got fired and they're like, find something to do. No. <laughs> oh, my screen flashed. That was concerning. I think we're good. Are we was, good? It's like, oh, did I die? Did you take out your RAM? Don't panic. <laughs> I think the stream's still up, but my, my whole monitor just went black. It's like, that's oh. not a good sign. Okay. So yeah, I, as I was waiting and trying not to get fired, the, the sales guy across the hall from me um, was doing all his, rocking all his cold calls and, and sh mm -hmm. making a bunch of money and mm -hmm. like four or five X what I was making. And uh, I just went and sat, to, sat with him and listened to him cold call. <clears throat> and I thought, hey, I could do this. And mostly I wanted the paycheck, <laughs> to be honest. 
and uh, yeah, and, and eventually, eventually they gave me a chance and he's like hey have a um like i don't know have here's like the worst part of my list why don't you go call that and uh, it was selling wheelchair lifts to uh churches i think so like accessibility uh-huh. lists so if there's a fire people that were in wheelchairs could get out pretty necessary pretty important how did you get into sales sarah tell us about the process <laughs> oh that, yeah same same as everybody just not on purpose um so i am a was a fine arts major at university do, doing theater and film and then as many theater and film graduates do i was doing acting auditioning and serving bartending at the same time just so happened that a friend of mine from university worked at this this startup he was moving into an ae role and he knew that the sdr role was coming available just so happened that the startup's office was on top of the bar that i worked in as well so it was like pretty my commute didn't really have to change very much and uh and so he was like i think you could go for it like i think you've got the skills like i, I had none of the kind of hard skills that you might need and like i'd never made a cold call i'd never written a cold email i didn't know anything about business um but he was like i think you got the soft skills you know like the the conversation the whole fake it till you make it thing mm-hmm. um that you gain in acting school and so I went in for my bar uh, that I worked with in. Colin and our, our head of growth at the time. And I just, just faked it and lied to Colin and said that a cold call was much like an audition and that I had faced rejection many times before. Just absolutely just bullshitted my way through the interview. And eventually um, they, they were like, you know what? Okay. But in my second interview, because we do a, a multiple step interview process, follow the who process at uh, Predictable Revenue, Colin was like, I'm still going to put this kid through the ringer. And normally in a sales role, you might have somebody role play a sale, right? You might, the whole ask them to sell a pen or whatever that might be. You ask somebody to role play a sale to see how they, you know, respond to stress and you see how they act on their feet and you try to toss some objections their way and see what they do. I didn't have that. I wasn't going to be able to do that. I'd never done that before. So Colin instead asked me to perform from memory the last monologue that I had performed for an audition in front of, you know, Colin and two strangers. And uh, so I had to speak this monologue and it just so happened to be from a, it was a, it was a love monologue from a lesbian love play. And I had to look at this dude named Jason as if he was my, my female lover and, you know, just speak this monologue. And I don't know if that's not like the most embarrassing thing that any boss has ever asked somebody to do. I don't know what is, but he had to give it to me after that because it did. it. Well, you rocked it too. And the amount of shit I got from everybody else that was in that interview, they were like, why did you make her do that? I'm like, one, I didn't know what it was. And then two, (laughs) you said doing like memorizing lines is just like memorizing a cold call script. And like part of our process is to get them to prove it. You got to, you got to show it. I want to see it. And then she did a great job and obviously got the job and a number of jobs here since. Exactly. And with that, let's hop over to join our very first guest of the day. Um, Yeah, we're going to hop over to that Zoom. So bear with us with us for just two seconds while we make that jump and join our guest. And then, yeah, we can get launched into our first event of the day, which is very exciting. Right on. You're going to YouTube. You're going to follow me. If at any point during the day I break things or click on the wrong button, then uh, and all of a sudden stuff goes black and the stream ends, just come back to the YouTube channel because there's a very good chance that I'm going to, I'm going to break stuff today. Uh, so just do me a solid. And, uh, if something breaks, give me, cut me some slack, be like, ah, oh, Colin, that idiot. I know you can't see me right now, but there we go. We're going to join a new meeting here. So feel free to make, make, make plenty of fun of me and then come back to the predictable revenue YouTube channel and, uh, and I'll get the stream back up because, uh, I have done that before. All right. We got Sarah. Let's get Colin going. We'll get David. We get two people, two people day one. Is David, David here? He sure is right right, there. there. Hello. Hey. Hey. I was watching, I was watching you on this screen on the YouTube. Now I'm watching you here on this screen. It's- Now uh, you're part of it. Now you're just right in there. I know. I'm like, oh my gosh, can't wait to jump in here. This is awesome. Yeah, great to be Yeah, really excited to have you. Love it. Okay, I'm just getting set up with my slides, but uh, yeah, no, this is great. First of all, I love Corporate Bro. I'm a big yeah. fan of Mark Roberts, John Miller. It's just it's an amazing crew you got here, and uh, and I love the dialogue. Right, we all we all get into sales by accident. It's that's like that's the inside joke. So everyone's we, got yeah. their own story, right? So true. So true. 
So before we jump into the slides, how did tell us the story? You started as a research assistant, and I intentionally didn't want to ask this question when we did the pre because I wanted to like, yeah, I thought it'd be a good good chat. So before we jump into slides and all that, um, yeah, how did you get into? How did you go from research researcher to salesperson? Yeah, so so I uh, was you know research scientist was doing graduate work in engineering was actually building computer models so like nothing even remotely related to sales didn't know sales was a job you can do and then I actually ended up going to a career fair so this is kind of 1999 so kind of at the turn of the dot com boom ended up going to a career fair at the university that I was at and uh, they had all these speakers that were coming in with kind of engineering degrees who went on to do like management consulting and worked at you know IBM and and McKinsey and all these things and I was like oh. Maybe I should do this with my life, right? So I started to kind of explore, ended up actually getting hired um, by IBM to be a solution engineer. So shout out to all the SCs out there. Um, and I was hired a few months, actually several months before I was scheduled to graduate. And then just a few weeks before I was scheduled to start at IBM, I got connected with a, a young man who was 26, I was 25, who was a founder of a startup based in Toronto where I am. And uh, yada, 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 it was this 20 person you know, startup. They convinced me to come on over. And uh, it, it was an amazing, like it just changed my life, right? You know, just getting into kind of like the functional technical side of the sales process. When you think about like as a scientist, like what, what do you do? Recording there, in progress. You're there to basically take and synthesize these complicated concepts to, to, to so that in a way that people understand. And I was always like very enthusiastic and excited about what I was doing. And so that translated really well into being, you know, a sales engineer and uh, ended up joining that company. There was 20 of us and we, we ended up growing it to be a hundred million dollar business and 700 people at its peak. We IPO'd, we ended up getting acquired and just absolutely fell in love with there. But the idea behind you know science and, and, and being an engineer and just really being curious about why things happen translated really well into a sales world, just like Sarah's background in fine arts, like that also translates really well. So there's a lot of on-ramps we can take uh, depending on what our roles are into the sales profession. And that was, that was mine. Very true. Interesting. Yeah. It's so interesting to it's you're so right. So many different things apply to the sales role. And conversely, so many things from sales apply to every area in your life. It's such an interesting little intersection of like human connection and, and, you know, data and problem solving and curiosity, all these things. It's, it's, it is pretty interesting. <laughs> We're going to talk about that today, you know, because I, I do believe that a lot of the best sales lessons we can learn come from life, right? It's how we buy things and how we interact with our kids and how we feel when people kind of hit us up for things. Like, you know, we as as sellers, as we all are here on in this uh, conference, like we're also on the buying side, right? E even if it's in our personal lives. So a lot of great lessons to be learned for sure. Right on. Well, Sarah, thanks for joining us. I know you've got a, a little break uh, coming up to get ready for your next session. So you're, Sarah's going to go and prep our next guest. Uh, and David, you and I sure are going to jump in. David, where, where are we at with slides? Do you want to, uh, do you want to get the slides yeah. going? Yeah, yeah. Here I will, uh, I will share them. I'm going to let everybody know what this, just flash the schedule while you get that going and let, I'll wait till we're, we're there. All right. I'm going to hide myself from you so everybody doesn't have to look at my <laughs> ugly mug. Oh. It's great to be with you. I, I have a third screen. I wish I could see. I have YouTube running another screen to see the comments. So I'm gonna. I might rely on you, Colin, to to funnel some of the comments over to me as I ask some questions here. But can everyone see the slides? Can you see the slides? Okay. Not yet. I'm just gonna throw it. I'm just showing the the schedule right now. But we got the slide share screen going up, and it looks beautiful. Gabby, you did a fantastic job. David, we can see you, <laughs> and we can see your slides. I'll be the the arbiter of comments. So YouTube, throw some chat to me. I can see I can see the chat here, YouTube, but I'm it's complicated. I can't chat back, but our team will chat back and I will talk to you. So here we go. David, yeah. thank you so much for joining us. Oh no, my this is a very soothing slide template, by the way. I was completely relaxed the whole time I was as I was building out these slides. We should be playing but, these soft sounds of the water in the background right now. <laughs> That's how we're gonna make use of our uh, 30 minutes here. But no, look, it, it's great to be with everyone. You know, we, we kind of went over a little bit of the background. You know, it's interesting, you know, for me, so so after the the scientist journey and that I ended up joining this first startup. I ended up joining four more, uh, actually three more startups, uh, in fact, so kind of four over the course of the last 20 years. Uh, three ended up being acquired. One, which I helped start in 2008, was acquired by Salesforce, which Colin mentioned uh, in the YouTube video. And I spent five awesome years at Salesforce, seeing how the sales machines were kind of built operationally and culturally at scale. Ended up 
running small business sales from the Eastern US at Salesforce. It was kind of cool to almost be servicing customers like I was. I'd been a Salesforce customer before and I had all this empathy. But for those of you who know Salesforce and I, or I'm sure have worked in kind of these like high intensity and, and I say that in the best possible way, selling environments, you know that it's like the end of the month, the end of the quarter. There's never been a better time to buy, right? We're telling our reps, you know, turn over all of the, the possible opportunities to uncover revenue. And we're doing all these things, which by the way, are not unethical and they are not categorically ineffective. But the problem that I had was that I would go back to my desk and my phone would ring off the hook, you know, and why? Because I'm a VP at Salesforce and people want to sell me things all the time. And what's happening? I'm not answering the phone because, you know, I, I don't want to be bombarded with all these pitches and I'm not responding to LinkedIn. And I had this like little epiphany that, you know what? I don't know if I like talking to salespeople very much, right? And this is kind of like a question that plagued me a little bit. Like if you were to ask this question to yourself, do you like talking to salespeople? I mean, I'm sure we're all salespeople here on the, on the you know, on the, the call. You know, I, I would say go ahead and put your thoughts and feedback in the chat and Colin can help relay that to me. But I'll tell you, I've asked this question to thousands of sales. I can be in a ballroom giving a keynote to thousands of salespeople. And I say, raise your hand, who here likes talking to salespeople? very few hands go up. Now I know a lot of us have a professional curiosity where we say, hey, look, I like talking to salespeople because I like seeing how they execute the craft. But this idea that if you don't like talking to salespeople, you are actually not alone. There's studies, research, Dan Pink, I'm a big fan of, and to sell as human talks about this, that you know, when you use the word sales or selling with someone, they had this visceral negative reaction. So I kind of had this little mini epiphany that you know, I was not necessarily selling the way that I buy this mantra of sell the way you buy kept repeating in my head and sell the way you buy you know it's not you know, it's not about the buyer's journey and meeting them on the journey that's that in my mind that's a different thing but when I say sell the way you buy I was thinking about really two things number one there's this empathetic component right which is as salespeople we go out and we execute these tactics and again they're not category categorically ineffective they're not unethical but we just do these things that wouldn't work on us, right? Like I've had reps over the years, they come to me and they say, hey, David, I have this customer. They ghosted on me. I'm trying to reinvigorate the sales cycle. I'm going to send them this note or this follow-up. David, can you read this and let me know what you think? And I would read this thing and I would look back at the rep and I would say, I don't know, if you were the customer, would you respond to this, right? And then the smile comes on their face. And this idea that we almost get to behave differently when we're in sales than we do in normal everyday life. So there's definitely an empathetic component to sell the way you buy, right? Just don't use tactics that wouldn't work on you. But the other piece to this is that we need to be really curious. And this is kind of, you know, as we, we talk about the transition from science and engineering to sales, we need to be really curious about the pathways and mechanisms by which human beings make purchasing decisions. Because this is really what we need to master if we want to be able to convert customers with passion and conviction in the most ethical and, and above board and, and the best possible way. But we don't spend a lot of time thinking about the mechanics of how we make buying decisions. So the question is, if selling the way you buy is really important, well, then how do we buy? And so what I want to do today, I want to do kind of just a couple like little sales science experiments here with you. So you, just to kind of, you know, drive this point home of like, how is it that we actually buy? So here's my... Here's my sales science experiment for all of you. I'm going to tell you a bit of a story and then you tell me what you think. Put your, your feedback in the comments. Now, I know for many of us, I'm here in Toronto, Canada. I saw there were some folks uh, on the on the uh, YouTube chat from Toronto. So shout out to everyone from Toronto. But, um, uh, you know, we've all been locked down here for quite some time and the restrictions are just about to start to be lifted. But if you're like me, you are dying to get on a plane and finally go on vacation, you know, once again. So imagine this, right? You are... Uh, going on your first vacation since the pandemic and you decide that you want to go to Paris, France. Like this is your, your big, your big thing. You're super excited. And so you put together a budget for how much you're going to spend on your travel. And you calculate that you can probably spend about $800 on your economy class ticket from wherever you are to Paris. And the good news is when you go and you go and you book that flight, you can actually get that flight for $800. So it fits in nicely with your budget. But then actually, and by the way, when you were booking your economy class trip to Paris, you noticed that there was also a first class ticket available. Now, disclaimer, this photo may not be representative of the first class service on your airline, but just, you know, hear me out here. So you see that there's a first class ticket, but the first class ticket to Paris is actually quite expensive. It's you know $5,000, right? Now, you don't have the money to spend $5,000 here. 
But something magical happens whereby a few days before your flight, you get an email from the airline and they say, no, great news, Colin. You know, I know you, you were looking at the first class flight when you were booking your travel and it was, it was really expensive, but we have a few seats left on the flight. And now if you want to upgrade to this first class ticket, it's not going to be 5,000. It's only $1,200. So now you just need to come up with this extra $400. So the question I have for you, and maybe you can tell me what pe people are saying in the feed here. Do you spring for this upgrade? Do you spring for this upgrade? Do you somehow figure out where you're gonna, and, and by the way, I'm not here to lead you. Maybe you don't, right? But do you spring for this upgrade? What, what are people saying there, Colin? Yeah, chat, throw, throw one in chat. If you're, if you're going for the upgrade, you're going to first class now for only $1,200. Uh, or throw a two <laughs> in chat if you're like, nah, I've made my call. I'm, I'm flying, I'm flying economy. I, I think, I, I hate those offers at the last minute. I'm like, no, you didn't offer this to me in the first place. So I'm done. I don't like, I, I, I don't like being, I hate being manipulated like that. So I'm like, I won't even use air miles. If the, if a, if a store has like a, like a club card or a this or that, I'm like, nah, I don't do that. But I think I'm, I look like, looks like I'm the minority because everybody's saying I'm insane. Uh, and that they absolutely <laughs> would for an extra 400 bucks. Yeah, it is a long flight. I think I would have, I would see this was what would happen for me is I would go, no. And I'd ask my wife and she'd go, you're stupid. And then, <laughs> and then we would do the upgrade. <laughs> well, you would say no to like, just to get the revenge of the airline. I'm not, you know, I'm not letting them get the satisfaction. Then you're, you're like, okay, you know, my wife's making a lot of sense here. Yeah. But no, you know what? If you're one of these people that are saying, Hey, you know what? Like I would do it. And Colin, like, let's not discount. What did you just say? You said, well, it is a long flight. Like what's what's actually happening here? For those of you who are saying, I'm gonna spend this extra $400 mm -hmm. that you didn't have, by the way, you didn't have this $400. If I were to ask you, well, great, where are you getting this $400 from? You would tell me like a little story. So I want you to think, where do you get this $400 from? Some people say, well, look, I'll max out my credit card. Some people say like, I'll, you know, I'll sell a little bit more at the end of the month. I'll push, I'll push through like an L3 discount just to get, you know, a little bit more commission in. Some people might say, well, look, when I get to Paris, I'm not going to go to all the fancy restaurants I was planning on. I'm just going to you know, eat fast food or better yet, when I come back for the next six months, I'm, no new clothes for me. You know, you're telling yourself a little story, right, to justify why you're making this the spend that you ultimately want. And by the way, for those of you who are saying, ah, you know what, a budget's a budget, like I'm, I'm sticking to it. You are also telling yourself a story about how fiscally responsible you are. And the, and the take home message of all of this, right? We're spending money we don't have. We're telling ourselves these little stories. It's this idea that oftentimes in sales or we think that customers go out and they buy solutions to problems that they have. But the reality is that's not what we do at all. We buy one thing first and foremost, which is feelings. 100% of the time, we I will go toe to toe with anyone. We buy feelings 100% of the time. And, and I'll, I'll go kind of full reverse here. I will, I will say that one of the reasons why we know that we buy feelings 100% of the time is because of science. And, you know, I, I'm going to share this quote here from uh, James Clear and Atomic Habits. Now, in this quote, James doesn't talk about the science behind this, but he talks about, he says, you know, hey, neurologists have discovered that when our emotions and feelings are impaired, we can't make decisions, right? We have no signal of what to pursue. And in fact, the, the, the deeper science is that they look at individuals who have suffered traumatic brain injuries and are no longer able to express feelings, what happens is they are not able to make you know, any decisions. And this leads to this concept of what I refer to the solution fit paradox. And this is what the solution fit paradox means. Like, think about this. If you, you're repping a company, right? You're repping a product. You're a salesperson, you work at a company. When a customer is involved in a sales cycle with you, it ends in one of three ways. They buy your product or service, they buy someone else's product or service, or they build it themselves, like they solve the problem another way, or they do nothing, right? Those are the only three outcomes. So I want you to ask yourself, if you went back into your CRM and you took a look at all of the opportunities that were closed out over the last year, five years, whatever it is, and you were to categorize them into the, you know, those three categories. Now imagine you were an independent auditor you work for KPMG, you work for Deloitte. And I called you in and I said, I just want you to look at how all these opportunities ended up. And I want you to answer the question, how often, what percentage of the time would you say that the customer ended up making the best decision 
for them. So when they bought your product, when they bought someone else's product or they did nothing, how often was that actually the best decision for them? If you want, just put, put a percentage number in the, in the YouTube chat. Like how often do people make the best decisions for them? Like best defined as, you know, uh, you know, best ROI and the best, you know, uh, the, the best vendor and the best reputation and the, the best all things considered. How often? I don't know, Colin, yeah. what, what kind of numbers are coming in here? Yeah, chat, throw me, uh, just give me a percentage. I don't know, like, are you 10%, 50%, 100% good at this? I think I'm, I, if I think about me personally and the decisions I make, I be. I feel like I'd be lucky if I'm 50-50. Yeah. And, and I think we got a bunch of people that uh, roll up to me that are probably, that are on this, that are probably nodding their heads pretty, pretty hard. <laughs> So if you're if you're a PR team member and you you want to take a take a pot shot at Colin, how how uh, frequently are, are my decisions uh, correct? Uh, nothing higher than forty five percent, please. <laughs> well, I'll frame this up because we talked about at the outset how sales is life, right? So think about this: if I asked you to write down everything that you ate for lunch in the last month, and then I told you I was going to take that list and I was going to give that list to your doctor, and I was going to ask your doctor. What percentage of the time would you say that Colin, now Colin, you might be a really healthy guy, but I might say, what percentage of the time would you say that the doctor would agree that you ate the best thing for you, best as defined as calorically, food groups, portion size, all that kind of stuff? You know, sometimes people want to pick a lower number. Sometimes, you know, people say, are negative numbers okay? Our team's you know, jumping thing. in with 1%, 2%. <laughs> that's, that's right. Gabby's like 50, right? 50. Gabby's the most generous here. This is what I refer to as the solution fit paradox, right? People don't do the best thing for them. You don't eat the best things. You don't go on the best vacations. You don't manage your money correctly. You don't marry the best person, <laughs> objectively speaking for you, right? We're not in relationships with the best person. How could we know who they, you know, in all fairness to my wife, who I love, we've been married for 19 years. You know, we don't do the best things for us, but we always do what we feel. We always do what we feel. If you said, hey, look, 1% of the time is pretty much how much I you know, eat the right thing for me, does that mean 99% of the time you were upset with what you ate or what you ordered, right? You get home at the end of a long day and you say, you know what? It was month end, quarter end. I was hustling really hard, you know, trying to sell stuff. You know what I deserve? What do you deserve, Colin, at the end of a long day? What do you deserve? Sleep. I get young, <laughs> I get young kids. <laughs> but, but realistically, like a beer. And if I a have beer, a beer, another beer. And then if I another, have two beers, it's like I might be going to the candy drawer. Yeah. Or you know, you, a pizza or a cheeseburger. Like you fill it in with something that's not good for you, but you don't feel bad about it. You feel good about it, right? This question of like, well, how often do customers make the best decision for them? In their mind, the number is probably pretty high in their mind, right? But objectively speaking, not. And this is where we get into this, like, why do salespeople need to stop selling value? And this is the reason. It's because and we tell as leaders, we tell our teams this all the time. The reason is because value and return on investment, ROI, are absolutely not the same thing. ROI is an objective financial calculation of an expected rate of return. Value is a subjective feeling. But when we go out and we tell our teams, we say, go sell value, go sell value, Really, what we're saying is go sell the return on investment. Go tell the customer that if they spend this money with us, then they will either make more money than that or save more money than that in the long run. That's You would be stupid not to spend money with us because it's going to come back to you. When we go out and we tell our teams to sell value, really, that's what we're saying. We're saying sell the business case. But that's not how people buy. Now, here, look. I'm not saying that there's no value in, a, in having a business case, right? The way I kind of think of it is that the ROI is almost a subset of value, right? And it, it, ask yourself this, because I've been in this situation tons of times. You're, you're trying to sell your customer something and you put together a business case, right? You say, okay, well, you, 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 if we can automate this process for you, if we can accelerate this process, if we can realize cost savings here, and you kind of put together this case and you, you make all these assumptions as far as the data that goes into that. And then you look at the numbers and, and if, you're, if you're like me, have you ever done this? You look, at, you look at the numbers and you say, you know what? I, I don't think the, cu the customer's not going to believe this. This is too aggressive. This is the, the payback period. Have you, has this happened to you, Colin? The payback period is too aggressive? Yeah, you're like, wait, this is, they're already profitable? 
and they haven't <laughs> even right. signed yet. Uh, I, I'm, I'm like, going to check my spreadsheet math because I probably screwed something up. <laughs> that's right. So now you're like, okay, well, a three week payback is unreal. You know what? I would feel better if the payback was like eight months, nine months. Like that feels like the right pay. And I say, what the hell is that? Right? Because now the only thing that matters as it relates to that business case, and I would say in general, the only thing that matters as you're putting together a business case for a customer is whether or not they believe that that thing that you said is actually going to happen. And the last time I checked, a belief was a subjective feeling and not an objective statistic. So having a good ROI makes my customer feel good, but don't kid yourself, it's the feeling of that ROI that is really the thing that's moving them to purchase. The same way that if you were in the Gartner Magic Quadrant in the top right-hand corner, if you got all these blue chip customers, if you have all these references, if you got a million followers on LinkedIn, what that does is it makes me feel good about doing business with you. Even look, I mean, doing as, as Salesforce did, you know, Salesforce does so much good in the community in lots of different ways, right? And don't kid yourself. And this is not, this is not my insinuation. This is, you know, there's, for example, the Edelman Earn Brand Study, the Trust Barometer. Like these are global studies that they do in these areas. And two thirds of buyers are now belief-driven buyers. They buy things based on an organization's position on various societal issues, irrespective of the product, right? So at the end of the day, they're buying a feeling. And so you just think that you know, let's talk about like our personal lives here for a second. You know, I'm not saying you have this is actually Colin's uh, uh, basement, by the way, everyone. It's the troll but, hole. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I throw this up here to say, what is something that you and I'm not asking maybe, maybe Colin, you can answer this if you want. What is something that you spend money on that another person would look at and say, that's ridiculous? Well, I don't, I don't understand why they're spending money on that thing. I don't know, Colin, if you have something like that. Oh, for sure. I mean, I've, I've already talked about beer and uh, and, the, <laughs> and the amount of beer, but I, I think genuinely uh, cardboard. I, I collect or I used to collect magic cards and I've got some that are now worth $100, $200 and it's a tiny piece of cardboard. And it's, I look at it sometimes and I'm like, it's obscene. And then I'm like, well, do I, should I sell that or should I? I'm like, no, I don't want to because I, I have it now. It's the, it's the silly, it's po quite possibly the silliest thing I, I do. And yet you do it, yep. right? Like even you objectively, you're just like, I don't, I don't know why I do this, right? But I still, like even like the upgrade on the flight to Paris, I could justify that and say, hey, you know what? Like it's eight hours, it's five hours, whatever many hours it is, you're gonna be sleeping half the time anyways, you're gonna be excited. The food is not gonna be as great as you think it is. Why spend that money, right? But the reason is like, because it gives you a certain feeling, right? This, this um, alignment. And you, know, if you think about it, again, something you spend money on that another person would look at and say, that's ridiculous. I'm Travel. Cu I'm curious. I'd music, like to, yeah. I'd like to hear what Chad has to say. What's, what's that thing that you, you spend money on that's ridiculous. Yeah. Gabby, no, 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 that's not true. She's saying for me, it's healthy food. Get out of here. No, that's, that's, I'm calling that, bullshit on yeah, that, sorry. Yeah, Sebastian's saying Nerf guns. Oh yeah, Nerf guns. No, I, I do own a bunch of Nerf guns and I brought them into the office once. I have like, I bought them for my brother's bachelor party and we have like 15 Nerf guns. We had a massive Nerf fight at the office. It was fantastic. And, and why? Because we value creating that fun environment in the office or we just needed to cut loose. Like we value all sorts of different things, right? This is the beauty of us as human beings. And, and the same thing happens, by the way, like if you think like if you're, selling it you, you ever hear the phrase no one ever got fired for buying ibm or no one ever got fired for buying at&t you, you heard that before Colin? oh yeah nobody nobody yeah. ever got fired for buying blue i think was the saying there you go right yeah. and so what does that mean does that mean that ibm has the best products and services objectively speaking no it means that that person was worried about getting fired and so they're when they buy ibm they are buying safety and security right? Like when you buy into like a, an insurance company, right? You know, farmers or whoever it is, what are you buying? You're not just buying the insurance, you're buying, you know, setting your life back to normal should something unfortunate happen, right? And so this idea that customers choose vendors that not only align tactically. So certainly if I'm looking for a CRM, you, you got to have a CRM. If I'm looking for marketing automation, IT security, you, you got to have that. But after that, and don't kid yourself, there are thousands of vendors that can do what you do, most likely. It becomes this emotional alignment. That's why we talk about building relationships with customers, because relationships are emotional. And in fact, this study, which I talk about in my book as well, this is a study from Harvard Business, the new science of customer emotions, actually looked at 
you know, 10 specific emotional drivers for how people make purchasing decisions. So for example, when you see like a, a car commercial on TV and there's like this young attractive person throwing their musical instrument into the back of this like little SUV and then driving out to the country where they're meeting another attractive person and, and, and going camping, you're like, yes, there's, this is a creative, attractive person ex exploring the outdoors, living their best life. This is what I want. And the funny thing is when advertisers advertise to you using these emotional drivers, conversion rates increase. But the best thing and the most interesting thing actually about this idea of the emotional driver is that when I ask you, Colin, like, why do you keep investing in magic cards? Like, why did you buy that Tesla? Like, why did you, you know, why did you get married to this person? It's actually very difficult for you to explain, right? Because we are not so in touch with our emotional state such that, and it actually, and, and it was, uh, let me complete that. We're not so in touch with our emotional state that we can manifest the reasons why we do things, right? But the reason that we do that is because it saves us time. Like emotions are the quickest way to get to someone and convert them, right? We lead with emotions. This is actually one of the biggest problems that oftentimes in sales, especially in, in technical sales or IT sales, we're selling software, um, we tend to lead with the features and functions of the product. We're like, hey, look, we're a platform. You know, like, hey, I'm, it's David calling from Predictable Revenue. We're a platform. And I don't give a shit about your platform. Okay, like I spend a fraction of percent of a time caring about what the hell it is that you do, right? I got my own problems that I'm emotionally in touch with, but I can't articulate. So the idea is if we want to stop selling value, right? What I mean by that is like, stop selling the ROI, stop selling the business case, or at, le at least stop leading with that. Lead with the emotion, lead with the pain, lead with the enemy that your customer is experiencing. So I talk about this, you know, in, in this particular article, I talk about it in my book, but if you want to go check out the website, I'll give you some links at the end. This is all free and ungated. This article about not confusing value and ROI. You know, I, I talk about actually at the beginning of this article here um, in the Paris Hotel in Las Vegas, how there's a, a burger restaurant that has a burger that costs $777. And I, and I ask, like, by all accounts, and they also have a $14 burger at this restaurant, by all accounts, this thing, this menu item should not exist, but it does. And people order it. And why? Because if you just hit the jackpot and you're like this high roller, right? And you're thinking about what is the what is the the feeling that I'm buying now? Like this this feeling of being a baller or this, you know, the, being a winner. When I spend seven hundred dollars on a hamburger, I all of a sudden get to feel that feeling of being a winner. When you buy a lottery ticket, spoiler alert, you're not going to win. Okay. What are you buying when you buy that lottery ticket? You're buying a chance. <laughs> right? You're saying there's a chance, right? I'm buying and, and you get the, the you're buying the opportunity to dream and think. And that that transaction starts from the time you buy the lottery ticket until they call the numbers. Right. Actually, I had a, 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 a fellow I know who had a big exit from a company. And he says, you know what, uh, David, I, I'm going to, I'm finally going to buy myself a Porsche 911. Like that was the car I always wanted growing up as a kid. And I'm going to, now that I have this money from this exit, I'm going to do it. I'm like, great. And I'm speaking to him a number of months later. I'm like, Hey, did you get the 911? He's like, yeah, yeah, I got it. And I'm like, how is it? And he's like, it's okay. I said, what do you mean? It's okay. He's like, eh, you know, like I'm driving around, I'm, you know, I'm driving in the city. I can't speed. I'm like talking to my mother on Bluetooth. It's like the same way it was before when I had my, uh, you know, my family SUV. And he said, and he said to me, you know what, David, you know what the best part of the buying the Porsche 911 was from the time I ordered it to the time it showed up, because what did I get in that time? I got this feeling of, of excitement and enjoyment and just anticipation, right? So value and ROI are not the same thing. So the question I have for you is thinking about who is your ideal customer? If you're listening to this, I want you to think about who your ideal customer is. If you were to close your eyes and I were to say, when you open them, your favorite customer is going to be in front of you. Meaning like, what is their demographic? What is their role? What is their you know, intent and knowledge of your solution or your space? Think about what that, that person, and then ask yourself, what does that ideal customer value? Meaning when they buy your product or service, what feelings are they buying? And I would implore you to lead with those, those feelings. And there's lots, I'll give you lots of 
follow-up stuff if you want to read more, but like lead with those feelings. Do you have a question, Colin? That's a really good one. I'm curious, chat. When when David says, you know, what are the feelings that that your customers, that your best customers are getting out of your product? I'd love to hear that. Throw, throw that in chat. What is the feeling? What is that emotion yeah. um, that they're it, feeling? And look, by the way, you know, if, if for, it could be different, it could be different based on the person's role. So look, someone who's, a, you know, a, in the IT department, who's, who's struggling to, to pull together all sorts of like analytics and insights, if you have a package that helps them do that, it makes their job easier, right? So they're just buying, you know, like ease of use or, or maybe time, right? Like they're buying freedom to, to do the things that they want with their family. But let's say, for example, you're selling like IT security software to someone who just had a data breach, at their company, right? Now, what does that person value? Well, that person value might, first of all, be keeping their job or keeping their business afloat or the reputational damage that that data breach has had, right? So they're buying different things. And, and the one last thing I'll just kind of leave you with as you think about that is, uh, and I have a YouTube channel called Cerebral Selling, which you know, I'll, I'll give you the link, but this is a video I created uh, probably in, I think it was around the December timeframe of last year. And it was called, you know, keeping up with what you're, your customers value, right? You, the things that your customers value has changed. And think about even what's happened during the pandemic, okay? So imagine we're in kind of January of 2020. So the pandemic in North America has not set in yet. Now imagine you are buying personal protective equipment for a hospital. What do you value? Okay, there's no pandemic yet. You pr well, look, price, look, the price has gotta be, you know, we, we only have so much money to spend. The price has gotta be good. Delivery time frame, well, look, it's got to get here. And quality, look, it's got to be good enough, right? Just good enough. Now, boom, you're in the middle of the pandemic. You can't get PPE, right? What do you value? All of a sudden, price doesn't make a difference. I'll pay whatever. I just need it here yesterday. And the quality needs to be top notch. So this question of as you, you know, a lot of, I know a lot of businesses have been affected by the pandemic, but even still during the normal course of business, the things that your customers value will change over time. And if you keep going out, I, you know, I know many of us, you know, when, when the pandemic first hit, what you saw were a lot of companies that were scrambling to increase the level of agility of their messaging, right? You know, it was like, oh, we're all in this together. And then it's like the soft piano music. And, and, and then the, the marketing and advertising changed, right? And if you were still like, you were watching some of these brands, some of these commercials, and they were showing commercials that were like three weeks out of date as far as like what society valued, they appear tone deaf, right? So the things that your customers values have changed. Look, you know, when I, I you know, my, my primary business, I train sales teams, right? And so what is, when someone invests in sales training, why are they doing that? Well, you'd think if I was focusing on ROI, that they're expecting a convert, an increase of a conversion rate of some kind of you know, parameter in their sales funnel. So like, I'm going to help you get better at discovery. You're going to do better at discovery. You're going to get more customers in and boom, that's going to pay for the training. But also there could be people, especially in the pandemic, they're working remotely. They're, they're disengaged from work. They don't hear what other people are saying on the phone. They can't spin their chairs around, right? They're leaving companies and they're telling their, the, their managers when they leave that like, you never invested in training for us. And I've been sitting at home for a year captive, you know, without engagement. And don't kid yourself, you know, it, <laughs> this is what people are buying. I mean, you know, when you speak at a conference, if I invite you, Colin, to speak at a conference and I'm a part of the, the, the events marketing team, what do I care about? I actually don't really care too much about necessarily what you're going to say. Mm. I just want the audience to love it. Right. Mm. And why? Because I was burned when I hired a $50,000 speaker to speak. And I, I realized three seconds into his talk that this, this was a horrible mistake. Oh, so the next you were at that. That that I, was, I was there. I'm right? thinking of a very specific conference. I think Sarah was there too. <laughs> I think I may know what you're referring to. I'm not going to, I'm not going to say it live. We're not going to get into it. Yeah. No, no. Yeah. Yeah. For but, sure. But so no, so this, this is it everyone. So, you know, this is why we need to stop selling value. If you're selling value, meaning you're selling emotions and feelings and leading with the enemy and selling empathetically. Great. Do that. But for many years as sales leaders, we tell our teams to sell value. What we're really doing we're saying sell the business case, sell the ROI. And of course, like, that's not what people buy. So if you'd like to learn more, I mean, I give away a ton of stuff for free. My, I blog at cerebralselling.com as well as I have a, a YouTube channel and Instagram feed with the same uh, same name. I give You don't have to sign up if you don't want to. I give away everything for free. 
If you'd like to learn more, I also have a book, very grateful for actually Mark Roberge, which is going to be coming up. He's a, he's a friend. He's a great, uh, great leader. I respect tremendously, uh, was an endorser of the book. It's called Sell the Way You Buy, and you can get it on Amazon or Audible, and it goes into all sorts of detail, tactical detail about messaging, discovery, objection, handling tactics related to the concepts that we spoke about. And with that, that's all I got for you today. <laughs> right on, man. <laughs> That was really great. Um, questions in chat. Let me see. I know there was a couple here. Um, Shridhar was asking, how do you, how do you sell that on that feeling? Right? Like what is, what is that like? Yeah. What does that look like? Yeah. Well, look, so one of the easiest tactics that I, I teach, and again, I have tons of free content on my site and book about it, um, to connect with people emotionally is as you're pitching, if you're like, if you're asking like, what's the, like, what's the pitch? is I use I refer to this tactic of a polarizing statement, which is an emotional statement that if you're looking kind of for like a, a very simple um, uh, formula, is you would use the words love and hate in a sentence hmm. to describe what your product or service does. So for example, so my third startup, which was acquired by Salesforce, it was a company called Ripple with a Y. And we were a feedback coaching and recognition platform. And so what did we do? We, we didn't go out there at the end and say, oh, yeah, we're a feedback coaching recognition and it's like it's coaching and all this awesome stuff. We would say, hey, you know what? We work with leaders like you every day who realize that people love feedback and they hate performance reviews. Right. And the people and, and, and again, if that was your enemy, if you agree that people love feedback, they hate performance reviews, you would lean in. And you would say, this, this, this is great. Tell, tell me more. What, what, what is this, right? Because oftentimes when we think we, we're, we're pitching, we think we need to communicate. We're a platform that does, a, like, again, no one cares about your platform. Mm -hmm. Yes. People love feedback. They hate performance reviews. Trunk Club, great company in Chicago, was acquired by Nordstrom. What do they say? Well, we work with, we, we're, we're a service for men who love to dress well and hate to shop, right? Cerebral Selling. I realize that people love to buy stuff, but you know what they hate to do? Talk to salespeople. And now you're leaning in and you're saying, this is, and, 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 oh, and by the way, you're leaning in if you believe what I believe, right? If you love feedback and hate performance reviews and love to dress well and you hate to shop and you love to buy things but hate talking to salespeople, you're leaning in. But if you don't, if you don't agree, like if you, if you think that you know you you want lots of feedback, but your team actually likes performance reviews, well then you're going to be pushed away. You're going to be repelled, which I say is good, because the beauty of leading with emotion is that it's self-selecting. People who align with the emotional vibe that you're putting out will want to learn more and lean in and say yes, mm -hmm. and those who don't will be like, this is not for me. And I say that's good because I can tell you you have a lot of bullshit opportunities sitting out there in your pipeline with customers who have no business being there that are sapping your productivity, who are destroying your forecast, right? And so I want the customers, and by the way, I have lots of data, you know, from my times as a VP, I've been a VP of sales four times, and certainly at Salesforce, the teams that actually had higher degrees of quota attainment were the ones that had uh, the, the highest amounts of fresh pipeline, not stale pipeline, not deals that have been sitting there for hour, you know, for days and days and years, like just inflating the pipeline, mm -hmm. fresh pipeline. They were relentless. And in fact, shout out to my teams in New York City. My New York City teams always did the best job at that because they didn't take any bullshit from anyone. Mm -hmm. They would always be very ruthless about the opportunities that they would go after. And they had the highest degrees of attainment. So it, this is a great leading with emotion. The love hate is a great tactic. And I, again, check out the YouTube channel, lots of content on that. I think my takeaway from this is salespeople from New York are just better than anywhere else. This is, the only, the, this is message, the only yeah. thing I heard from this talk. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, it's a hundred percent true. I think until we had a decent, until I had a decent qualification methodology in place in decent stages, like uh, I'd say a lot of my opportunities personally were just total bullshit. Um, and I love the piece that you're talking about in that sort of framework for, for people that love this, but hate this, you know, it's that, it's that movie trailer, you know, you can, it, it, I'm almost feeling that my voice is just a little bit lower when I say that, you know, cause it's, it's that you're trying to get that emotional resonance. And I love that. Well, look, it, it, part of what you said is absolutely true. One of the challenges that people have, especially uh, young sellers have is that we go out and we tell them, we arm them with like all of these statements and pitches. And the problem is sometimes you feel 
when you're given like a, and God bless product marketing, like when you get like a product marketing pitch or something, you feel like a little gross saying it because it's not words that people use. I'll tell you mm-hmm. if you a, a quick story. This is a Salesforce story. So this was uh, the sales kickoff that we had. I think this was probably around 2015, 2016. And uh, they hired Aziz Ansari. People know Aziz Ansari, the comedian, <laughs> yeah. to uh, to perform. Now, look, I had never heard of Aziz Ansari before. Not that he was in my, in my target demographic or I was his. Uh, but look, he was doing sales kickoffs at Salesforce at the time, right? So he gets up there and and he's using all this material, right? The stuff that's like uh, about dating in the modern era with the texting and whatnot. And it's not landing because he's talking to a room full of like middle-aged soft married software people right who mm-hmm. didn't, didn't even know who he was so what does he do he starts picking on people in the audience like he kind of transitions right and of course he's sitting in this ballroom of like a thousand people he can't see like every because the lights aren't can't see everyone he says you you guys in the front row he's like salesforce.com like what the hell do you guys even do i don't know they hired me they said you know come here tell these jokes it's not working salesforce.com what do you do you in the front row you look important he doesn't know who anyone is, right? Yeah. So he picks Parker Harris, right? You know, Parker Harris is the <laughs> co-founder of Salesforce. And he says, like, what do you do? So now everyone's quiet because everyone wants to know what Parker Harris is going to say. And he's, and so, you know, it's it's kind of like that, you know, the, in the Old West saloon where like the, the bad guys come in and everyone's quiet. And so what does Parker Harris say? He says what was on our website at the time, the tagline. He says, well, at Salesforce, we help our customers connect with their customers in all new ways. And everyone's just kind of like waiting to see. And Aziz Ansari erupts in laughter. He's like, what the hell is that? He's like, do your customers know this is like a a pyramid scheme or something? Like, what do you mean (laughs) help our customers all new ways? And everyone starts laughing. And you know why they're laughing? Because that's something that human beings don't say to each other. Like when, when you get a call from a telemarketer and it's someone who's launching into a pitch, you can tell in two seconds. When, you know, you got kids, young kids, I have kids. When my kids come to me and they're about to hit me up for something, I, I can tell immediately. Mm-hmm. And why? Because they're almost asking me the question, assuming that I'm going to say no. And I can feel that. And so part of the challenge is when you go out there and you pitch a customer, you know, hopefully you, if I were to ask, can you tell that I love doing this? I love doing this, right? Hopefully you can tell. If I were to ask you, if I were to see you pitch and do your thing, Do you think I can tell whether or not you believe in what you're selling? And if you're forced to use these, you know, pitches and statements that you kind of feel a little gross saying, and you can't manifest with passion and conviction in a natural human way, I, as a customer, will be able to tell. So part of the magic of using tactics like the love-hate and and, and a lot of the content that I share is that it should be undetectable and feel very natural for you to execute. So customers can get that feeling because again, People buy, you know, people describe sales as the, the, tra- the, the conveyance of enthusiasm. Like if you don't believe in what you're selling, they actually talk about this in the book, Talk Like Ted, you know, when you're manifesting uh, you know, knowledge and insights that you don't believe in, they actually liken it to, and this, they've done studies on this, to, uh, uh, to criminals that are lying under, under interrogation, like people can tell. So mm-hmm. being able to do this naturally is very important. Beautiful. Uh, we've got Nick Capazzi coming up and we're going to be talking about using video in the sales process. So we got a jet. David, thank you so much for coming here. Amazing presentation and hanging out, answering a few extra questions. Really appreciate it. My pleasure, Colin. Thanks for inviting me and hope everyone enjoys the rest of the uh, the summit here. Absolutely. And uh, for those wondering, I'm going to throw the schedule up so you can see what's coming up next. Uh, David, throw um, dr- drop a link to Julia if you want us to, to throw something in for uh, into chat for for anybody that wants to follow up. And if it, anybody has more questions for David, then you can find him in our Slack community. And if you're curious about what that is and where that is, uh, you can just throw a link in chat. And Julian or Julia, yes, we're not joking. Uh, then we'll actually uh, they will throw you that link, and you can jump in and ask David some questions. So I'm gonna take us away to. Uh, to find Sarah, and I just rudely cut off David. I think he was saying goodbye, um, but we'll have everybody ready. Sarah, I've got YouTube wow. here. They're seeing the schedule. Let's get some some video. Or you want to do a quick intro here, and then we'll get uh, getting it going. 
Yeah, absolutely. A couple quick housekeeping things just before we launch right into our next um, exciting session. So reminder, you guys, any questions that you have throughout this next session as well, pop them in that chat and we'll make sure that we can have Nick answer them. Um, and then a reminder that coming up later today, coming up at 12.15 uh, p.m. Pacific, we have our keynote and our keynote speaker for today is Mark Roberge. Um, as Corporate Bros so very kindly um, explained, he is the managing director at Stage 2 Capital. Um, he's advised, invested in, and mentored hundreds of growth companies of all sizes over the last five years um, from and from hiring to pricing to compensation and org design he shares the most common mistakes organizations make during the growth phases and the best practices of how to avoid them so please stick with that um, that is going to be coming up at 12 15 p.m pacific but right here right now we have something equally as exciting i'm really really excited to to host this session with you guys um, and i would like to welcome in our next guest we have nick capozzi he is the vp sales at smile virtual um, and he's going to be teaching us how to use video in the sales process nick has used video to sell and market for over 25 years with companies like disney and royal caribbean um, he currently teaches sales teams how to sell with video and helps marketers create high converting videos for their funnel. So welcome, Nick. I'm really excited to learn from you today. I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Hi, everyone. I hope you're having a great day. What a great lineup of uh, recording in progress. Exciting. It is very exciting. Um, well, yeah, Nick, I want to hand it over to you. I'd love if you could give a little bit of an intro about yourself before you dive into your um, into your topic here, but then you can take it away. Absolutely. So I have a kind of unique background. I grew up in Canada. I knew two things when I was a kid. One, I couldn't handle winter. Two, I was going to work in radio. So I did work in radio. I was in radio and TV for about five years in Toronto. And then one day someone said to me, can you do that radio thing on a stage? Next thing I know, I stepped onto a cruise ship in Miami and actually spent 20 years in the cruise business. But we did live stage presentations. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is a combination of using video, but then also all the other uh, pieces that go into, you know, the theater of what we do and selling there's theater to selling, make no mistake about that. Um, so yeah, so that's a little bit of the background. Um, so, you know, when I start talking to people about video, one of the first things I always bring up is how often do you look at video every day? How many videos do you see, whether you're scrolling through your Instagram reels or TikTok or, you know, messages from vendors, whatever it is, you look at video all day, right? And what I think is really interesting is that so many companies and so many individuals take the time to actually go out and um, create video, but there's not necessarily a lot of strategy that goes into the video. They're thinking more about the content than about the video itself. So here's my argument why well, I think you should be using video in some part of your sales process. First thing is, is that only 3% of people in sales use video in some part of the sales process. Let that sink in for a second. Did it sink in? Okay, good. So I think that's always a really interesting place to start that 3% of people are using video. And of those 3%, it's mostly in prospecting. And even then, they're not usually doing a great job. They're trying, but they're not doing a great job. So Let's talk real quick about some of the different places that you can use video. One is absolutely, and now I'm talking sales cycle specifically, obviously there's a lot more options and opportunities with marketing. But from a sales perspective, um, the first place that I'm always using video is when I'm prospecting, whether I'm reaching out to someone with a cold email, whether I'm reaching out to someone on LinkedIn, whether someone's brokered a meeting, I'm always gonna go and send a video, an introduction video to that person. and. You know, people are like, well, you know, Nick, I'm, uh, you make it look so easy and, and I don't, uh, don't worry, I'll get into all that about how to actually make it look easy. But the biggest obstacle that people need to overcome is just sending that first video, right? There's a ton of great tools out there. You can use Vidyard, you can use Loom, you can use uh, BombBomb. But the key thing is, is that when I talk to people and they're like, okay, I, I'm ready, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to send out my first prospecting video, they'll shoot it like 10, 12, 15 times. And that kind of defeats the purpose. One thing you really want to do with video is make sure that those first couple ones, don't watch them, but send them out. It's a really key point. Second place, and this is a really interesting uh, place that I use video that I've in fact had a lot of success with recently because it wasn't my idea. I got it actually from uh, Zoe Hartsfield, who's now with uh, Dooley, but at the time she was with Bob Bomb. 
And she was talking about how great she was at holding meetings. And what she did was she would just send out, so Sarah, let's say you and I had a meeting coming up. I'd send just a quick video and say, hey, Sarah, how are you? It's Nick from Smile Virtual. Really excited to talk with you. Just want to let you know in advance of the, of the demo we're going to do, if there's any questions you want to ask in advance, just go ahead and let me know. And I can tell you my personal you know, rate of, of meetings being held was, uh, or when I came into this, to this company, they were at about 50%. When I started sending those uh, video emails in advance of the meeting, um, I'm in the, the mid 80s now. So just such a drastic, dramatic effect for something that takes me three minutes in the morning to send out five or six or seven 15 second videos, just saying hello. And one of the key things there is you always want to put in the subject line something, you know, in brackets, personal video, something that makes the uh, recipient understand that this is this is unique. Now, some industries have seen this and it's not a novelty uh, anymore, but you know, some industries haven't. So right now, a lot of the, uh, people I'm selling to are doctors or dentists and everyone is telling me I've never seen this before. So especially if you're in an industry, if you're not selling B2B, if you're selling B2C or if you're selling, you know, to SMB. Um, the opportunity with video is really huge because a lot of people haven't seen it. So those meeting holds are really high because what I've done now is I've really personalized it, right? They're like, oh, there's that guy, Nick. Seems like a nice guy. Um, I, I'd kind of feel guilty if I skipped the meeting now or even if I rescheduled, right? There's that hesitation. And then the third place that I love using videos, and this is a way to go viral in someone's office in your sales cycle, is um, actually sending out a, a proposal recap. So think about it this way. If I'm sending you a proposal, I'll have it you know, all laid out as tight as possible. And then what I'll do is I'll do a 45 second video recapping the key points that I want to make sure that your team understands. So quick sidebar, one of the things I always try and do too is whoever I'm working with, if it's a long sales cycle, whoever my champion is on that side, I'm always making sure that I can kind of run the proposal by them. And the advantage of that is now I'm using their words, right? The company's words, how they speak about things. So I'll send these proposal videos just again, just say, hey, it's Nick from Smile Virtual. I just want to send a quick recap of what's in this PDF that I attached with the full proposal. We covered A, B, C, D. And what's interesting, because if you're, if you're tracking, which you can, again, with a product like Vidyard, what's really cool is um, I can actually track how many individual users opened up and played that video. So I had one a couple months ago where I got 40 people inside one office watching the proposal recap. So that's 39 people I never spoke to, 39 stakeholders, influencers. Maybe it was just, oh, look at this. No, no vendors ever sent us a, a proposal recap before. So obviously we landed that client, but I think it was just interesting to you know get people to think and realize of what's possible and different ways that you can use such a great um, you know, medium like video. So next thing we always talk about is your setup, right? Cause I'm in a studio right now. I'm actually not in a studio. I'm actually in my guest bedroom here in my house in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, but what's interesting, a couple things, um, and this is, I've sent out so many videos over the last couple of years. I have a lot of data that kind of supports all the things I'm going to mention now, it's just from my anecdotal from, from my history, but what gets me higher view rates, longer view rates, and the first thing is, is to consider is your setup. And let's start with your background. What's behind you, right? So we've gotten so used to, you know, the Zoom world the last year and a half where we show up and, and you know, we're okay. It's okay to be in pajamas or, or maybe I got a dress shirt on, but I got pajama pants on. Totally cool. That's, that's you. But I can't tell you when I've been the buyer, how many times this year I've showed up to the Zoom meeting and the person pitching me is in their bedroom, which is okay if that's where you have to work but like the bed's not made or there's laundry not done, right? So one thing you really need to think about is, is your background and what are people perceiving because it's still business, right? And we're often talking, you know, either six figures or seven figures of business. So do I want to see what, how am I going to perceive you subconsciously if I'm looking at a messy bedroom? So I always try to use a white background and this is literally just a white painted wall and I tend to wear dark clothing so that I will stand out and I make sure there's no patterns in it, right? And I know we're getting real granular now, but think about it this way. If you go to a really nice steakhouse, let's say you go to Morton's or Ruth Chris, how do you get your steak? It's a big white plate. The steak is the star and then everything else is on the side. And that's the same philosophy 
um, here is that I want the attention on me on what I'm saying, right? I don't want you distracted by a green screen. I don't want you distracted by, you know, looking at the trying to read the titles on the books behind me. Now, everyone's got different setups, but if you can, white backgrounds, great. If not, always think the human mind is going to be more receptive to lines and levels. So if you do have a bookcase with books, that's a great place to be. Um, but have a look at what's there. And also, what does it say about you? Right? Do you have like, you know, figurines or, or a piece of art that, you know, uh, might not be trying to might not be conveying the message that you want to convey. So just something to consider. And this seems like so small. But on a white background, I convert 20% higher on my own stuff. So just to give you context on that. Second thing is, this is the second most important thing after your background is how you light yourself. So again, you know, I'm well lit here. This is just two $35 soft boxes. Just if you go on Amazon, just look up soft box kit. And I basically, it's just fabric around a box light. And you tilt them about 10 degrees off your webcam. And what that does is now it's really going to light you. And again, now, if I'm the recipient of the video and I see this well lit person kind of standing out in dark clothing on a white background, it's going to pop, right? So the first thing that's going to happen is I'm going to say, oh, what's this? I'll click play on this, right? Um, and I'll circle back again. And this is why it's really important to make sure they understand it's a personalized video. Because if it is, if you have elevated the look, they're going to think you did it in a, in a studio or, you know, not basically in their guest bedroom. So always making sure they understand it's a personalized video. And I'll go so far sometimes, especially if it's a, a LinkedIn message, to say something along the lines of, hey, Sarah, it's so nice to meet you. Um, I'm sending you a video. It's not generic. It's a genuine hello from me to you. And the open rate I get on those emails and, and the, the views I get on those LinkedIn, um, that they understand that they, I took the time to do it, but it looks professional. So it really, it really gets them interested and engaged to pay attention to what you're saying. Next thing is going to be sound. And you know what, you, you want to make sure your sound is good and not echoey. But believe it or not, the lighting in the background is going to be more important because what you really want them to do is click play. Then you want them to keep watching, but it's that initial uh, click play that you want to make sure happens. So sounds key. You can, you know what, most laptops, frankly, have a pretty good mic. Um, but you can spend $30, $40, get a, a great mic off Amazon. Personally, I, I enjoy the Yeti series. They're about $130, $150. That'll elevate your, your sound, but your, your internal microphone is usually good enough. And you know, I mentioned green screens earlier. That's one thing that people ask me about all the time is, Nick, should I use a green screen? So it goes back to what I said earlier of that. You don't want anything distracted from the message. You want everything laser focused on what you're saying. So if I'm demonstrating something and I really have to use a green screen for emphasis, I will. But I use a green screen about one out of every 100 videos I do. I mean, it really has to be intentional with a purpose and a reason behind it. Um, in terms of recording tools, so I mentioned earlier that, you know, I love a lot of these uh, softwares that are out there. So Vidyard is free, BombBomb is free. Um, you can pay for a slightly elevated version, which is maybe 10 or 20 bucks a month. And that'll give you more options. But these re recording tools are fantastic because a lot of them have these Chrome extensions and I can be emailing you. And, you know, I just click the little button and literally my webcam will pop up and that's going to allow me to record that video right there and then. Um, so that's kind of the, the basics of actually going out and doing it. So then let's get to the next level of how do you actually make it engaging, right? Um, because it gets, it's great that I got them to click play, but now I need them to stay for that 45 seconds. And by the way, 45 seconds is, is what you want to be aiming for all the time. Um, I was talking to someone recently and they said, you know what, Nick, I'm a CRO and I get, you know, videos a lot, but I dismiss them because they're all three minutes long. And you know what? He's right. Because if it is three minutes long, no one's going to watch it. But another thing I'll put in there is how long the video is. Hey, Sarah, if you can spare 42 seconds, I just wanted to relay this to you. So back to engagement, one of the key things, and um, this was the first day of radio school at Humber College in Toronto, like 25 years ago, I feel old now, that they taught you was that if you want to sound like you have 100% energy across the airwaves, you actually have to put 150% energy into the microphone. So 
a lot of what I've done the last year is about video, but a lot of it is sitting on people's demos because it's all very similar, right? It's the same kind of skill sets. And I would tell people all the time, what you want to do is really make sure you control that meeting, right? And it's the same thing if you're recording a 45 second video. And what I mean by that is that the, 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 you know, the, it's opening up, it's, it's the stage is open, you're stepping out on it. You know, you've got them to click, you put the time into your background. Now I keep them engaged because the first thing I do is I smile. So this is such a small thing, but this changes everything. If you click that video and I'm smiling, it's going to change the entire dynamic of the next 45 seconds. And then from there, I'm going to talk with energy again, aiming for that 150% which at first is going to seem unnatural, but if you watch yourself and you think mm, that's too much energy, you're actually at the right point. It's when you start scaling back that you're going to start to dilute it. It's not going to have the same effect. So smiling, putting energy into it. And what's interesting now, I'm putting energy into this conversation, but it's not over the top. It's not like this, right? But it's still trying to maintain that engagement throughout. I hope you guys are engaged or else I'm in trouble here. Um, definitely, definitely. I, I totally hear what you're saying. It's so true that it's something that we chatted about when we were first doing our, our video series, the Outbound Lab series. And it was Colin and Lavinia who were who were doing the um, the speaking in the video. And like yourself, Nick, I have the theatrical performance background. And I remember trying to think of like, okay, how do I put it into a kind of how do I put it into a term that people can understand that basically you need to stay, say everything as if it's like genuinely the most interesting thing that you could share. And it, that's not over the top. Like it, if you are saying, of course, as you mentioned, you can't be like, wow, this is what we're talking about. But you, if you're, if it's a genuine, like this is important and I'm excited about it, it comes across as you are genuinely that, and it's not too much. Well, and I think that's one of the base things about selling in general, and I, I don't want to get off topic, but you, you nailed a really important point there, Sarah, is that you have to be passionate about what you're selling. You have to have some level of excitement and whatever it is that draws you to what you're selling, whether it's your own product, whether you're a solopreneur, it's your own business, whether you're working for a great company like, um, like you are, Sarah, you know, what, what excites you about it, right? Like helping, for me, it was always about helping clients win. So I'm going to be excited because I have a really good solution because I know I can move your business ahead. I know I can improve how you sell. There's no question about that. So I'm excited about it because I'd love to work with you because I know I can get you there, right? So keeping that in mind as well. Um, so back to the creating engagement. And it's really key that you want to maintain that energy and that smiling through the 45 seconds. Now, this applies to any other kind of video. And I think what's important is that, you know, Nick, if I'm smiling for 45 seconds straight, I kind of feel like I'm doing this the whole time. And I appreciate that. But I think the key thing is, is that if you're kind of smiling with your eyes, even when you're not smiling and just having that jovial personality. And the thing is, it's really, it's a mindset thing, but it's really quick. It's 45 seconds. So if you haven't shot videos before and you're going to shoot, you know, five, 10 in a row, which is also, what I recommend to people is when you're going to start doing this, do them all at once at the beginning. And the reason is, is that there's a couple. Um, but the first one is, is that how do you rev yourself up? So if I'm going to shoot some videos, um, what I want to do is I'll listen to some music that's going to get me amped up just for two minutes before I do. So I'm in that right mindset. I'm kind of excited. I'm feeling good. Lights go on. Camera goes on. Hey, Sarah, how are you? It's Nick from Smile Virtual. Uh, I just want to let you know about this. So, you know, just how are you setting that up? Um, and then one of the most critical things, and this, this I really learned from, you know, I have a lot more than 10,000 hours on stage on these cruise ships live presenting to people. And one of the things I realized with all these hours of reading hundreds of people's body language is how important tempo, pace, and pausing is. And this is a really unique technique that is not just relevant to video, but if you're doing any kind of a demo or any kind of conversation, if you want to keep people's attention longer, you really want to think about how you're using tempo, pace, and pausing. And I'll give you an example about that. So um, if I have a lot of information to get through and I'm going to cover a lot of things, I'm going to talk kind of a little bit fast, but just because Sarah, I want to make sure you get everything. So I'm talking a little bit quick, but the problem with this is that everything sounds the same. It's all monotone. It's all at the same level. Nothing changes. You're not paying attention. But... If you play with the pace, and it's important to think that, okay, so I do have a lot to cover. So I'm gonna make sure, Sarah, we cover it all. However, I really wanna take a second and point out this. And 
adjusting your pace as you go through is really going to be key um, in terms of, again, maintaining that engagement. And I keep talking about maintaining an engagement. I want to get every ounce I can out of that 45 seconds. I want you, I don't want you to press pause or close the browser. I want to earn every second of those 45 seconds. And again, smiling, keeping that energy and then tempo pace and pausing is really key. And to that point, pausing might be one of the most important things here, because even though hopefully you're engaged right now, Sarah, the reality is if I'm coming to a big reveal, I'm coming to that really big point, that's real, the whole thing boiled down to this, right? So you, again, you're elevating in their mind what's about to happen to pull them. So maybe they got a second screen going, now wait a minute, he's pausing. And I always tell people, don't be afraid to pause for two seconds. The first time you do it, it feels like forever. But if you pause for two seconds, it's really not that long, right? But that's all it takes psychologically to affect something in the person who's watching and kind of pull them back in to, to where you want them to be. Um, so really playing with that. And I'll kind of recap this, this section of the conversation. And also, sir, I'm happy to take questions at any point if there are any. But one of the things that I think a lot of people miss the opportunity with is they don't want to watch their own videos. So that's why I tell people at the beginning, just send it. Those first couple of videos, just send it. But then once you're in a rhythm of putting videos out, however you're using them, the key thing you want to do is make sure you rewatch them. And the reason is, is that I can sit here and coach you through a 45 second video. But the reality is, is that if you want to get better really fast, and I'm talking quickly, like change how you present in a week, shoot 20 videos and rewatch 20 videos. And you'll start self-correcting. You'll start seeing, I got a crutch word there. Or you know what? I, my energy was flat. Why was my energy flat in this video? And it's just that that little nuance of the re-watching and the self-coaching and the better understanding what you're saying and how you're saying it. And it's tough. The first 10 times, you're going to hate it. You'd be like, I don't like this guy, Nick. I don't like him at all. But once you do it, Sarah, I'm telling you, it will work and it will make you such a better presenter and quickly. Like it's something you can action on immediately. Okay, I'm gonna shoot the videos, I'm gonna match action on it immediately. Well, Nick, I can't action on it immediately because now I gotta go buy soft boxes and I need a better webcam. No, just to light yourself well, get in front of you know uh, your, your kitchen window or, or just some natural lighting, light yourself, do it on your cell phone, but just do that rhythm, that practice, and it happens so quick. So far, so good, Sarah. So far, so good. We do have a quick question that's just popped in um, from Robin Pinot um, asking, where is the best place to look while recording? Great question. So what's interesting now is I'm engaged with Sarah. So I'm looking at Sarah here. But when I'm actually recording, I want to make sure that I'm actually looking physically into the lens of the camera. And there's a couple ways you can do that. So one of the things that I'm always uh, letting people know is you to be authentic, you want to talk from a place of knowledge. So let's, let's use that as an example. Let's say we're working on a 45 second video. Um, you want to script it out the first time to make sure you're saying really the right words. And I'll get into scripting in just a second. But you want to know it, you want to have it memorized. It's 45 seconds, right? I mean, your prospecting videos are gonna be pretty much the same. Memorize at 45 seconds, but like, you know, your national anthem up, down, left, right, you know it, right? And what happens then is then, you know your 45 second script, but you just write it out into four bullet points. So I wanna make sure I cover this, 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 and this. And when you do it that way, Robin, you can stare at the camera, you just have a little sticky pad, a little sticky note right next to it with those four bullet points so I can focus on my lens, right? And I make sure I hit those points. And the beautiful thing about kind of deconstructing it that way and not following a script is that you're gonna sound way more authentic and it's gonna sound a lot more conversational. Hope that answers the question. Absolutely. Oh, real quick too. You can always use a teleprompter. So there's great teleprompters out there that are like, you know, $50, $100. There's actually a ton of them now that are, will come right on your cell phone and they'll position it so that the text is literally coming underneath where you're, you're viewing. So again, it looks like you're completely engaged and, um, and following the, uh, the pace of the conversation. 
So, okay, let's talk about scripting since we're, we're kind of on that track right now. Um, one of the things I always try to make sure of is when I'm writing, I always write it to be spoken, not read. And when we're usually writing copy, whether it's an email, whether it's copy for marketing, go and look at it. It's, there's words in there that you would never speak, but it's words you're used to reading. Okay, so Nick, how do I, how do I, okay, sound, but how do I start that? Just talk. So, you know, one of the best ways, um, and I don't want to sidebar into developing content, but I will just for a second in that one thing that's a, a great way and people are like, Nick, how do I create content? Well, Sarah, there's something you're passionate about. Maybe it's food, maybe it's cars, maybe it's whatever. And if I said, Sarah, talk to me for 30 minutes about food and you could no problem because it's something you're passionate about. So I always say, open up a word document, click dictate and just talk, talk about what you know. And the reason I say food doesn't have to be, it's really more the exercises to be about business. But the point is I can talk about using video all day. So if I open up a word document, click dictate and talk for half an hour, basically this time right now, had I clicked dictate, I'd have about eight pages, single space copy. And there's usually about 30 to 40 thoughts in there. And each one becomes an individual talking point, right? Each one becomes an individual 45 second post, let's say. But the same thing applies for when you're scripting. So if I'm going to really work on a 45 second prospect introduction video, I want to talk it out either with a colleague or with a partner or whatever it is, but really have that speak it out. How would you speak it? Make sure it's dictating into a Word document or notes if you're a Mac user, and you're going to start to see something develop that's going to be a spoken text as opposed to a read text. And then when you deliver that in video, again, it's going to seem way more conversational. So far, so good? Yeah, interesting. Really, that's a great technique, a great strategy. It's so true that if you're if you read out copy, it's not the way people speak to each other. And right. in reality, you should put in a little bit of the like conversational nuance, like you know, a couple whether it's slang terms or just like a, a slightly less formal or whatever that looks like. It's not something that you could send in an email, but how you converse with somebody else is completely different. And all these little things, from the lighting to the background to the you know writing to be read or spoken. Pardon me. Um, you know, it's all these little things that add 2%, 4%, 3%, all these little things that just tilt it in your favor that they're going to click play. And, and here's the beautiful thing, Sarah. I talked about the different places you can use this in a sales cycle. What's really exciting is that when you get them the first time and they watch your video and it does all these things that we've just talked about over 45 seconds, they're going to watch your second video, right? Now you're developing a believer on their side right? Which helps, especially if you're in a long sales cycle, that helps develop a champion on that side, right? Speaking of which, the champion. So one of the things um, that I always make sure that I do as salespeople, whether it's an email or video or however we're communicating, there's lots of eyes. I can solve your problem, Sarah. I have a solution. We can do this for your company. So one of the things when I'm scripting and I'm putting my videos, I always make sure that I'm really trying to make sure that my prospect or whoever I'm trying to communicate with is the hero of the story. And this is a whole other conversation, but let's use the hook story offer methodology um, for a 45 second video and making them the hero. So I want to hook you, Sarah, with something really interesting right off the bat. And then I want to tell it as a story. How do I how do I make this an interesting story that's compelling, right? With great tempo, pace, and pausing. And then what's my call to action? And and everything I do when it comes to selling, I'm always trying to hook story and offer. So when I do that in a 45 second video, and I'm making my client or the prospect the hero of the story, I'm asking them, have you run into this kind of problem? Have you, you know, what, what are you stumbling with right now? What do you need help with? Then I'll tie it into a story of how I helped someone in a similar field. Well, it's interesting, Sarah, because I actually have a client right now who's kind of in the same space and also, and then take them through that journey of where the client was before they met you, what they had tried before and where they got to after working with you, right? And I think, you know, I, any video I do or any, any sales conversation, I'm always trying to implement the hook story offer. Um, but I think it's really relevant, especially when it comes to making your prospect the hero. So really position it as, hey, Sarah, 
what's what's your pain point you know or hey sarah why now why why right now okay because you want to make more more revenue and drive more okay but why right now sarah why for sarah is it right now that you and i are having this conversation and i'm always trying to point the light back to um the prospect but especially it's especially compelling when it comes to video because then it's like i'm literally talking to them so now think about it this way now i'm a prospect i get this video this well-lit video that's well scripted sounds like a conversation the person knows what they're talking about they they hook me with something interesting they're telling me a great story that totally relates to me it's really hard to not go to the next level right and it's really hard to not book a meeting with that person then um and that's one of the key things I think is that I think in sales in general, an opportunity that's missed is really about storytelling. And, you know, when I was in the cruise ships, um, one of the things I found really interesting was it was like the most B2C experience that ever, right? Cause I, I, we were actually selling all the duty free. So you're thinking liquor, tobacco, but it was really Swiss watches and jewelry. That was the big revenue drivers for us. And, you know, we would, I, I had to get someone, you know, on a, who's on a cruise ship, who's upstairs on the top deck on the first sea day, because it's sunny out and they're coming from, you know, upstate New York to come to the dark theater and listen to me pitch like 60 products in 60 minutes. So telling stories really made it compelling. And then when I got into the B2B space, I said, where's all the storytelling? I mean, we, everyone that did this in the cruise business, we we're all storytellers. Where's the storytelling? And they're like, ah, we kind of do that, but we're not focused on it. And I'm like, well, you know, I think there's opportunities, especially in video, right, to think of it as a more to B to C experience, right? Because I we're still selling to humans, and right, and I think that's that's often forgotten. Even even if we're we're selling B to B, we think, well, the person who's going to buy this on the other end, or I'm trying to sell to on the other end, um, it's work, work, work. Well, it's not. It's about Sarah. You know, Sarah, you and I had a quick conversation last week, and the first thing I brought up to you was, hey, are you from Vancouver? Cause I looked at your LinkedIn profile, right? So I'm like, Oh, you Vancouver, a little bit about your history changes the dynamic of the conversation. And I think that if, if, especially in your videos, you know, position yourself as if you were making a B2C sale, I want to talk to Sarah here. Um, so that's kind of the, the, I, I can go on for, you know, 10, 15 hours of this, but those are kind of the main, um, if I'm going to cram everything into 30 minutes, let me just recap those things real quick. First thing is, you know, how are we, why are we sending video and how, and again, like 3%, 3% of salespeople use video. Three. Think about that. I, do I want an email? I get so many emails. I disregard all my email. You got to blow my mind with a subject line, but if it says personal video in brackets, more than likely I'm going to give it a click, right? At least give them that opportunity. Use it to hold your meetings. I, this, this one, as someone who's used video all his life, I've only been using this one for about a month and it was mind blowing the amount of people that were showing up for meetings, um, which was, again, we had about half show up before, and now we're getting in the mid eighties. I mean, that's think of all the effort I went to, to get a meeting with you, Sarah, all that effort. And now I'm going to dramatically increase the chances of you showing up by doing a 15 second video done. I'm in. Um, and then also proposals, right? That's the opportunity for you to go viral inside a company, right? Get all these stakeholders, especially when you're at that point of the proposal to really get buy-in. Because I guarantee you, there is no other vendor. I, I can, there is no other vendor sending in a proposal video, taking you through those points. So those are really key points. And then from a production standpoint, think about your background, right? What's behind you? How are you lit? Think about your tempo, your pacing, your pausing, think about your scripting. But if you do all those things, you are going to be so effective and so ahead of the 3% of salespeople that are actually using this, but you're so many times ahead of the people who aren't, right? And then the last thing, you know, Sarah, and I mentioned this already, but, and the key thing is, this is it. My kids ask me all the time, Nick, how do you get better? Or dad, how do you get better at something? You get better by practicing. Well, practice doesn't sound good when you're 11 or when you're 12 or 15. But the reality is, is that, you know what? If you want to shoot better, just uh, you know, shoot basketball is better. Just go out and take 100 shots a day. You're going to get better. And you'll start to see change quickly. Like it happens quick. A kid can't identify that time period because they don't have the same life experience. But as an adult, if you're going to tell me that I can get really good at using video, by just taking, you know, the first 20 that I do and rewatching them, 
just get over yourself. You got to get over yourself, but do it because it works. It's fantastic. It's very effective. So I hope Sarah that uh, there was some some value in that. If there's absolutely. any more questions, yeah, to. absolutely. Yeah, guys, we'd love to hear your questions. Please pop them in the chat. Um, any questions that you have for Nick? And I have a couple. And so I'm going to start since it's my live stream and I said so. Um, so my first question is, why why are only 3% of salespeople using video? Why has it not been more widely adopted? Because I think when you think of Zoom and how how we we have to show up for these meetings, well, everyone does video now is kind of that that blanket thought that we're going to have. Um, and then the other thing is that, look, it's, it's like it, people think, well, okay, how long does it take me to send out an email? If there's any customization, right? If you're not using some sort of automation, if there's customization, how long does it take to send out an email? 45 seconds. But if I send out a hundred emails, it's going to take me maybe 30 or 40% longer to send out that same amount of custom videos, but my rate of opens and plays and meetings booked is it's it, you can quant, it, it's it's in the stratosphere. The thing is, everyone gives up, Sarah, because they don't rewatch their video, find it to be not effective, or it's just easier. They don't care, so I'm going to send it as an email as opposed to caring a little bit and putting a little bit of time to make it a video. Right, absolutely. No Makes judgment. Sense. That sounded judgy, <laughs> but but come on. <laughs> No, no, definitely. Yeah. All, all really great points. And yeah, like you said, you got to just get over yourself and give it a go. And when you see that the results are so much higher than sending, you know, this generic automated email, it'll really inspire you to, to do it again. Uh, and we've got a question from Siobhan who is yes. wondering, okay, so when you're using this, this video in your cold prospecting, you're using it to try to book a meeting. How do you go to convert to the meeting? Like how do you, how are you actually booking the, the meeting in that email? Are you using the video for that? Are you putting something in, in the text? 100%. So this is the exact way that I construct an email. So it's personal video about whatever the subject is. Then I'll put, you know, hi, Sarah, that's it. That's the extent of my text. So you need to click play, right? To find out what this conversation is even about. Then there's the video of me. And one thing real quick too, always make sure you have a good thumbnail. And, you know, if you're using Loom or Vidyard, you can just have one really good screenshot that's maybe you doing this, right? Or whatever it is, but something to get them to click play. People historically have used like a whiteboard with someone's name. That's kind of been done. There's a great app called Make It Big. And what that does is like, literally, I'll just put my phone up and I'll say, hi, Sarah, right? So that you know, it's authentic. So you can either do a customized thumbnail or just something that's an engaging picture of you. So they'll click play. Sorry, I sidebarred there. So again, Construct is, hi, Sarah, the video of me, and then right below is my calendar link. And I'll always end the video by saying, and I'd love to, you know, chat with you. If you have a couple minutes, my link's right here. And that's it. Easy peasy. Nice. There you go, Siobhan. And Tomas is asking, is it more effective to go full personalization or um, send out kind of scaled industry-based or persona-based personalized videos so that you can uh, reuse videos? Here's the only time I would scale. And I've done this and it's very effective. Uh, I'll go through a great tool, like let's say Sales Navigator, if I'm using LinkedIn and I'll pull out, um, if I'm looking at, let's say dentists in the United States, I'll pull out all the dentist's name, Mike. And you can literally do that. So it's still customized. I'm just sending out the last batch I did like that. There was like 178 mics. That is so that good. Out, hey, Mike, how are you? Um, so that's the only way I would scale it. The personalization mm -hmm. is so effective and this is a whole other conversation, but I'm a huge fan of LinkedIn. And one of the things I do every single time before I get on a call with someone, I'll take 90 seconds and look for Easter eggs in their LinkedIn profiles. So just mm -hmm. if I was sending you a cold video, Sarah, I'd say, Hey, you're from Vancouver. Oh, so cool. I grew up in, in Montreal and Toronto. Um, you know, have some Tim Hortons for me. <laughs> I just, that, that level of personalization changes every other conversation you are going to you and I are going to have going forward. So if you can, it is uh, Tomas, it is totally worth doing the personalization. Um, when I do demo, so I demo to dentists, um, I'll actually go and get a screen cap of their website. And then I'll put a, a, a file that shows the picture of, of the little widget that we install uh, on their website so that when we mm. get to that point in the demo, they're like, Oh, my gosh. Wow. <laughs> That's but, I, I, but I see that reaction. Right. 
And what am I doing? I'm, I'm painting that picture. It's the same thing. So that level of personalization, Tomas, whenever it's possible, it is worth the effort because it'll come back to you in spades. Nice. Uh, a question from Bo. Um, do you send the initial meeting invite and then follow up with the video or are you sending the video right off the bat? So what happens is, okay, so this is, I'll tell you exactly how I'll get granular here. So the way that I work this is um, when the meeting gets booked, typically it's about a week out usually. And then what I'll do is every day I'll take, it's literally three minutes. Uh, today is uh, Thursday. This is not a great example. Let's say it was Wednesday, Wednesday. Okay. Friday, I'm talking to these four people. So on Wednesday, two days in advance, they booked a week ago, but two days in advance. Hey, Sarah, I just want to say, I'm really excited. And a great, a great thing to say is if you have any questions in advance or make sure I cover anything in particular, you can go ahead and just, you know, reply in this email. And when I started doing this, I was getting like novellas, like, like these paragraph after par Oh, I'm, this is great. I'd love to make sure we cover this and cover this. Well, oh my gosh, forget like going into 15 minutes of discovery to give a great demo. They just gave me half their discovery, right? So what that allows me to do is then just confirm those things and make sure there's nothing else we want to talk about. Um, so again, recap, if, if they're booking a week out, two days in advance is where I send that video. So all my videos for Monday, I'll actually tomorrow morning on Friday, I'll send out a quick video uh, to make sure that those are covered. I hope that answers it for you. Yeah, I think so. Um, Bo, let us know if there's any follow-up questions there. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for all of your questions, guys. I love I love when you guys are, are so engaged and bring those questions for us. Um, I think that that might be it for this moment. And so Nick, I will say thank you so much for joining us on, on this year's Own Your Growth. It was an absolute pleasure to learn from you. As you mentioned, only 3% of people are doing this right now. So it's really a, a kind of a untapped power um, that is out there uh, in terms of prospecting strategies or, or you know just general sales strategies go. So, so grateful to you for joining us today to teach us about it. It's a pleasure. And if anyone wants to connect uh, from this, please connect with me on LinkedIn. Just mention it's, uh, it's from this and I'll absolutely accept. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and any other questions you guys have, if you didn't get a chance to answer them now, you can go over to that Slack community um, and you can pose your questions in there. Um, yeah, and, and that's it. Thank you so much again, Nick. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks for having me. Thanks, everyone. Wow. Colin, I think you're on mute. Or maybe I just can't hear you. That's okay. I'll, it's, I just got, I'll, I got it. I got the rest of the thing. You just, you just do your video. You can just like mime what I say, maybe a little interpretive dance to go along with it. <laughs> um, that was really interesting. That's, that's really interesting because I've tried, um, I did a bit of video prospecting and kind of early days prospecting for predictable revenue. I did the whiteboard that he told me that people have done before. So now mm. I realize it wasn't that cool. Um, but I did that. I did that. And the response rate was definitely higher. Um, but certainly I was having that issue of like, how do you, how do you balance the time that goes into it versus the response rate? When do you use it? Mm -hmm. How much do you personalize it? So yeah, I learned a lot of stuff from him there. And now thinking about it, now that I've received some prospecting videos myself, I always make the effort of watching them and writing back and saying like, hey, I'm not a good target for you. Like, I can't help you. However, I want to encourage you because I really like those videos. Like keep doing that. And if you find the right target, I'm sure it'll work. Um, Cause it's, it, it does stand out. It absolutely stands out. I think the, so there's, if I, I agree. And if somebody genuinely has sent me one of those, I'll absolutely mm -hmm. respond. The thing that I'm going to, that I click and delete right away is the ones where it's the, it's the whiteboard video screenshot and your name is like, it says like, hi, Colin. And it's clearly been like the right, editing like a software variable has been type. added in there. I'm like, Dang, I'm not, right. okay. I'm not watching that. That's like an yeah. auto delete for me. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. If somebody genuinely sends me one, I'll, I'll try and watch it, but I get a ton of email and I don't always because I'm just not as good a person as you are. <laughs> um, well, I, I usually don't respond to the emails. It's really only only if they do something that's like really cool that I'm like, you know what? I was I did that for a long time. I prospected for a long time. And it was so valuable to know when what you were doing was a good strategy, even when it was a no, like to have people say like, 
this is a great email. I'm not a mm -hmm. fit is so much more valuable than to just have like radio silence. Totally. Um, yeah. So many, and so many of the, here comes the segue. Can you smell it? So many of the emails <laughs> that I get, they're just too wordy. It's like, you should really see this presentation called kill a word. Cause you, this there's, there are many, many words in, in your email here that need to be. And so coming up next, we have Patrick McLean and he's the famous author of the kill a word presentation. If you've never seen this slide deck, it's amazing. We'll get it in chat shortly, but I'm going to kick Sarah out. Actually, I'm going to jump into another zoom. I'm going to leave you in this zoom. You stay here, you hang out and we're going to go to Patrick McLean and Sarah's going to rejoin us at the end or for the next transition, because mm -hmm. after Patrick McLean, we're going to yoga. We're going to do some yoga together. Yes. Yeah. And in Love our that. team shirts, team shirts that you can't see because it's in the way of my mic and Sarah's camera is too small. <laughs> oh, you're gross. All right. I love it. Team shirts Our our team who you can't see on camera also has, has theirs as well. Mm -hmm. Um, but coming up next, we got Patrick McLean. So I'm going to show the, uh, the schedule here. So you all can check that out. We got a couple more really great talks ending mm -hmm. with the one, the only Mark Robert. I'm really mm -hmm. excited uh, for that one. I've talked to, had the pleasure of talking to Mark a number of times and genuinely influential on how we look at things here at predictable revenue. Yeah, very true. And make sure you tell everybody about our conversation starter and our give giveaway before you make me leave. I, I totally won't forget the conversation started that Julian just threw the, the link into, into YouTube. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I'll leave you to it. Thanks. Sarah. See you guys after the next one. See you for yoga. Make sure you get your patchouli scented, everything going. Ready, ready. Love it. All right, everybody, you're going to follow me along to a different zoom. This is the schedule. We are halfway through ish and uh, super excited to have Patrick here next. We got one more and then we're going to get into that yoga break. I'm just getting all the things looking good on my side. Um, but uh, yeah, basically we've got Patrick McLean followed by a beautiful yoga break. And then we are, oh, who else is trying to join this? Uh, Veronica wants to come in. Sure. I guess we'll let Veronica into the Zoom. She can come hang out. So we have Patrick today and then, or Patrick right now. And then we got Jared Robin coming up talking about communities after the yoga break. And then we're going to close it out with Mark Robert. And if you don't know Mark, he was the CRO over at HubSpot, wrote an amazing book, Sales Acceleration Formula, with one exception right in the middle of it. There was a big F you to outbound. So feel free to ignore that side of things. Uh, but uh, other than that, it's been, it's a pretty strong book. And he's also, he was actually at one of our last Own Your Girls and he had an amazing conversation. But enough about Mark, because we have Patrick here today and Patrick and I are, are we're not talking about killing words, but we are gonna have a conversation. I was, I was telling the YouTube, everybody here about the, the killer word whole presentation. Whole world, the whole world. You're the telling whole the whole world. world. Yeah, totally. I'm curious, before we jump into the talk, how did you, what, what inspired you to, to create that talk in the first place? What, the how to kill a word? Yeah. Um, so what I, I, I was uh, primarily an advertising creative and I was sick of the business and, um, and it was changing and I, I didn't really know what else to do. And I looked at the world and I said, what could I do that's useful to help people? And I couldn't understand why most people had trouble getting to the point when they communicated for business uh, like executives because i'd spent so much time rewriting working with stuff and i and uh, you know it, it was like they were using a tool the wrong way so if you saw someone using a hammer uh, and they were using the wooden part of it to pound the nail in you would be like hey turn this thing around this is how you're supposed to use, use this tool <laughs> um so that that's why that's why i developed that and it's become more important than ever um, I actually did some course material and I did uh, taught some, taught some, coached some executives and taught some people at companies. And we're going to talk about some of it today, not in writing, but that um, the necessity of really getting to the point and not wasting someone's attention. Um, and yeah. And then I wrote that book and um, it just seemed a great way to demonstrate it, you know, mm -hmm. rather than most of the things that are written about writing are written in wordy terms. Like if someone is not comfortable with their writing, Maybe the last thing they need is a book. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. So it's a different approach. But I'm glad you guys have gotten so much use out of it. That's why I'm here. I guess that's how I got here. Too. It's part of the official predictable revenue canon. Like if you're, I think it's in all of our onboarding documents is the link to that SlideShare presentation or like your slides in SlideShare. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. So if you're not familiar with Patrick, you, they, go ahead. They don't let you update those, by the way, which. Really? <laughs> so. <laughs> I had to make another one to, to put some different information in there, but Ooh. yeah, but no, it's great. 
everyone, I hope everyone uses it and gets lots of value out of it. Right on. We'll throw a link at the end, but let me introduce you YouTube officially to Patrick McLean. He's the president at send, not send reinforcements at reinforcements. Just reinforcements yeah. The, the link is sendreinforcements.com. It's, a, it's, it's, it's stuck in my head. Not only the author of the greatest presentation or the greatest slide deck ever, but you're also, wow. a, also an author, in my opinion. Yeah. And I think many of our opinions here at Predictable Revenue, um, you've also won awards. You also sell books. You also write other, you, you help people with videos. You help people with messaging. You're mm -hmm. a, and a fiction author as well. Can you yeah, tell us yeah. the plots to every single one of your books that, that you've ever written? I can. Well, not every single one, but many of them. So I wrote a series called How to Succeed in Evil, and it's about a person who's a consultant for supervillains, right? And so they try to help villains be more successful, gives business advice. Um, you know, it's it's consultative and, and selling in a sense, too. But he gets very frustrated because they're all so egomaniacal. They don't listen to him and they run into trouble. And I thought when I wrote it that that was an experience that um, maybe a few people had. Like it was an advertising experience. Like I gave you my best advice and you didn't take it. And now it frustrating turns out everybody has that experience <laughs> yes um and today what we're talking about and highly recommend the book if you haven't had it or if you haven't read it haven't heard of it we'll find some links for um links and we'll get them in yeah the I, chat got, here. I got i got some links we'll throw in the chat awesome fantastic today what we're going to talk about we're, we're talking we're going to zoom in a little bit on on sales and specifically how to make I don't know how to make our messaging not boring. And if it sounds like there's an alarm going on somewhere in my house, I think that's happening. I think it's construction right. out in front of me. So hopefully that's not coming through too much. Perfect um, timing. But not, not every, not every product or service wins the marketplace. And so talk to me about how we're going to bridge this into, into selling and how we need to kill some words or not kill some words. Okay. Well, so the deal is, um, we're all out of attention and this is, since I first said this maybe 10 years ago, um, talking about how you had to be efficient with your communication, it's only become more and more true, maybe longer than 10 years ago. Um, there's an infinite number of distractions. So if I don't get to something that someone's going to be able to use on this little talk very quickly, they're going to click away. There's a million other things to watch on YouTube. There's a million other, you know, everybody's got a phone right here. Somebody's going to text them. You're and everyone is trying to reach us with messages all the time. I mean, we're literally the most messaged people on earth. So if you can't hold someone's attention, then uh, you, you, it's like you disappear, I think, honestly. Um, and the other thing is that um, we're literally evolved not to pay attention to things. I mean, everybody has their throw out to neuroscience and communication, and, but we're actively looking for a reason not to pay attention to things or think about things because it uses calories in the brain, right? So I think that uh, in a low attention environment where everybody's competitive, that people don't necessarily buy the best thing. They buy the thing that's easiest to understand first, right? And that's a very different bar sometimes. And if, um, I, if you think about someone's attention as a gift too, and I, 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 I open your email and you're wasting my time. You've just been very rude. If I click on the video and the video doesn't have anything for me, right? Mm -hmm. And I don't, it, the, one of the things I would say in a corporate context too, is if you're writing something in your company to explain something, a memo, an email, what a report, and you don't get to the point people are literally going to like you less by the time they fought through that meaning. And you, you guys talk about this with, you know, outbound emails, like really just get right to it. And, and, and somewhere in, in that sequence, you had a great thing, which is just ask people, Hey, is this, is this a thing for you? Or is it not a thing for you? Is this something you're interested in? Um, and that kind of clarity is great. But the, the question I wanted to start off today is what's the opposite of boring? Engaging, exciting, sales. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh, yeah. What's so? I think it's meaningful because mm. right? you can think of something as interesting or funny, and what's interesting or funny is going to shift depend on who you're depending on who you're talking to. Like when you, God, God bless you. When you had twins, right? You suddenly became interested. So a whole bunch of things became meaningful in a hurry, mm -hmm. right? So if you if you look at you know sites that talk to 
talk to moms, expectant parents, whatever, you know, it's just, there's so much information. You will, you will wade through so much information because it has meaning to you. Um, so you really have to think about what the problem that the person faces is, faces that you're trying, trying to talk to and create something that's meaningful for them. Sometimes it's funny. Sometimes it's crafted. There's a lot of, a lot of different ways, but I'm going to talk about three today. Okay. I think that you can talk about someone's problem is a way to instantly create meaning. Uh, you can be human. You cannot put too many filters or we'll talk about that, or you can be brief. Um, and since, since we brought that up, uh, I would, I would say that, and I have this formula, right? So the, the power of somebody's writing or communication is equal to the meaning it conveys divided by the amount of attention. And what I mean by that is if I take two minutes to say something that I could say in 30 seconds, it's automatically less interesting, right? It contains less meaning. Does this, this make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, I, um, I remember right drawn. after re watching your presentation, I was, uh, when I was coaching people on writing messaging and writing email, and as anybody on my team has worked with me, my messaging now is terrible because I haven't practiced it in a long time. But I would tell people that, you know, each word you put in here is worth a thousand dollars because that's how much money, extra money off your commission check you're going to lose because you're not going to get people that are reading this, that are not going to understand, that are not going to. So that's. That's great. The other, that's a great analogy. One of the other analogies I use, the formula is for engineers and technically minded people. The other analogy is you should use each word like you're, you're paying for it yourself. And that's not to say you shouldn't use fancy words sometimes. Mm -hmm. What it means is that you should use them at the right occasion. So like you don't, if, if you think about it like dishes, most of the time you just eat off regular plates. Most of the time you should just use regular words. You should use regular, sometimes, sometimes it's a special occasion. Right. Um, I love it. So, uh, yeah. So things become fascinating to us as we have a problem. Everybody's interested in their own own problem. So I'll, I'll give you a, a personal example to contextualize this. Um, the uh, other weekend we went camping and a friend had a bunch of kayaks and my son fell in love with kayaking. So now I'm interested in kayaks and I've never I've never really thought about kayaks before, but I will spend lots of time researching kayaks and my problem is a you could you could view it as a kayak acquisition problem right so that's an that's an external problem right that the specs of kayaks the different kinds of kayaks where you get them how you maintain them how you transport them those are all external problems but the problem also has this other component no matter what you're selling right it has an internal problem and that internal problem might be I want to have a way to spend quality time with my son, or I want to feel like I'm a good dad. And uh, I guess it was it was David, the cerebral selling guy, who was talking about people recording always, in progress. People always buy feelings, right? Right. Well, they're they're buying a solution. That feeling is the is the internal problem. They're selling the internal problem. Um, so uh, this is true of everything, especially very dull business to business things which I actually send, and you probably, probably a good idea is I'll give you a link to uh, our recent reel because there's a number of horrendously boring business to business clients that we've done some good work for. Um, insurance, mobile shelving, uh, just a pipe, like just pipe. Um, so uh, like one of the things, one way to look at it is uh, you can talk about like insurance is insanely technical, especially if it's non-standard insurance and different coverages and stuff like that. So if you're talking to insurance brokers, right, they are inherently interested in the technical stuff. What's the coverage? I need, I need flood coverage for this thing. I need, I don't know. Um, but uh, the problem, if you want to get to an eternal problem, the problem that every general insurance broker or every insurance broker has is they have clients who have really complex problems and they can't know everything, but they have to look like they know everything. So they're scrambling. So, you know, if you kind of start with that problem, it becomes much more interesting. Now I'm fascinated. Um, the other example was the, um, the love hate thing that David talked about, right? Um, for people who love feed, people love feedback and hate performance reviews was one of the examples he used. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a, I love that construction, especially, you know, for all kinds of communication, but um, 
it's a problem, right? He's talking about a problem. Once you throw the problem out there, um, you sick of being stuck in traffic. And this, this crazy thing happens when you, um, when you state, if you can state a problem and people get that you empathize with them, they think you have the solution. If you can describe it well, they automatically assume you have the solution, whether it's true or not. What do you think about what do you think about that? I'm talking a lot here. This was supposed to be a conversation. Yeah, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I love the, I, I loved his like love hate. You know, for you know, for people that hate this but love this, is such a great way to cut right to that. I think emotional resonance is what he's really getting to, right? And it's it makes it super super obvious that like if you. It, because you're you're literally asking the user of that message or the listener or the reader, like, does you know? Here's a really shortcut way. If you find yourself nodding, you're gonna like this, right? This is a very snap, easy way to say, "Yep, I'm in," or "No, I'm not in," because, you know, I don't actually mind traffic. Yeah. Um, so there, and I should probably draw a distinction here. There are ways to make things interesting that are not accessible to everybody, right? That. Um, if you take a camera and you hand the same camera to two different people, one person is going to take very boring photographs perhaps. And the other person is going to come back with some of the most amazing things you've ever seen, right? That's a level of skill and talent, you know, writing, I'm going to write something. And because I've spent my whole life reading and doing that, it's going to be probably better than something that somebody else wrote crafted at least let's say. Mm -hmm. um, but the, but just focusing on a problem, even if you don't, do it in the most perfect way. If you're talking about the real, the problem that somebody really has um, and talking about the emotion of it, the internal thing, like you've got them, you've got them fascinated. Um, but you want to um, anything, an external problem too, can have an interesting, uh, more interesting way to explain it or solution anything. So there's another one that um, for one of the clients that I have that sells, they sell movable shelving, you know, the kind of units mm -hmm. and I help them, a number of years ago, like they sold a bunch of different things. They were a dealership for a bunch of different things. They didn't know how to talk about what they did. And uh, I said, I want to interview a number of people in the company. It's, you know, discovery process and all that stuff. And the oldest sales guy there, I talked to him and they're like, well, you're not going to get anything interesting from him. He's just been here forever. And he did this amazing thing. He said, you know what we sell? Most shelves are like this. We sell a movable aisle. And it was such a simple, powerful explanation. I mean, that kind of stuff, that kind of stuff is gold. Like you don't ever unsee that. Mm -hmm. um, Probably the best so, salesperson there. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, maybe, maybe he wasn't like he was at the end of his career and maybe he wasn't as driven as he once was. And he had the accounts like, but man, that guy had it down. He really did. And so that, that also goes to, um, People often mistake questions of tone for questions of substance, right? So his tone maybe wasn't right for younger people coming up, but the substance was there. It just maybe needed to be updated, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, but this, this little example is a good segue to my second point, which is you should be human, right? Um, the more that you're focused on an actual person and the real world, the better off you are, right? Would you... This would be terrible if uh, any presentation where someone just reads slides to you, you know, yep. they're not even looking at you. They're, they're looking at their slide and reading off their, it's terrible. Right. Um, so like I've even gotten to the point where I don't think that companies should really hire spokespeople anymore. Um, I think it should be someone in the company and it's not, I was it's gonna not say, You're going to lose me a job here, bud. Come on. Well, take it easy. <laughs> Well, you work at the company. You're not an external person. Sure. You're not hiring an actor. You're in the thing, right? And that that's authenticity. Um, and and like uh, like like Nick said before, also he said about making videos to send them out to people. Um, you know, uh, prospecting videos. Mm -hmm. uh, he said, you know, make it and send it. At least the first few. Don't look at it. Trust me, it'll be okay. That's, that's the hardest thing to do. That's impossible. <laughs> it's hard. But his point is that we don't, we don't necessarily want perfection out of someone. Like perfection isn't human. Mm -hmm. It's creepy. <laughs> yeah. 
the people, I mean, you'd almost say, cause Sarah has, she's so good at those videos. It's almost a disadvantage. Cause then you're like, Hmm, is this a hired actor? Like they nailed the script and not that Sarah isn't authentic. Obviously she's very authentic, but I think compared yeah. to the average sales development rep, she's a pro like she's, but she's, a, she's a trained actor. Yeah. She, and she's um, a, a damn good one too. I, and, I have a, uh, that what, one of my best friends in the world was the best man in my wedding is a very, very good actor. And he did a one man show where he played, I don't know, 30 parts, uh, the show called fully committed. It was about a guy who was, you know, at this restaurant holding, handling all the booking and playing all these different characters. And he messed the night we went to see him, he messed up. Well, he didn't mess up. It's, he had a phone that was ringing. He had to pick it up and the cord came out of the phone. And in that moment where everything lapsed a little bit and he handled it beautifully, just hit you how good he was at it right it, it it was an amazing moment because it increased the power of the performance mm. because it was that little human moment in there and I've, I've never forgotten that if i stumble or if i say um or i have an a, emotional moment you know we have a, I, it it enhances the communication and we shouldn't we shouldn't be uh, afraid of that um it makes it more authentic and I think, I think as somebody who's receiving on the receiving end of any sales and messaging, I'm looking for things that aren't real, that aren't authentic. And I, I was, I was lamenting before, you know, I see a lot of these videos that are sent to me. And the first thing that I see is something that's not authentic. And it's a, it's a screenshot of the video or like the preview of the video. And it's the, it's the rep sitting there with a clipboard with like, hi, Colin written clearly not in like marker it's like very obviously been added in and i'm like yeah not authentic like if you're not gonna if you like if you genuinely send me one of those i usually try and respond i'm not perfect um and they don't always make it into my inbox but like if you're authentic and you're gonna take some time i'll take some time and i'll give you some feedback but if you're gonna send me one of those like if you're gonna automate me into a you know outreach tool i'm gonna automatically you want my time, but you're not going to spend, spend your time to get it. Yeah. That's yeah. a, that's a very, it's being a selfish human. <laughs> yeah. And, and the other thing is like with the problem, right? Here's another litmus test that I have, right? If you um, are starting with you, you're immediately not interesting. No one is interested in me in this presentation. Um, I mean, they're interested in what I can do to help them. And people will be nice in face-to-face -face interactions and they'll, you know, we have a little chit chat at the beginning and whatnot. But if, if I don't have something, if I'm just talking about how wonderful I am, um, then they're, they're, they're just being lost if I'm not providing something of value. But if you talk about that problem, but think about websites, emails, proposals, videos, anything where at, you know, at E.L. Hutton, we've been in business for 350 years. That's great, but I don't care. Does it make sense? Mm -hmm. That's why that, like those love-hate statements, get right to it. And then, and then you can start to, in the decision-making process, you can start to be like, okay, well, have they been around a while? Do they have this capability? Do they have that capability? Um, so, uh, and it's interesting. So it's bringing me in my third point here. Um, and it's interesting how many other problems this solves. My third point is to be brief, right? So if you have to hone everything down to 30 seconds, 45 seconds, then you, you lose all that pre-ramble at the beginning that's about you, generally speaking, and you get right to the problem, right? What's the most important thing here? Um, so taking, taking two paragraphs of copy to explain something is always less interesting than than a great headline. Um, so for the kayak example, right? If I would love to have a good 15 minute conversation with someone who's knowledgeable about kayaks and the two things there are 15 minutes and conversation. I, I don't want an hour of you reading slides about the development of kayaks and you know, how the industry's changed. And, mm -hmm. but as, as technical experts or experts in details, of a product, right? That's what's important to us. Like if I'm in a, if I'm a competitive salesperson and I'm selling motors that go on generators, 
right? That's the, or sorry, uh, alternators. Uh, start, yeah, no, but like things that start up big industrial motors, motor starters, like big capacitor arrays and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Um, motor control stuff, I mean, horrendously boring, right? Um, what's what's in my head is all the technical specs and all of the competitors and all that other stuff. So for me, the difference between, a, you know, model A and model B is gigantic. For a person who doesn't have that technical mindset, you know, there's really no, it's the doohickey that goes on the motor to start it. Mm -hmm. does, this, does this make sense? Oh, yeah. I, I mean, I used to sell generators. So I, yes, I'm like, oh, I remember deep sea module RS M232 or whatever it was. And it's like, some people are like, I just want a button to push and the machine will start. And other people are like, hey, I've got to have this specific type of like R RJ35 cable or whatever, so that I can hook it into my automation system. And it has to be compatible with XYZ. But if you just want the generator to turn on, some people just want a button and some people want unlimited control. So like you said, yeah, or with your kayaks, you, you, you don't want the history of kayaking. You're like ocean kayak, lake kayak, trick kayak. I don't know. One with holes kayak in it. that I have to, yeah. Whitewater kayak, kayak. I have to maintain kayak that I don't have to maintain, you know, totally. like, um, authentic Inuit kayak. You know, there's, there's, but notice in, in the generator example, right? How many different problems there are there that you could talk about to be fascinating. One is I just need a button. The second one is I have a technical challenge. I have, need to make this generator for a marine environment and I need it to last and just run once a year, but I need to have it work every time. Mm -hmm. um, or it could be, I need to make this purchase in this larger organization and I need that, I need cover that this was the right purchase. Or my problem is how do I, how do I help this person inside the company by selling them ge their generator, advance their career, you know, those kind of things. Mm -hmm. And so it's not, like it, it depends on the case, but what everyone, you get to know your customers, you get to know your markets, hopefully. Um, but when we're afraid, we focus on us. You know, when I'm afraid I focus on me and that's not good. I need to focus on somebody else, especially in the communications. Um, so I would say um, there, there's a great mnemonic I have for this too, that evidently comes from um, fighter pilots on aircraft carriers. So in the briefing room, in the United States at least, um, if you're briefing fighter pilots, they have this thing, if someone's taking too long, they pulled up two fingers and shake it. And it means faster and funnier, faster and funnier. Think about how many times you've seen something. You're just like, come on, come on, get to the point, get to the point. Um, yeah, and so the litmus test that I have, um, the quickest litmus test is the, so what do you do question? Mm -hmm. And if an organ, if someone can't answer that in a way that interests somebody in 15 to 30 seconds tops, then it's not, it's not figured out. Um, and there are, there are lots of components to sales and marketing, but it all bottlenecks at that 15 to 30 second answer, call it three sentences. Mm -hmm. um, and I would argue yeah. that just to build on that, that you, it's not just, it's likely not just one right? You would have one that would be relevant to a certain buyer type. You'd have a different one to be relevant to a different buyer. If I'm having a conversation with absolutely like a family friend who might not know what we do, I'm going to say, yeah, we help companies build sales teams. But if I'm talking to somebody who's in sales, I'm going to get one level more spe specific. If yes. I know they have a sales development team and they're looking for coaching, I'm going to say something totally different. If I know they're in a startup and they're just trying to figure their revenue out, I'm going to say something different. So I'm going to, I have these slightly different crafted modified messages to make them more relevant to the in, individual that I'm, that I'm talking to. Um, yeah, I have this mind that I, I always try and simplify things generally for the purposes of communication. Um, but if I thought about, it, I was talking to somebody and they said, what is it? What is a director of marketing supposed to do? And this is this the same thing as we're talking about the same thing with, applies for sales too. And I'm like, well, a director of marketing, let me see, actually, I have one. Yeah. Like you need to have an index card, right? For everything you sell. And it has to be audience, action, and message, right? It's got to be broken down that simple. What's the, what's the pitch for each one of these people? Part of the message might be, where do you reach them? How do you reach them? But I think a lot of developing uh, sales or marketing strategy is could be reduced to having 15 index cards. Mm -hmm. And like, it's obviously it's more complicated 
in action. But if you can't boil it down that simple, maybe you don't have it figured out. Um, yeah. So, and the, the other thing about being brief, and I was going to say this at the beginning is, um, and I can talk about this stuff all day, obviously, is I think it's better. <laughs> yeah, I think it's, yeah. But I think it's better to have every presentation I go into. And I actually, after I, this was my goal, I, there's a book on it called 15 Minutes Plus Question and Answer. The faster you get to human interaction, the better it is. So uh, I try and leave all the uh, the data for the handout, all the thing for whatever you need to follow up uh, with, or whatever technical question they're going to have. So, with that with that in mind, let's see. Are there any questions in the chat? I've covered a lot of stuff there. Um, Let me see here. I'm seeing some, I'm seeing lots of PR people. I'm seeing Alice. Good to see you, Alice. Um, I wonder if we, so funny story, we just hired a director of marketing uh, and I know she was in the chat earlier. So when you said that example, I was like, yeah, let's see, let's see what she thinks. Oh, I'm not so sure yeah, if she's still in. I have, it's obviously a long event and I don't expect her to hang out all day because she yeah. also has twins. Oh, oh, I, that's when she told me, I was like, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm sure it's lovely, but um, yeah. So maybe maybe we could we could take an example. Somebody maybe if somebody has a challenge or talk about you know a, a specific a specific question, we can talk about it for predictable revenue. Like how do you, so what what's tell me how you make that interesting to like do you lead with you haven't figured out your revenue stream yet? Is that is that the first thing? Yeah, this is a tough one because it's in my head, like there's no ones like, and this is probably where we could use some help. And I want to, I'll, I'll cap myself here because I, I want to, we got about two minutes until we're going to get into yoga with Julia. And, oh, okay. I, oh, good. good. And uh, so, yeah. I timed that perfect. It well, let amazing. me also say that, um, <clears throat> well, you know, write things. Uh, <laughs> uh, so in, in the chat, I also have this uh, explanation audit little session thing set up because I think that um, it's sort of a, quote by Nassim Taleb, sort of actually a risk analyst, marketing beyond explaining things is insecurity. So really the way I think about these problems now is how are you going to explain the value you provide or the problem you solve? So if anybody has listened to this and you know wants a little bit more, there's four or five questions and we'll have a 20 minute chat. Like it's 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 the best and simplest way. Fantastic. And there was I also remember you talking about an online executive presence course. Oh yeah, yeah, that. I do have a link to that, um, and it covers it. It covers messaging stuff as well as you know some basic stuff about what you would do with the camera setup, and um, and I, I got to tell you the the thing that Nick said, I I, I was cheering about pausing <laughs> because, and I always feel like I should pause more because when you pause, that's when the thought happens in the person's mind you're talking to. And the whole goal is to get that person to think. Mm. I think many that work with me on a regular basis will insist that I need to pause more. I can do it on sales calls, but maybe in our one-to-one -one meetings, I am less good at that. Well, you know, it's, it's tough when you're, you know, you're trying to get things done. But I would say that um, uh, any, like you wouldn't, Think, think about a human interaction or an interaction with a video or a piece of whatever. You don't want to get through it. You want to maximize the, the human content. Hmm. So I love that. You're such a way with words. That's what we love having you on. Patrick, thank you so much right. for showing up here. Uh, chat, we're going to throw some information to Patrick's. I highly recommend you take him up on, uh, on the audit. It is excellent. The last time he offered something, I took him up on it and it was immensely helpful. I've sent him a number of things and he's like, stop sending me these things. Um, and he's always Anytime. super helpful with feedback. So if you want some of Patrick's time, um, hit up that audit. We'll throw the link in the chat shortly and hang out for yoga. Patrick, thanks so much. Right. Always great to talk to you. All right, man. YouTube, I know, I know you're there. You're following me. I'm just trying to find the link to the right Zoom. I know I've got it. It's here. We're almost there. Get your, get your incense lit. Get the patchouli going. Let's get ready for some yoga. All right. I think we are in. There's, there is uh, Julia and Sarah. Are we doing this? Hello. You all ready? 
We're ready for some yoga. Ready. All right. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Well, hey, everyone. I'm Julia, marketing manager at Figure Avenue and in my free time, yoga instructor. So very excited to do a little stretching here with you today. We're all like hunched over the laptop all day, um, which is great because there's so many awesome topics today. But let's just give our backs a little break. Um, as announced, no need to change at all. Um, I am in jeans too. Um, we're going to do the yoga in our chair. So all you want is a little space around you, maybe in front of you, but not too much. Um, and then we're going to get started. Um, so just sit out on the outer edge of your chair. And we're going to plant the feet down on the floor. So both feet planted Recording there. in progress. Do I have to accept this? Yeah. It's just okay. us forgetting to hit record. <laughs> okay. Okay. So both feet planted down on the floor. Um, hands as comfortable. You can just place them on your legs. And then imagining like a string pulling you up to really straighten your back here, straight spine. And then you can close your eyes just for a little moment here and um, take three deep breaths in and out through the nose. Take like the deepest breath you've taken all day. Awesome. Then if your eyes were closed, you can open them up again. Then we're going to inhale, lift arms up and overhead. And just straighten your back here a bit more. Reach up, look up to the ceiling. Really straighten that back. And then we're going to release the arms back down. Now we're going to place the right hand on the left knee. So right hand on the left knee. And the left hand can just grab um, the outer side of your chair or you can place it behind your back. Inhale, lengthen your spine again. And then with the exhale, we're going to twist towards the left. So the gaze is just on top of your left shoulder, coming into a nice little twist here. And with every inhale, try to straighten your back a bit more. And with the exhale, come a bit more into the twist. One more breath here. And then we're going to release back to center. Doing the same for the other side. This high, the left hand comes on top of the right knee and the right hand grabs the outer edge of the chair or behind your back. And here again, we're going to inhale, lengthen the spine and exhale, this time twisting towards the right. Looking just right behind you. Take one more deep breath. And we're going to release back to center. Now we're going to interlace the hands behind the back, just or behind the neck, and really open up the chest here, like balancing out that we're hunched over the laptop all day. And then slowly let the head drift down towards the back, really stretching the chest a bit more. You can sneak in a smile here. <laughs> Just a smile for doing yourself a favor and your body. And then we're slowly going to move the head and the chin into the direction of the chest. The head moves down. Getting a nice stretch in, in our neck. And just continue breathing in and out through the nose. Right. Now I'm going to release, release the hands down, head comes back up. Awesome. Going to do a little um, circles with the shoulders. So inhale, lift the shoulders up. Exhale, lower them down. Inhale, lift them up. Exhale, down. Now we're going to reverse the side of the circle. So inhale up. Exhale down, just in the other direction. Two more at your own pace. Great, awesome. With the next inhale, we're going to extend the right leg towards the front. So maybe you need a little bit of space in front of you and feel how we're activating the abdominals here. Awesome, then we're going to do just two circles with our ankle, the right ankle. 
And I'm going to reverse the circle. And then we're going to uh, bend the right knee and pulling it up in towards us, hugging the right knee in for just a moment. And then we're going to cross it over. So the right ankle crosses over the left leg, opening up the right hip flexor. Inhale here, straighten your back if it's not already straight. And then with the exhale, we're going to fold forward on top of our legs, just as much as feels good. If that means that you're up here, that's okay. No right or wrong, just bend as much as feels good. Feel the stretch in your hip and in your back. Inhale, we're going to lift up and bring that right leg back down on the floor, planting the feet down. Inhale, this time we're going to lift the left leg and start doing the circles with the left ankle here. Reversing the side of the circle direction. And then here again, start bending the left knee, pulling it in, hugging it in for a moment. And then cross it over on top of the right leg. Inhale, straighten the back. And exhale, fold forward on top of the legs. And maybe feel a, different, a difference in one leg to the other. Maybe one felt easier to fold forward than the other. Or maybe both are the same for you. Take one more breath here and then we inhale lift up and exhale release the leg back down great now we're going to do circles with the head so start with little circles and with every round let your circle become just a little bit bigger this helps to let go of tension that you might feel in your neck or your back. And we're going to reverse the circle. This time start with big circles and let the circles become smaller with each round. Until we come into stillness. And then with the next inhale, we're going to bring the hands together, heart center. Take the deepest breath that you've taken in all day. Inhale in through the nose and exhale through the mouth, okay? So <sighs> let go of any tension, any stress. <sighs> Great. Thank you for joining this little breakout yoga. I hope you enjoyed it and continue enjoying Own Your Growth. Namaste. Namaste. That was amazing. <laughs> I feel so fresh. Yeah, that was Refreshed. great. <sighs> ready to Relax. continue enjoying. <laughs> Thank you so much, Julia. That was awesome. For sure. See you guys tomorrow. Sounds Bye -bye. good. See Bye, ya. Julia. Nice. I loved that. What a great little, uh, a great little in between. That's not something that you get to do all the time on a, on a, a virtual conference is have an actual live yoga session mm -hmm. led while you're sitting there at your desk. How cool. That was great. My, uh, was one of your legs tighter than the other when you went to to do the stretch. It was. it was. My left leg, notoriously tighter. How about you? <laughs> yeah, my left leg. I just, <laughs> I, as you said that, I was, Maria, Maria goes, was this your first time doing yoga? Because <laughs> <laughs> it just looked like you had no idea what you are doing. It's like, I've done it a handful of times. Um, I am qu quite flexible, but yeah, I, it definitely, okay. I'm, I don't know the poses and Right. I did throw my feet up on the desk at for when she's like, <laughs> and lean back. I was like, I think I'll lean all the way back. Nice. There you go. It was nice. Well, yeah, that was awesome. Can't wait to do that again. How wonderful. Um, I will intro our next guest since he's ready to join us in just two minutes. He's, I can see him waiting in the waiting room there. Um, but before I do that, I just want to plug a little something, something about predictable revenue. So nothing kills morale like a dry sales pipeline. That's absolutely true across the board. Salespeople, sales, sales leaders, you, you know that that's true. And worse yet is not knowing what to do about it. We can help you succeed with our online assessments. We might not know what 
your, we not, might not know your business like you do, but we know sales development. And if you leave, uh, we're going to leave a link in the chat. That's going to, um, if you want to learn more, you can, yeah, click that link, learn about our coaching offering. We can do our online assessment with you. We can figure out what is going wrong, what is causing that dry sales pipeline so that we can buck up the morale on your team, on your leadership team and get some more sales and some more revenue in the door. I love Very it. Very important. I thought you were going to say, we might not know what we're doing, but give us some money anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, where'd she go we with might, this? We might not know this anything, a- but we might also. No, we might not know your business, but we know sales development. Cool. So, and if coaching isn't your thing, click the link. Click the like button. Click the subscribe button. That helps us. Yes, so true. If you like the content, click that button. Come join us for, for our other pieces of content, for our live streams, for our podcast, all of that. We would love to have you as a subscriber. Um, but I'm going to let in our next guest. So excited to have him here to join us. Hello, Jared. How is everybody? Hi, Jared. How are you? Doing well. Doing well. How are you? Good. Really good. Thank you. So glad to have you here. So glad to be here. Really excited to uh, walk through selling in a community. Yeah, absolutely. Me too. For those of you guys that don't know Jared Robin, he is the co-founder at Rev Genius. Um, so yeah, co-founder of Rev Genius. Rev Genius, if you don't know what that is, is a community mm-hmm. of 12,000 plus salespeople, marketing, and rev ops professionals. So it's a wonderful place to go learn about all of these different topics, actionable uh, strategies to help you in any of those different areas. So please make sure that you do join Rev Genius as well. And we will pop a link in the chat for you to be able to join that wonderful community. But for now, Jared is going to walk us through how to leverage communities to sell more. Jared, take it away. Yeah. Th- thank you for having me, Sarah. And, and, and this is a topic that I'm so excited about, you know, being, and, and I'm going to share my screen in just a minute, but being a founder of a community that supports sales, marketing, and rev ops people, people that job is to sell, you know, yet number one rule is don't sell. <laughs> how, how does that work? And it's not that we don't want sales to happen. It's just, there's a right way to do it. And, and so this presentation I'm about to walk you all through is not just going to show you like the proper etiquette around the community, but, but how to utilize it to actually sell and, and, and hit some of your goals there with that. So without further ado, check out my nice, neat, nifty presentation here. So how do we leverage communities to sell more? This is the question. Y'all are probably, you've heard of communities. Maybe you're a member of Rev Genius. Maybe you're a member of a different one. Maybe you're a member of all of them, right? And I want to walk you through how to really leverage, whether it's our community or others, to really sell and and, and really hit, not, not just hit your goals, but make people feel really good about working with you. So to start here, and let me just uh, bring it down here, we're going to discuss, one, what is community? We're going to talk about selling in a community hiring in a community, right? Because you have to sell your company or sell yourself to somebody else. And then networking to level up your sales skills, right? There's a chance to sell more, uh, you need to get better. And, and you know, that's something that many of the best revenue professionals could surely empathize with. So let's, let's break it down with a little overview of community. Community, the most important trend. You'll see the, the, the up and to the right Below is the Clubhouse user acquisition. You know, that's that's a community a lot of us are part of, also LinkedIn as well. But here, here's a quote that that really took me uh, took me back. And this is Andrew Chen of A16Z, and this is about learning within community. So we have old institutions, they're not enough. Traditional education in the forms of business schools, executive programs, and graduate programs, they've been slow to meet the practical hands-on needs of professionals at the forefront of change. If the pandemic has taught us anything, and sure we're at the tail end, but we're still in it, about modern education, that's in serious need of reboot. So in the future, and and we truly believe the future is now, students will engage and learn traditional education in a more productive way, new more productive ways. And and this this quote is in regards to Reforge, one of their investments in, in a community at that. So building on this, 
I pulled an awesome quote uh, from the co-founder of HubSpot, Dharma Shah, in that many companies have forgotten they actually sell to they, they sell to actual humans, right? I think many salespeople sometimes forget that too. Um, humans care about the entire experience, not just marketing or sales or service. And to really win in this modern age, you must solve for humans. So these all really resonated with me, you know, when when coming up like with some backdrop of, you know, first you have to understand what community is. And community is more powerful than social, I truly believe. So we're all on social uh, in one way, shape or form, whether it's Facebook, a lot of us are on LinkedIn, Clubhouse, I just showed you. Uh, but Clubhouse is really fostering this community uh, sense. And, and this is why it's so powerful as are all the micro communities. So you have networking versus selling, the abundance mindset for scarcity mindset, trust in a community first maybe being skeptical, just having a random SDR <laughs> reach out to you, giving versus vanity. You know, we want to help others versus just get the most likes or comments. And I'm sure you can empathize with that. Learn from others or learn from ourselves. Speak to hiring managers in the community or apply to jobs on a LinkedIn job board, et cetera, and value versus influence. So this is why I truly believe community is more powerful. Now, let's break down what is community. And, and understanding what community is, is the first crucial point of really understanding um, how to sell in there. So community is not a platform. You've heard of communities on Slack, Discord, um, Clubhouse, etc. I believe um, there's platforms behind it that enable it, but it's not a, it's not a platform. Community is y'all, it's the people. We, I show you that quote from the, the CTO of HubSpot, it's the people. And even more, it's family. So it's not just random people out there or an audience, it's people that you have a chance to communicate with, learn from and, and, and really build uh, relationships with. So community is family. That's a big point. That's that's our first value in Rev Genius. I don't want to sell Rev Genius, but the first value is community is family. And family, that, that that's important. Family you give, family you help out, you give more than you take, ideally. We all have uh, you know, some other cases, but you know, taking that community as family and bringing it to selling is critical. Don't sell. Sure, it's a first rule or one of the first rules, no selling or self-promotion in communities. But we're talking about how to help you sell more. It sounds counterintuitive not to sell. But when you're dealing with your family, you're not selling. Um, and if you are, you're probably not being invited to Thanksgiving dinner or all of the family events, right? You, you don't want to be that person. Number two, give more than you take. This is a critical um, point in, in, in a lot of like the bylaws of communities and like what, what they do. So, so what does giving mean? And let's break it down. You know, I'm taught that to sell, I need to give a case study of my product, my SaaS software as a service product um, and how it helps. Well, everybody has a case study. Everybody has multiple. And if you don't, you will in a month or two because that's what you're taught. So is that really giving? Giving is let's, let's give away from our business model or truly give to give, not give to get a deal. That's the big thing. So helping somebody get a job, helping somebody by giving them a playbook, a 30, 60, 90 playbook to help them ramp faster, Etc. Like you could be selling an ABM solution that that doesn't help you sell there, but but giving does. It makes you more magnetic to others. And and number three, let people come to you. So you're just helping everybody. You're not selling, and you're letting people come to you. How, how is that possible? Um, well, Rev Genius had fourteen thousand members. Sure, we plug in the comments there, but. Um, you know, we're, we're just giving, we're letting people come in at no cost and the sponsors or our business model come, come to us. And, and, you know, that, that might be one extreme example, but like it really 
really works like this. When you just give and, and just give some more and certainly give more than you take, it creates a really good energy. And that's how to sell in a community. So let's break it down. Let's say you're looking for a job. How do you sell yourself to get hired? Well, one, show up, differentiate yourself with other, from other candidates with video, but more importantly, authenticity. Authenticity is big. And, and you know, going back to the, the past page, the past slide, when you give to get, you're not being authentic, right? You're, 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 you have ulterior motives and they're obvious and it's kind of a turnoff. And, and y'all, how, how many of you are turned off daily from people on LinkedIn reaching out to you? How many of y'all wonder why LinkedIn now only has 100 connections a week? Jeez, they're, they're putting it into their laws, their rules, their guidelines, that they don't want you to connect because it's turning people and churning people from their platform. And they're not community because they're, they're taking lessons from the small communities to create a really good environment. So in hiring, show up differentiate yourselves with that authenticity and, and use that authenticity throughout to sell and lean in. Lean in is part of giving uh, more than you take. So when you get help, uh, you can lean in and just show up and, and believe it or not, showing up is giving. Whether it's to show up to a webinar to learn, whether it's to show up and answer a question, um, even if you know just the first thing about it, but like, you, you know, a little bit and you could, you could help a little bit. That's big. So when you lean in, you get out. Um, an example here, hey, I'm looking for a new job. Does anybody have any ideas of how best to do it? Versus saying, I want a job from you, um, et cetera, et cetera. So like, just put it out there and lean in. And, and, and we've watched it dozens, I believe actually hundreds of times, people getting hired in our community much more potent. Now, you want to sell your company as well for some of the audience. And when I say sell your company, sell your company and others. We're not in an easy hiring market right now. It's a candidate's market. How do you differentiate your company, differentiate yourself? Are you going to just post on LinkedIn? Some people do that. And you're going to get a lot of applicants. It's going to take a lot of time and, and you're not going to really maybe get the, the, the right one for you. So you need to show up too. You're a manager, a director, a VP level, a C level. Show up at the hiring events and community events in general. Talk to the community members that are in the roles you're hiring for. Ask because you have some value to give, right? and then offer advice, offer that value, help others land the jobs they're looking for. So if you're hiring for an SDR, hiring for an AE, and, and you meet people along the way that are looking for product management, or, or I'm sorry, product marketing or, or growth marketing or, or something that's not quite the fit, but you might know the first thing or two, help them. And this all goes back to the cardinal principles to sell, give more than you take, um, I, I mentioned, I added authenticity after and don't sell, help, help. So these are all different ways you could help away from your business model. And what ends up happening is magic. It, it, it comes in. So then I've helped you at least surface level. Or, and actually this is, this is quite a bit deeper, but I'm happy to answer questions along the way. Like, like figure out how to get that right person, sell your, your company or sell yourself or sell your product, but you could also make more sales by learning. Anybody who says they know it all probably run from, right? So when you're networking and learning, imagine this, number one is show up and give. Give to learn. I know a couple things, but you know, I, I, I just did this today in another community. We're looking to hire somebody that, um, I've never hired for before. And I wanted to pick somebody's brain and how I reached out to them was put me to work. How can I help you? How could we figure out a way that I can help you? If it makes sense, I'm happy to do it. No costs, all of that. I want to give. And sure enough, took the call. She took the call, helped me out um, tremendously. And we're going to figure out ways to work together. Now, 
Also identify community members who could potentially help you. You know, a lot of communities have mentorship. Our certainly does. If you're not part of it, sign up. Uh, others as well, we're not the only ones that have mentorship um, or, or quick tips and advice. Reach out and ask. And, you know, sometimes, you know, identify groups and channels in the community, you know, connect yourself and be authentic, right? Like you'll see some of the same commonalities. But what's interesting is I remember an anecdote from in the beginning. Somebody wanted to come into our community itself, and it was obvious. They, there was like a lead in like who in here needs help with A, B, or C. And I, and, and I reached out to this gentleman on the side and I said, are you about to sell? Because if you're not, if you are, don't. And I know that sounds counterintuitive, but try this instead. Instead of, he goes, yeah, I am. I'm, I'm trying to find new clients. We all are, right? And um, I said, okay. And, and, he, and, and he was authentic with me. He said, you know, I, I, I just am not that great with it. He was a solopreneur starting out. I said, try this. Instead of saying, does anybody need these services that you actually provide, which is obvious, of course. Um, of course, you're the best for that, right? Why don't you ask people how best to find people? How best to understand your ICP? How best to test um, messaging, how best to do all of that. And what you're going to have, and what he had was a group of people there to help him. And sure enough, one thing led to another, and he actually got clients from it. And he got some big name people from it and helped build his business, just from that simple changing. Instead of going blast out there, he went, how do I? And yesterday I was actually just blasted with a, uh, you know, a big external thing. And, and we had the same conversation because nothing is a bigger turnoff than being spammed. And, and now we're even more sensitive than we've ever been. So if you use, and, and, and here's how to get to me and, and we can put this up and, and I'll certainly put this, put this up uh, after. If we use the principles of how to interact with the, in a community outside of a community and in social, whether that's LinkedIn, Clubhouse, Facebook, Instagram, wherever you're selling, this will also hold true because everything I've said in this presentation is essentially how to be a magnetic human. And going back to that quote from HubSpot, we're selling to humans you're selling to somebody just like yourself. So, so empathize with them and, and be there for them. So I, I wanted to open this up to questions, but what, what were your thoughts? <laughs> some, some pretty basic lessons, right? <laughs> but the deep impact. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. It's so interesting to hear, especially for me, the, the distinction between community and social, because for me, maybe not that I actually truly thought they were the same thing, but they were sort of like conflated in, in my idea of what each of them were. Um, and we actually did have some questions that came in uh, via Slack previous to sure. this session. So I'm really excited to, to ask you some of those. So, um, and it's along that vein that I, that I just mentioned there, but what actually does make community different from social since often it is housed within social? What is the true distinction there? Yeah. So, um, I, I, I hate to say authenticity or one-to-one, -one, but like social, there's an aspect of gamification, whether it's likes on a post, followers, heck, we most of the people listening and watching this are on LinkedIn, right? They're creator mode. Put your followers even more in the face of everybody, right? So it's very much a one-on-one, -on -one, like vanity, like how do I get the most out of there? How can I hack to build my personal brand? These are questions. These are real conversations. Heck, we have the, we, we've shown as, as a collective community, everyone watching it and, 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 and I'm not innocent of it, uh, how, how to do that. Now, and that is an important part, but community is family. Okay, does, does family need to be on social and get the most likes? No, family texts you directly. Family comes clean with you. Family offers to help. They ask for advice. Um, 
they don't ask you to sell twice. Like if they do once, you're, you're being put in their place. And, and, and that's a big thing, right? Like on social, on every single social network I'm on, whether it's Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram in particular, those three, because there's all written communication. I have gotten spam on every single one of them. After I've joined on, on Facebook, a certain you know marketing group, for instance, on LinkedIn, because they just do that. And on Instagram, because frankly, it connects with Clubhouse and that's how you have to get there, right? So like on each of those networks in particular, Twitter a little less, I found. But um, I've been spammed. In the community, does it happen? Yeah, but you better believe it doesn't happen twice. And if it, and, and if it does, let me know about it because I'll put an end to that really quickly. Um, and, you know, there's, there's, there's a moderating board that's not a bot or, or, you know, drop down. It's just more one-to-one. Now with that said, you'll notice on LinkedIn communities of people uh, supporting one another and having some really authentic conversations. And and, and there are communities within social platforms, but as a whole, um, the moderation is totally different. And and one's more of a family and one's more of a, a product, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Makes sense. And guys, please, if you have any questions about community, how to sell a community, hiring, either recruiting, hiring the two sides of hiring and uh, looking for jobs there, please pop them in the chat. Um, until then, I will keep going with some of the questions that we've had come in through Slack, but I'd love to hear from you guys that are in uh, in the session live right now. Um, but here was another one we got. So um, speaking from a founder perspective, this is a, a product, a SaaS product founder. Yep. How do you start a community? Yeah, th- this, this question comes up a lot, right? Because you have a product that you need to sell. And how do you start a community? Um, one, you think about the members. And sure, the members ideally could also potentially be your, your, your customers or your clients. And maybe they are partially made up of your customers and clients. But what do they need? What do they need? If you're a CRM solution, and you're starting a community, and, and we know the major ones, you're, you're a new incumbent, right? Um, ABC CRM or CRM CRM. <laughs> CRM, sure, is the foundation of what they need, but these people need the same thing you do. Um, in, in this case, probably. They, they need to organize their people. They need to segment. They need to get more business, right? They need to, yeah. They need to do a variety of things in the CRM world. Maybe there's there's maybe you're not a community CRM platform. You're a B two B CRM platform. So your B two B clients, your IMP ideal member profile. <laughs> uh, I'm sure, I'm not probably the first one that came up with that ICP for for membership. One and the same with that. You want to give them what they need. You want to create events around what they need. Of course, you know everything about CRMs. That's obvious. They're, 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 they're Salesforce users already, right? Or HubSpot users, phenomenal companies. But like, how do you get in? You're not going to do it by saying, by just saying you're the better, but by giving them what they need. And then they're going to keep showing up to your community. And they might not all be buyers yet, but if they all come regularly and you help them with other needs, whether that's a sales engagement platform, a sales trainer, um, RevOps knowledge, RevOps hire, because that's a hard role to hire. And, you know, then they're going to keep coming and then your product and and you learning about what the needs actually are, will start building towards them. And you'll see gaps in Salesforce and HubSpot that maybe you could build your product towards and create really a a new space for that. So I, I, I hope that was, uh, concise enough. I'm sorry about all the words, but yeah. No, not at all. Yeah. I think that that certainly answers the question. And and then the follow-up to that same question was then as a founder, um, of this, this product, especially in the case where there are investors, you, you know, there's people that you're sort of tied to when it comes to growth goals or revenue goals, how do you balance needing to run that community and engage with that community with some of those more like direct revenue driving activities? Yeah. It's, it's, it's an endless finesse. You don't want to make your community feel like you're selling to them, ever. It needs to complement your sales efforts already. They have a new acronym called Community Qualified Leads. Sure, finesse. 
Um, but, you know, go back to those original rules. How can you be authentic as you do it? How can you do A, B, and Z, right? Like um, outside of trying to sell the product. And, and how can you create email sequences without call to actions, for instance? This, this is a new phenomenon to some. <laughs> like I, I remember hearing a stat and, and pardon that I don't have the, the reference point that email sequences, nurture campaigns without call to actions perform better, <laughs> you know, to, to drive people to products. Imagine that <laughs> where you're not just having the biggest button possible, like with this, a whole new world, right? Like we, the finesse is, is there and, and just be super helpful. Like all the same things that you learn from great marketing campaigns, bring them into the community and try to level them up even more. Um, and Okay, so to, to answer your question, like c community shouldn't be the full thing bridging the gap <laughs> for investors. You know, you need your sales plan, you need your marketing plan, et cetera. Um, I believe it should be a cherry on top, or at least you should think about that it that way. Mm. If you go to the, if you go to communities out there that are product based, let's look at everything from like Webflow, a CMS. $2 billion valuation backed by Excel. Like I'm a member there, you know, we use Webflow. I've never been sold by Webflow ever mm. from their community. Okay, $2 billion valuation. <laughs> um, you go to another one like GitHub or, uh, or, or Ghost CMS. Like I'm a member of some platforms and sure, maybe I get community updates. I don't get any salesy emails. I don't get any salesy calls. I don't get any salesy anything from them. And these are massively valued companies. So I think, I think you use it to accentuate and you build, and, and, and you build a cult for lack of a better <laughs> phrase, like a really, really dedicated followers that are helping one another. And if you go on the web flow, web flow is an awesome example. If you go on Facebook, I've actually myself, like as a community member put up like jobs looking for independent contractors. Like they just help me with like little needs, never been up. So I, I'm giving like all these buying signals, right? Never been um, even contacted from Webflow to direct me to the right people. Like mm -hmm. they just let it happen. And, and is that a missed opportunity or not? Um, you could look at it that way. I mean, I'm sure the, the dedicated marketer in the audience might be, but like, I don't think so. I think, I think it's awesome. And, and, Oh, Jared just found somebody for 500 bucks. Like oh, our minimum experts, like a thousand, let it be. Cause he's using our product. Right. Like, and, and, and just let it go. So like, that's yeah. interesting. That is very interesting. Yeah. So it, it, the community's function cannot be to sell. So that's why yeah. it's not even really a balancing act because it's a completely different thing that you're doing. You're, you're, you've got sales on one side and your community is something else through community and through a successful, authentic community that helps people, those customers will come to you, but that community is not a revenue driving activity, not a direct revenue driving activity in itself. Like you can't, yeah. you can't think of it that way. Yeah. I, I mean, do you want to look at arguably, I don't even know if it's arguable. The number one SaaS community is Salesforce Trailhead. Okay. Yeah. Billions of dollars are going through the people, the agencies that do Salesforce admin work. Billions. I believe one book I read was like, there's more money going through that than the actual CRM. Hmm. You have the whole ecosystem, all of this. Um, the community is so good. When I used to speak to a Salesforce rep and they didn't know the answer, they would say, Google it. Like, because the community was able to help more than they could. Hmm. That is rad. That That's pretty exceptional. So like, let it support the people. And, and, and I don't know if Salesforce takes a cut or anything of that. Do they? I, I, I probably not. Oh. Right. Like you just start a Salesforce agency tomorrow. I'm sure if they're, if they're recommended or stuff, but anyway, I digress. That's a great example. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Very interesting. Um, any, any other questions from the chat, make sure you get them in. I'll keep firing away with the ones from keep Slack though, away. um, until we get someone, someone live. <laughs> um, so, okay. Looking at some of these kind of big examples of, um, 
the, the communities that exist out there, the big ones like you've named, um, like Trailhead, for instance, there are a couple of different ways that you can kind of start a community. And it doesn't mean that you have to start it from scratch, right? Like you can acquire one, you can partner. So how, um, how does a, a founder decide whether to buy, build or partner for their community? One, how much money do you have in, in your bank account, right? Um, and, and, and how big of a focus you want to have day one. I've seen all, so so day one, and let's say day one pre-series A, um, or C it or before, you're probably going to build it or partner with it. And when I say partner with it, you know, pay a Rev Genius, pay, you know, one of the other dozen notable communities out there or more. Uh, to partner. I think, you know, the, the, the partnering aspect might be the lowest cost in regards to time and maybe actually dollar amount because for, for, for sub what it costs to like bring on somebody and, 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 you know, all the resources there, you could partner and test the waters, but there are companies that, that early on after seed funding are bringing on heads of community because they realize the importance um, one great example that I'm close with now, Minerva knows um, their head of community is phenomenal. And, and I'm part of this creators guild early on and they're fostering this right away. Now, from a buying standpoint, you probably need money in the bank. Although I don't know how early uh, Bevy bought CMX uh, community, for instance, because I, you know, they've raised quite a bit of money since. And then you have more seasoned companies like the outreaches uh, with Sales Hacker. That's that's pretty well documented, and and all indicators are great there. But then you have people like HubSpot that that build it that, that that did a little of each actually, right? Like they bought they built it in house. They built a really great content engine, and then they went out and um, they acquired the Hustle, really spectacular newsletter, um, which I thought was really really cool to see because it was like it wasn't just SaaS it was like entrepreneurs as a whole so like you know you, you could do a mix of all I think the low but I, but I think doing one of the three is essential is essential and, and and even building your own if you're a team of three a team of five under ten you know it, 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 it's certainly good to do that um, but it does take time it does take time, but doing one of the three, I think is absolutely critical. Okay. Awesome. Another question we have here is around where to actually host the community itself. So in those examples we've given, we've got some that are like a, they're within kind of a web page that's created by the, the company. We've got some that are just groups on, on various social platforms. So where do you decide, or how do you decide where to host the community? That is the million dollar question, you know, um, we're on Slack. Why are we on Slack? I'll explain why we decided Slack. And then you could, you could figure it out from there. We started as a LinkedIn messaging group and, and, and this is the good stuff. I, I truly believe wherever you start should be super light, whether it's WhatsApp, LinkedIn messaging, Facebook messenger, and you hear me say Facebook messenger, not even a Facebook page yet. So we were on LinkedIn. We didn't even have a LinkedIn page yet. And um, the app just started breaking every day. We had 38 people in a messaging group. We're like, yeah, we're called Rev Genius. Oh, what is that? <laughs> um, we stand for education and inclusion, inclusion and, and all of this. Um, and, and our members told us to go to Slack. Slack is interesting for a business community because a lot of people live in Slack. Now, Discord's a phenomenal platform as well. And if you look at like the limitations and, um, and, and, and what each could do, Discord has fewer limitations than Slack. Uh, but there's also a learning curve. Not a lot of people know Discord and stuff like that. So, so a Discord and a Slack are both synchronous. Like when you need to have a quick message, as is WhatsApp, right? Like you need to message back and forth. Having something on site, um, and there's many platforms, dozens of platforms, uh, including Ingrown with WordPress um, or Homegrown rather. I, I believe that's what uh, Sales Hacker uses. Is great, um, but I think the Slack and Discord for quicker messaging is big, and I think there's a use for both. 
I think, I think as your community grows, you can determine, like, I always had this um, mind space, like, how are we going to put 100,000 people in Slack? We have 14,000 now. How are you going to have 100,000 just like, like going like that? Some people do. I, I think, I think it probably churns people. So one, to, to, to concisely break this down, one, do it where your members live. Do it where they know. Two, understand the type of messages that you need. Do you need a message board or do you need like fast messaging? And then three, understand that at different parts of growth, you're going to have different needs. You might need two things. You might need a Facebook group and a LinkedIn group and this at 10,000 people, but at 1,000 or 1,000 people, you don't. So just be open to that. And, and, and also keep in mind the resources it takes to manage multiple places. It's going to require more time, but all, all, all good stuff and all good problems to have. I hope that helps. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Oh, yeah. Good reasons to go one way or another. Or, yeah, certainly how to help you try to figure it out for yourself. Um, I want to be cognizant of time. So I'm going to go with sure. one more question. Any of you guys who have any questions that were not answered um, or that we'll you, you're too busy taking it all in. Exactly. We're going to go to the Slack. Speaking of communities, you're going to head over to our uh, PredRev uh, Slack community and you can ask yeah. the rest of those questions there. But one last question for you, Jared. Um, does community-led sales replace the salesperson? So, no, um, I, I, I don't think so. I think other things might replace the salesperson, product-led growth and, and things to that effect. But I think a human needs to be behind it all the time. And I think community-led sales is a location, but it's just as much a mindset, right? So when you're going through other channels, LinkedIn is the most obvious one trying to sell. If you put your how to deal with community hat on, you know, the don't sell, the give more than you take and let it come to you, you're going to see like really good results. So I think, I think it doesn't take away the salesperson. I think it might evolve the sales process or how you reach out, but that's it. And I think that's constantly being evolved anyway. Got it. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much for teaching us all about, yeah, building a community, how to, you know, generate revenue through a community, not by selling, um, all really interesting stuff. It was an absolute pleasure to have you. And thanks again, of course, to Rev Genius for our being a sponsor with us on this event. Really wonderful to have you. Thank you. This has been spectacular. Thank you for having me, Sarah. Thanks so and much, I'll be in, Jared. I'll be in the, uh, the Slack right after. Yep, and that'll be perfect. rad. <laughs> it will be. And reminder to the rest of you guys as well that we did drop the link in for you guys to join RevGenius because that is a wonderful community. Whether you're sales, uh, marketing, customer success, anywhere in between, please join that so that you can learn from that wonderful community. Excited to, to speak more with everyone in Slack. Have an awesome day. Thanks so much. See you, Jared. All right, Sarah. That's great. So interesting. Super interesting. That's, an, that's a topic as well that I don't think we've ever really um, chatted about on on any of our events. It's so wonderful to learn about new strategies and and new kind of ways of selling that are emerging all the time. It's that's one of the kind of beauties of of this industry is that there's always something new and you've always got to be innovating and moving forward. And I love hearing from people how they're doing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's interesting when I think when, oh, look at that cool video of mine. Hey, what is happening? <laughs> this is great. This is like some pretty like sweet eighties filter. I think it I'm is. just going to leave it. It looks like a music video. I look like a, yeah, like an aha what video was, from the eighties. It's exactly what I was going to say, where you like step into the screen totally. and then now you're, do, yeah. Do, 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 Yeah. Yeah. No more. <laughs> and then we got to pay for it. <laughs> I think. Awesome. Well, let's, let's try and fix this. Well, we're waiting for our next guest, Mark Roberts to jump in. We got about uh, probably another seven minutes, yeah. I think until he's, uh, until he's going to join us. Yeah, he is waiting. So we'll just go over a couple of housekeeping uh, notes and then we'll, we'll pull him in for the exciting keynote. Oh, is he waiting in this room here? Yes. Okay, perfect. I was thinking he was going to be in the other, other room. I don't me too, know. but that's okay. Mm, works for me. It's better. It's better now. You, you don't look like I still got like lines. animatronic or I'm, I'm like the original Tron movie. Yeah. I'll try one more time here. Let's see. See if we okay. can get it working. I I'm excited. Anytime we get, we can have Mark on the, sh on, uh, yeah, on here. It's, uh, mm -hmm. 
it's always it's always great the, the last one i think it was his first one we talked about genuinely was incredible um when he talked about sort of the the different stages of like what you need to focus on and when um in terms of like early product market fit basically like do do things that don't scale and then early revenue market fit just fantastic okay yeah so interesting how's your video doing mm. still the same it's, it's not... now you're just like in a 90s tv yeah we've we've graduated a decade we got crt crt version <laughs> colin now now i'm not here at all this oh, is there you go well you know if something's this gonna is the go beauty wrong of, yeah <laughs> it's gonna happen today I think you have a virtual event, you guys. Yeah. Um, so we're going to let Mark in in a couple of minutes here. I'm going to, mm-hmm. I'm going to do one last attempt. Maybe I, I didn't stretch enough and this is my, it's that's your punishment me. for putting your foot up on the table, <laughs> lying to the audience about the yoga you were doing. I deserve it. I deserve you do. It. You do. And it looks like actually maybe Mark did hop into that other one. Ooh, oh, okay. EOS webcam utility. Yeah. Um, so we will actually go over and join him in the in the other room or at least you will and you'll abandon me here and then i'll join you at the end but cool. um yeah Let, how how have you felt about all of the events today colin it's good I'm, I'm glad we're doing today two different sections like today and tomorrow um because i think mm-hmm. that would be yeah i i think having it all in one day was just way 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 too much and i'm glad we're restarting tomorrow and get everybody a fresh start and wake up early get some get some more coffee in you and sort of spread it totally. out as opposed to try and mush it all into one day yeah yeah very true i agree it's nice it's like nice digestible the the 30 minute sessions i feel as well i'm like sitting there and i'm engaged start to finish it's 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 all been super interesting mm-hmm. yeah loved it so far and i'm also of course really excited to hear mark because it is as you said always really exciting when we get to have him here and at the very first introduction i ever had to him was um on our last own your growth that we had him on and it's it's pretty cool like he's the real deal so it's pretty cool to to get to learn from him yeah if there's anybody that uh, of like if you had to pick one person to listen to today of anybody that we've talked to i think mark's got the most street cred uh, in terms of like has actually has built huge revenue teams has grown and scaled the successful startup has sold in different or been a sales leader in different sales models doesn't get any more valuable than that absolutely all right well with that being said why don't we uh let's work on getting mark in here um so you are you gonna, you're gonna jump out and then join me at the at the end when we wrap it you're gonna sing a song right mm-hmm. Yeah, we'll sing together, <laughs> a beautiful duet. Yes, we'll sing together. We'll do the aha song and it won't be synced because because we are we have delay. So the audience will hear it like, mm-hmm. it'll be really nice. It's, it's the, well worth sticking around for. Um, In fact, I would argue better. it's more valuable and has more street cred than Mark Robert. Oh, me, me and you doing a duet. Yeah. All right, well, I'm letting Mark in. Sarah, thanks for, thanks for hanging out and we'll get Mark going really shortly here. Perfect. I will see you guys later. Awesome. Thanks, Sarah. Hey, Mark, how you doing? Hey, Colin, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. good. It's great to see you again. Yeah, you too, man. You too. How's it been today? It's been good. Yeah, good. We had a uh, we did like something different in the middle. We did a yoga break um, Ooh, over so lunch. Cool. Yeah, Julia, awesome. one, our marketing manager just got her uh, certification yeah. earlier this year or last year. Yeah, she did wow. a great job. I love yoga, man. I've done it the last two. I do it every other day. Um, so that's uh, that's really cool that folks did it, and they like what happened. Everyone put their cameras on and like watch each other do it. She just kind of let it. Uh, Sarah, Sarah, Julia, and myself, we sat here, and then nice. YouTube chat just made fun of my terrible yeah. <laughs> yoga. I, I stretch mm-hmm. and I do other things. Yoga is not one of the things I do yeah. on a regular basis, and it was very, yeah. very obvious. Yeah, that's awesome, man. You're still a young guy, dude. Like <laughs> I think, I think later in life, you, I'd encourage you to adopt it. It's like keeps whatever you like doing, hiking, running, biking, tennis, golf, whatever, you can go a lot longer when you do yoga, you know? You sound like my physio. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'm working on doing my physio exercises regularly nice. and then stacking in yoga and hits nice. and, and things like that. Yeah. Good deal. Right on, man. Yeah, I'm bummed. Sorry, Veronica. I, I like, I'm on the road right now and I don't have my t-shirt. I'm, I'm sorry. I think it went to my HBS, um, uh, you know, site so sorry i would i love when people send me swag for the the stuff and i love to support it and i apologize but um yeah i'll send a safe selfie thanks i see you in chat so 
we can we can include in the content after or something. Right on. Well, why don't why don't I get to the intro here? Uh, we've got YouTube is live. We've got Mark here. I'm for whatever reason my video decided to be pinstripe today. I'm not sure what the deal is there. So that's we're, funny. We're just living with it. I was it earlier looked like an aha video, like you know the one where they jump into yeah. the screen and it's all stenciled. So something's going yeah. on. If it's gonna go wrong today, it's gonna go wrong. It's gonna go wrong with yeah. your live. So that's not the worst thing. Yeah. So uh, we're not. Are we live now or no? We're live now. Oh, good. So should I share my screen with the slides? Yeah, yeah, let's get going. And I'll, I'll jump in with uh, just a quick intro of, uh, of Mark. Um, okay. We've got, I don't know, paragraphs and paragraphs. I think we could, your, your Wikipedia page oh, must be on, like man. four feet long. <laughs> uh, I mean, Thanks. I think one of the best books in sales, sales, sales development in terms of, I loved how you broke it down um, strategically or not strategically. It was almost formulaic, like that you almost provided like a bit of a formula to, you know, this is exactly, you know, these are the things that you need to do in terms of like rep scoring and things like that. That was really what uh, I remember, I want to say, um, David Scott wrote an article that referenced part of your book. Yeah. Um, yeah. He was, he was great. He was a great, um, like early, he, what do you say to me? He's like, it's super, I remember it was like 2008 or 2009 when he invested in HubSpot. He was like, it's so valuable that you're an engineer. Mm -hmm. And I did, it, it helped me click everything that like, cause I, I couldn't see it myself cause I was too in there, mm -hmm. but he, he'd worked with so many sales leaders. So yeah, that, that was, that was a cool article that he put together. It, it was incredible. And it's in reading what you've written. It's so, it's so obvious. Once you know that you're like, Oh, that's why, that's why he's so it's, everything is so organized. And so if you're not <laughs> familiar with Mark, he's the managing director at stage two capital. It's a venture capital firm. Um, He's also a senior lecturer at Harvard. I don't know if you've heard of it. Um, <laughs> I'd say I, most importantly, you were SVP of global sales and CRO at HubSpot. You were fairly early, right? You were like employee. Fourth employee. Yeah. There you go. And so in terms of people that have seen the journey from what we're all trying to replicate, Mark is the person. He's not only lived it, he's managed it. He contributed to, to a major startup in the space. Now he writes about it, teaches about it, and then invests in people that are doing it. Mark, cool. Thanks so I much love for being it, Colin. Here. Thank you. All right. And you can see my screen. Okay, Colin. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Great. So yeah. Hey everyone. I'm hoping you're having a great day. I mean, congrats to the team for putting together such a stellar, um, speaker series. Can't wait to see y'all in person at some point soon. Um, but, um, uh, yeah, so uh, we're going to go through, I've never done this speech before, actually. Uh, it was actually supposed to be a Saster speech in 2020. And then we all know what happened there literally like that week. Um, and I, have kind of dusted it off and, and the organizers are like, Hey, can you give this here? And, and hopefully I can keep iterating on it. Um, but, uh, but we're going to talk about the major problems. I'll tell you, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really comfortable on the chat. So if, if, I don't know if you have access to chat, um, but you can, you can chat away with reactions or, or, or questions. I'm happy to kind of incorporate if I seem appropriate, um, during the speech, but here's the context. I mean, as Colin mentioned, like I've just been really blessed the last six or seven years to have stepped out of a full-time operating role. And I just look at so many different startup sales and marketing teams or sales and marketing teams in general. I mean, I've done a lot of work for BCG with like $10 billion companies. I've done a lot of work for seed accelerators and everything in between. And, you know, there's, there's some pretty glaring um, potholes that I see almost all the time in growth. And I want to share, I think, the top seven with you today. Um, so we have a fun, I think, 45 minutes together. Um, I, if you know me, I tend to go a little bit of a faster pace, but I'm happy to post these slides. So don't feel like you have to take screenshots or stuff. I'll get these out to you on social media or, or through the crew. Um, and you can, you can take your time to absorb some of the more meaningful content. So here's the first one. And I don't think it's talked about much, but I see it all the time. And I've like worked with companies on it to help fix it later. But it's increasing your price without a sustainable moat, okay? And um, I typically see um, a company come out of the gate well, get what seems to be product market fit. They might be the first mover in a hot category. And the board's like, hey, you should raise your prices. <laughs> and, and they do. And honestly, it works for like the first year. But what we don't realize is you know, not only does the obvious things happen of when you increase that price naturally, 
you end up with a longer sales cycle. You end up with more friction with the buyer. But the thing that we miss the most is you are a much more attractive, um, disruptive target for future entrants. Okay, when you start and your price is reasonable, um, then it was harder for people to come in and disrupt. But if you go and really increase your price, like your board wants you to, you're going to have a great year and someone's going to come and disrupt you. All right. So I just want to like, you know, I love driving ACV, annual contract value, but I love doing it through expansion. Okay. And so I just really wouldn't would love, you know, if you're thinking about pricing strategies, you're early in your venture, potentially maybe you have a new product coming out you know, consider keeping that open price as tight as possible. That's why I love PLG and product like growth because it's almost free. And how hard is it to disrupt free? Um, and, and certainly drive ACV like the growth investors and, the, and Wall Street wants to see, but drive it through expansion. And so you can see the blue and the, and the green line here, which like in the old days, we used to like maximize price out of the gate and over time, the customer would, would, would kind of eventually see the value. And today's modern um, pricing models allow us to almost price just under the value. And it's a far less disruptable model. Now that naturally kind of dovetails into, well, first off, I just like, when I teach at pricing models, um, here's just a kind of a useful framework of how to think about the optimal price, which is it's a combination of, of three lenses. One is um, how does the buyer perceive ROI? So when you tell them it's $25,000 a year, how do they think about the value they're going to get? And is it like three times more? And it's a pretty good ROI, right? So it's almost their own payback on your own solution. That's one view. The other view is how much would it cost to do a competitive or to buy something else? Like you're preaching some value. I love the value. I just don't know if I want to extract that value with you. So what, what other ways can I do it? And how much does that cost me? And then the third piece is your own business model. Like, what do you need to charge for your unit economics to work? So just like an interesting framework to, for you to think about as if you might reflect on on some pricing on how to come to terms with the optimal solution for you. So that nat naturally dovetails into number two, which is, well, Mark, you said, don't increase price until I have a sustainable moat, but what's a sustainable moat? And this is where I, th I find there's just a lot of, a lot of kind of misguidance and, and confusion in the ecosystem on what a true moat is. When I ask an entrepreneur, what is your moat? They often reference a feature in their product. And then I ask them, okay, well, how long would it take the competition to copy it? And they say six months at most. It's not a sustainable moat, right? So I see a lot of teams relying on um, features that are copyable to, to create a moat. And that's really a temporary moat. So we want to talk about what a true sustainable moat is. And here's like the kind of the litmus test that I've talked to people about, and they found it really useful. And they kind of go back to management team. And the question is this, imagine there were like five rock star engineers that quit their companies, whether they were at Facebook or Google or LinkedIn or somewhere where they have like really good product jobs and they, raised a bunch of money from Sequoia and they attacked you. They came at your, your space. They literally reverse engineered your product, like downloaded the, it, bought it, whatever, figured out what it, it just copied it and then sold it for half the price. Why do you still win? When you're going head to head with them and someone has your exact product and they're selling it for half the price, why do you still win? If you still win, that's a sustainable moat. Now that's hard to do. And you don't have to do it. There are success stories out there where they just, they outpaced the competition and they got there. But I think a lot of the best success stories, whether purposefully or accidentally, ended up in a sustainable moat. So let's just spend a minute on that, on what is a temporary moat and what's a sustainable moat. Okay, so we already talked about examples like the feed product features as a temporary moat. Hey, I offer 24 seven support. Like, yeah, so now the competition next week can offer it too. We have the best integrations with HubSpot and Salesforce. They can build it as well. We have the most funding. They can raise money. Not too bad, but like, I mean, that's not the easiest one, but they can. We've got partnerships with all the best soft 
for players. Well, unless they're exclusive, like they're going to get those as well. Right. So we just have to be a little careful about how much we're resting in, um, in, in these particular modes. All right. Now, what is a real mode? Like, let's just rattle off a couple examples. And I put a link at the bottom here to uh, Michael Porter's work. If you've ever studied that, Michael Porter, Porter's Five Forces, really, it's a multi-decadal <laughs> work. It's still the best rigorous work I've seen on what true sustainable moats are. I think he calls it barriers to entry is one of the forces. And I'm going to list off what he talks about and give you modern examples of them, right? And so, um, you know, he talks about um, network effect, okay? And what that essentially means is for every additional person that joins your community or your product or whatever, then that adds, it's more valuable to the existing players, right? The telephone was the classic example. The first phone sucked. Like, what do you do with this thing? No one else had a phone. But then as people like adopted them, awesome, right? And so we've got really great modern examples in social networks like LinkedIn or marketplaces like Amazon, right? And so, so those exist in some of the modern business models that we have today. Um, then you got um, brand. Now he talks about brand and what's the version, modern version of brand? Content creation or category creation. Like I, I'll lean on my, you know, my, my ex company uh, HubSpot with inbound marketing, that was that was so important for us. I mean, they were copycats that came at us every year. They built the same product. They claimed to have built the same product. We still won because we we had created the inbound marketing category. If you're going to do inbound marketing, you got to do it with HubSpot. So that's an opportunity we all have as as companies today to create a mo economies of scale, right? So that just means like we have so much volume that is advantageous, like arguably in these cloud infrastructure plays like AWS and Snowflake and artificial intelligence. That's a little bit of debate out there, but I, I kind of do believe that the AI algorithm that has processed a billion transactions is naturally going to be better than an AI algorithm that's pro processed a hundred thousand. So if we're in AI, how do we get to process the most people? And that creates a sustainable moat that we will win even when the competition is under value and uh, underpricing us. Switching costs, like I don't love this one because it doesn't help you build the win the green field, but um, it's still valuable. And I think Salesforce is the classic example. You know, I mean, Salesforce is an unbelievable company, one of one of the most successful software companies in the world. I think when you talk to many people, I don't know if they love it. <laughs> I think they think it's expensive. Um, it's valuable because they pulled a lot of stuff together. Um, but it's just like all your stuff is in there. So you can't go anywhere, right? So there are opportunities to create switching costs. Um, there's distribution channels. I, that's, I'm really bullish on PLG these days, product-led growth. I mean, if you can get, if you can figure out how to get someone to adopt your product without involving a human and to see value of it from it and then either monetize them through a sales team or by having them triple wire and then monetize it, that is frigging hard. That is frigging hard for someone else. Like, and even if these ex Google engineers copy your thing, like, I mean, look at Zoom, like uh, with their free version, like someone creates a, uh, like a, a new Zoom. I don't know. It has such a good brand association. It's PLG. I just, I'm just going to download Zoom. And then when I trip the wire, I trip the wire. You know, so um, so that's certainly one that he, uh, this one doesn't work in software as much because it's patent oriented, but you know, I put Tesla down. Sometimes you have like regulatory um, things and then capital requirements can be, you know, I know con somewhat contradicts with my funding thing, but things like, you know, SpaceX, like <laughs> building rockets. I mean, certainly uh, you and I can't get together and like try to disrupt Elon and SpaceX um, very easily. Um, so so anyway, just some examples of, of moats. Um, and these are things that like, you need to know your 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 executive team needs to understand your sales team to understand, and sometimes we don't have to actually have a moat coming out of the gate, but we have to know what it's going to be. And sometimes moat development can come at the cost of growth. All right, so um, so just kind of have an eye toward what a true sustainable moat is. Be careful about raising your price too early around it, and make sure you're you're heading for it at some point. All right. Pothole number three, I'm not going to start with the title. I want to just start with this chart. <laughs> Happens so many companies. I don't know. Stare at this chart for a second. What is this saying? So what this says is 
it shows here um, the, the, the sales percent, I mean, for this individual, where do they rank on the team? Okay, so were you the top rep, in which case you're up here, and, or were you the bottom rep, in which case you were down here? And then it shows the probability of being promoted to manager. So this shows that if you're a top rep, you're more likely to be promoted to manager. Pretty intuitive. This is interesting. This shows where, again, where are you as a rep, top rep or bottom rep? How much value you create as a manager? <laughs> Holy cow. <laughs> it's inversely correlated. The top reps that were promoted to manager create the least value. So that's pothole number three that happens all the time is so many of these organizations are prone to their top rep to manager. All right, fine. So what do I do? Promote my worst rep? <laughs> no, I can't do that. Right. So, so we just have to appreciate that, like, just because someone's number one rep on your team, it does not default to manager. Okay. And I think this is a, a, a situation in almost all functions from marketing to finance, to HR, to product to engineering. It, I think it's very pronounced in sales. And, you know, we really have to think about like, what is the role of a salesperson and what does it take to be good there? And what is the role of a sales manager? And what does it take to be good there? And they're pretty different. You can have a big ego and be a little pushy and be really good at sales. Those aren't good at traits for a manager, right? So, so no, we can't promote our best, um, our, our worst reps to manager, but we have to, we don't necessarily want to look to our top rep. Okay? We want to look at anyone that's consistently hitting quota is a manager candidate and they're all equal manager candidates. Okay. And so there's a couple of things that we want to do here. Number one, let's make sure we create a growth path for our salespeople who don't aspire to be a manager or maybe don't have the abilities to be a manager and don't have the patience to develop them. They're just better staying as a salesperson. That's great. And I don't know why this isn't adopted as much as I kind of think it should be. But in addition to your compensation plan that you have every year for your salesperson, there should be a promotion path to grow and stay as a salesperson. Okay, so all this shows is a basic example from a company that's paying reps out of the gate 80K OTE and gives them some options. And the reps like, great, I don't want to be a manager, but I want to grow. I want to make more money over time. I want to get more options. How do I do that? It's very clear. You sell $60,000 of monthly recurring revenue over the course of however long it takes, six months, eight months, a year. You average your quota for three months in a row and you sell uh, you know, reasonable upfront contracts. These are haphazardly chosen. These can be selected by the strategy of the company, but it's crystal clear what I need to do to get promoted. And when I do, my variable comp gets bumped up and my I get more options and I have a new set of goals. So I was able to keep uh, reps at HubSpot for like on average seven or eight years through this model when the average tenure was like 2.2 on an inside sales model. So just think about that. And even like, especially the SDR function, I really like this approach for SDRs where it's like, it's brutal to cold calls, you know, for 12 to 18 months, it's brutal. But when you break that down into like two to three month tiers, where it's like you come out, you have a base salary and you have to make 50 dials a day for six weeks in a row and set three appointments. And once you do, you get graduated to tier two and now you qualify for the commission plan. And now you have to set four points a week and score an 80 plus on our SDR exam. And when you do, we're gonna give you access to the better leads. And once you have that, we're gonna, you have to keep doing 40 appointments a, a week. And now we're gonna put you on more of a quality score. Like you gotta generate at least 30,000 of ARR from your leads. And once you do that, then we increase your commission and you have the next set of goal. And once you do that, now you're an account executive training. And once you do that, now you can interview for an AE job. That just feels so much more progressive as opposed to like you had a cold call for 18 months and slug it out, right? So just think about applying this promotion path that's not uh, associated with managers. The other thing that I didn't put the slides in here on is um, for the manager path, um, what you wanna do is, yeah, fine. So Susan, you want to become a manager. Great. Just, you have to hit your quarter for two quarters in a row, and then I'll put you into sales leadership school. Right. And then you could create like a, um, I posted on this before, like 
pretty simple like leadership curriculum of reading and role plays that can span over the course of two or three months to expose Susan to what it will be like to be a manager. And once she gets through that, she can actually hire her the first rep under your guidance while still maintaining her role as a rep. I don't like the permanent team lead where you carry your own quota and manage reps, but I'm okay for it for a quarter. For Susan to go out, go through the interview process, interview some people, choose one with your guidance and then coach and mentor them to productivity. It's just one rep. Keep hitting your quota and manage this one rep. And then if it goes well, we'll give you an eight person team. But if you make mistakes, you didn't make a mistake with eight reps, you made a mistake with one. So that whole process is like a six month journey. And it gives us all a chance to see if Susan's actually going to be a good manager or not. All right. All right. Um, number four. Oh man, this happens like, I'm not sure I've never seen this not happen. I've, what's the right, that's a double negative. I've, I'm not sure that I've seen this never happen. <laughs> and that is um, prioritizing predictable revenue acquisition ahead of predictable customer value creation. It gets uh, all the time. Hi, hi founder, tell me about your business. Well, we have product market fit. Oh, how do you know? We have five customers and it works. Okay, um, so what are you doing now? Our new goal is a million in revenue. Oh, okay, so not really excited about that. Sounds intuitive, everyone does it. I think it's leading to a much higher failure. I think the failure rate for startups should be 60% and they're 80%. I think it's because of this. So, so this is kind of jam on that. Like, well, when should we make that million dollars our target? When should we move to like focusing on re predictable revenue? And yeah, the answer is product market fit, but like, let's just understand what product market fit is. I don't think product market fit is five people use your product and it works. I don't. I think the best measure of product market fit is if 90% of your customers every year stick around. Now, we don't have a year to figure that out. <laughs> and I, I, I can't figure out my churn like within the first few weeks. So we have to define what our leading indicator to retention is to understand product market fit as early as possible. And so this is where a lot of my work has been um, within the startup community and even businesses that are large that are rolling out new products or going to new markets is knowing if it's going well as early as possible. And that is to define a leading indicator of retention that has this particular format, which is P percent of customers achieve E event in T time. Well. You can see like what Colin said, my engineering, the kind of uh, bias coming out here, but let's just kind of humanize this a bit with the variables. So Slack, they have product market fit is 75% of the customers send 2000 team messages within the first 30 days of their lifespan was back. Slack, Dropbox, if 85% of customers back up their device in an hour and HubSpot, if 80% of customers use five or more features in their platform within 60 days. Now we're bringing to life the P percent E event T time variables. I love these definitions as product market fit much more so than five people use our cust our product and it works, right? So this puts the immediate North star on the business. Like the difference in HubSpot in year one and two, if Halligan got up and said, our new goal is a million in revenue. Imagine what everyone does in the business versus he stands up and says, our new goal is 80% of the customers we sign up will use five or more features within the first 60 days of their life. That is such a healthier business. And there are so few businesses that hit that, even when they scale to 100 million and eventually die. Okay, so, so and then this is a good way of looking at it by cohort, right? So this particular company acquired 24 customers in January. And it just measures each month month one, month two, month three, what percent hit the leading indicator? So by month six, only 39% had done it. That's terrible. You don't have a business. But they did a bunch of things. They enhanced the product. They enhanced the onboarding process. Most importantly and most impactfully, they enhanced the way they sell. They set better expectations with the right customers. And they acquired 50 of them in September. And look at that. By month two, 68% had achieved the leading indicator. That is product market fit. That is a foundation upon which to build a business and go to market machine that few organizations hit. And it's a prerequisite to success, okay? So just something to think about there. Um, and then there's an opportunity to align 
your go to market with it. If you're at this stage, you don't hire the awesome salesperson from salesforce.com. That person's going to show up asking for the pitch deck and the process. You don't have it yet. You need a salesperson that's out there talking to customers all day, giving feedback to the product and engineering folks so you can find product market fit. And I don't want to talk about demand gen or pricing or compensation. All that's unscalable right now. You know what David Cancel at Drift was doing at this stage? He was literally flying to customer sites that were paying him $50 a month. And he was personally onboarding them when they were a 10 person company. Do unscalable things early. That's what you need to do. Right. And so, so anyway, just something to think about. Hopefully, like, don't jump too quickly to setting top line revenue as your goal, especially before you've proven the predictable customer success creation and define your leading indicator. Okay. Related to that, what's a good way to do it to sustain that? as you move into the growth phase is I find a lot of people have compensation plans for their salespeople that are exclusively focused on bookings and not lifetime value. Like let's just take two reps. One rep signs up a million dollars of bookings in the 2020 and half their business cancels a year later. One rep signs a million dollars of bookings, maybe even less, 900,000 of bookings, less, but only 10% cancel and 20% upgrade. If those two reps make the same amount of money in your comp plan, I think you got a big problem. Now we can't like wait, the problem with the comp plans is we can't wait a year to fully commission them. Like we've got to reward or penalize salespeople at the time of behavior. So how can we do that? in this new world of SaaS and subscription, right? So I'll tell a HubSpot story here where it's like, I totally messed this up. So I, I had paid our reps. We only had one pricing plan. It was 250 a month. I'm like, here, I'll give you 500 bucks every time you sign up a customer. If they stick around for four months, you keep it. If they cancel within four months, I'm taking it back. Four month clawback. So what happened? Churn was crazy, out of control. And, um, I looked at the churn by customer success manager and it was like the same. Um, and so it was interesting how the churn unfolded. I looked at the churn in the first month of a customer's life cycle and I was like, no one canceled. Month two, no one canceled. Month three, no one canceled. Month four, no one canceled. Month five, everyone canceled. <laughs> and I'm like, that's weird. I implement a four month clawback and everybody cancels after the month four. <laughs> Sales reps work their comp plan and they're the ones that are driving this friggin' churn. So I, I basically, um, I, I sorted the reps by uh, the LTV they were creating, right? I used how many customers they were signing up every month in the green against what their churn rate was as a salesperson. And I calculated an LTV. And even though this person had the highest LTV by far, they are actually selling only 10.8 customers a month, which is less than the top rep, which is over here at 12. So according to all the typical ways we measure sales, this person over here, oh, look at this person signed up 13.2 customers a month, but a fraction of the LTV because their churn was 4.9%. So I basically told them, I'm like, listen, I'm going to like look at this chart every quarter and I'm going to put you into a tier. And if you're in the top LTV tier, I'm going to, I've double your commission. And if you're in the bottom quartile, then it's cut in half. But I'm going to train you how to sell good deals and churn drop by like 80% within six months. So just so much of these churn issues are, are, are based on how we're selling and the expectations we're setting. Now, I wouldn't recommend what I did there, to be honest with you. Um, the, the model I work with a lot of companies with today is it's a little simpler to put in place, I think. And that is you sign up a customer and you get half your commission when they sign the contract and half the commission when they hit their lead indicator of retention. Okay. So if you go to the Slack example where their lead indicator of retention is when the company sends 2000 team messages, um, then fine. Hey, congratulations for signing up like Microsoft as an account. Um, I'm giving you half the commission now on the signature. And once they hit 2000 team messages, I'll give you the other half. Now it doesn't mean Mrs. Mr. and Mrs. Sales rep 
that you should become customer success managers. That's not the point. Let the CSM team do their job. You can pay attention to what's going on so you can get your commission check and learn from it if it fails, because it's probably something you did. But all I want you to do is set good expectations so they know what it takes to set up Slack to get in front of the users and just set good expectations so that happens. In fact, I'll give you a free trial account. And if you can get them to send 2,000 team messages before they even sign up, then you get your full commission right off the bat. And you'll be surprised how many reps do that. And you'll be surprised the extraordinary impact that has on your business to align those the customer value creation with the selling activity. Okay, so just think about that comp plan and aligning LTV um, with um, uh, aligning the comp with the LTV, not not just bookings. All right, um, pothole number six: um, massive hiring of salespeople right after a financing round. Like seriously, fifty out of fifty times uh, last year, I talked to these companies, and they're like, <clears throat> "Oh yeah, yeah, it's going great. We uh, we got twelve people at the company. We got three salespeople. Uh, we got ourselves t- to three million dollars in revenue. It's great, and we just closed uh, a ten million dollars Series A. And now we got to scale, so that's why I'm calling you. I'm like, okay, cool. What's your plan? Well, we already um." We hired 12 reps this month. <laughs> you did what? You have three salespeople and 12 people in your company. You just hired 12 salespeople in a month? Yeah, is that bad? Yeah, that's really bad. <laughs> what, like, how many leads a month do you give your salespeople? I don't even, I haven't calculated. Most of our leads come from our CEO's referrals. Okay, great. So now we're spreading those referrals across 15 people. And like, do you have an onboarding program? Who's your managing them? Oh, I am. You're managing 15 people? And it's like, I, how, how many interviews did you do to get to 12 hires? Like, that, it's just, that's, whew, that causes a lot of failure. Pretty much every time I've seen it, it's like they fire 12 salespeople a year later, right? Because we don't have... Like, yeah, the spreadsheet kind of works if you're just looking at salesperson plus productivity, but it doesn't work in terms of like demand generation, sales management, onboarding, um, all that kind of stuff. So in, in the, even the interview and selection process, right? So what I prefer there, well, let's just kind of dive into that a second. Okay, so we did establish product market fit. So before we scale, we also want to establish go to market fit. And I've got a... um. I did this speech last year in this conference, so I'm not gonna dive in too much of this. If you didn't see it, you can you can Google Science of Scaling. You'll see on the stage two website, I got a nice ebook for you that you can download and read all through this. But it essentially just helps us understand that we have to achieve product market first. We already talked through that. Then we have to achieve go-to-market fit, which means not only can we predictably create customer success creation that we proved in product market fit, but we can do it profitably. We can do it with good unit economics. And so the way we know if we're achieving that good unit economics is we extract the unit economic target back to tangible sales va- um, metrics. I want to get LTV CAC at three. All right. So what does that mean in terms of like my cost per lead, my cost per sale, my conversion on leads to customers, all that kind of stuff. So I'm not going to go through the math here, but I'm just... I'm doing relatively simple algebra to take LTV to CAC greater than three and extracting that back to variables that we can control. Like how many leads does my SDR team create? How many bookings a a week do they do? How many appointments? What's the conversion rate on appointments? What's the average sale price? That kind of stuff. Okay. And then I can really just instrument that into a business model and then instrument that into a dashboard. I know I went a little fast. I did this last year for y'all. And it's all written up. So the point is from a high level is at the go to market fit, we want to achieve positive unit economics in order to do so and know as early as possible, we have to extract positive unit economics, the outcome into input variables like leads per salesperson, close rates per lead, average, average sale price to know that we're on track. Okay. And so once we have those two things, we've instrumented our retention, leading the case retention shown here. And we've instru- instru- uh, instrumented our leading indicators of unit economics, which is shown here. We now have a speedometer. So that's kind of the 
answer to the scale is like, great, congratulations on, on getting the $12 million Series A. But please don't hire 12 reps this month. Hire one, hire two reps every other month for the next six months. And then watch the speedometer. Are you properly onboarding and hiring these people so that they create good deals? Are you expanding demand gen so you can feed them? Most people understand that their business broke at the quarterly p and but that's what happened nine months ago. The speedometer is telling us what's happening right now. And so if the speedometer stays green and you go through six months and hire two reps every other month and hire two reps every month, and if it stays green for another six months and hire four reps a month and then hire eight reps a month. And now you're a unicorn and you're a unicorn in a very scientific way. Okay, so just some thoughts on how to think about scale. Don't, don't think about the hiring as this one lump sum at the beginning of the fiscal year immediately after a, a fundraise. Think about it as a pace and set, set up your speedometer to know and optimize your optimal, your pace for your organization. Okay, last one is expansion and growth. Okay, and this is um, assuming that the playbook we figured out in our current segment will work in the next segment. And that segment could be any of these three variables. It's a, it's a market channel product combination. Okay, so let's say that we came out of the gate and we have our core product that we're selling to the mid market uh, or to the SMB and we do it through uh, content marketing. Okay, so that's what we got good at. And we scaled to 15 million in revenue, that's awesome, okay? But that doesn't, usually there's a ceiling on that and we have to find a new growth channel. So we can go upstream, we can change the market and go upstream to expand from SMB to upstream, up uh, enterprise, which happens a lot. We can uh, find new demand gen channels. We can, we can diversify from just content marketing and introduce an outbound SDR team. Or we can build a new product. We can sell to the same market through the same channel. It's just we've now this new product that we can upsell with. But anytime we change one of those variables, there's a high probability that the go-to-market machine that we built is not optimized for the new segment. But yet we think it is. Okay, so we have to be really careful and basically segment out our business into these three dimensions, what you see here as really a replication of the prior slide. This company is in the mid market and the enterprise there. They, it's a little different. They sell through partners and through uh, direct and they have a current product and they're building a new product. And as CEO founder or VP of sales, I can dictate where am I ready to scale because we have product market fit and go to market fit according to the science scaling framework. And where do we not have that, but we want to run experiments to unleash those as future scale segments. And where should we ignore? Because we're a young company and we can't attack all eight of these at once. And so once I do that, it gives me direction as to like, okay, fine. I have to hire two reps every other month for the next six months to hit our board plan. I'm going to put those into the scale segments, the green, the green people are the new hires. I'm going to keep the other segments where I'm learning as small cross-functional teams that look just like when I started out as a seed business, because it's really hard to learn while you're scaling. So you want to scale the core and we want to experiment and learn in the new stuff. Okay. And there's this remarkable um, framework that's taught at Harvard Business School called the Ampidextrous Organization by Michael Tishman. And what he means is ambidextrous is you can use your right hand and your left hand. And we, I, I, I kind of, we did this at HubSpot without me even knowing about the framework. And then I watched it untail, unfold at a lot of different companies. And it's like, he's got this framework spot on. And so, you know, ambidextrous is you use your right and your left hand equally. And what he's showing, he's kind of using it as an analog to say, as an organization, when you hit 10, 15, 20 million in revenue and you need to unlock new growth avenues, you need to be good at scaling what you know and learning what you don't. And he's got this three prong playbook to do that, which is one, create a, an overarching strategy to encompass the core and the new, and to make sure they're reporting at the top, not by PL size, but by strategic value, and that they're measured in a different way. 
Okay, so I'm gonna bring those to life with a quick example from, from HubSpot with our CRM. Okay, so at this point, this is like the year 2013, I think. We've been in business for like seven years. We've made all of our money through marketing software. We created the inbound marketing world uh, term. We've on, we only have inbound marketing software, a blog, an SEO tool, an email tool, et cetera. And Halgan and Darmash were like, okay, we're going to add a CRM now, all right? And, and we're like, okay, cool. Now here's the problem. Let's talk about the first one, embracing uh, develop an overarching strategy. Here's our homepage at that time. Create marketing people love. HubSpot provides all the software you need to do to do inbound marketing. That's what everyone knows us as. Now we have a CRM. No, we don't. <laughs> no one's going to buy a CRM from this company. So we need to broaden the strategy to encompass both the old and the new. And so here is a new web website. Grow your business. Start a free trial on the marketing platform or the sales platform. Right? The other thing is hold tension at the top. Most organizations, when like, okay, great, we, we're making, we have $80 million in revenue from our marketing product, and we have $100,000 in revenue from our sales product. So let's stick the sales product way down in the organization, reporting to some director of product with a team, and they'll figure it out. No, they're not. They're not going to. They'll never figure out how to get that product out from the shadow of the marketing product. Someone with political power is going to have to run, you know, offense for them to make sure and help the organization appreciate the strategic value that this project has. And so Tushman says, hold attention at the top. And that's what happened. Myself and Christopher O'Donnell were put in part of, uh, a charge of this CRM product and we reported directly to Halligan. It was a hundred thousand dollar line business. And the other one was 80 million. But the, the, the org structure was driven by strategic value, not PL value. And that's what Tushman preaches, and that works very well. Okay. Um, and the last part is embrace inconsistency. What he means by that is kind of what we've been talking about in this session a little bit is when you come up with that new product, that new segment, you're going to go upstream now. You're going to add this new product. You're going to embrace outbound marketing to complement your inbound marketing. The first, not, the first goal is not the same as the core. It's not a million dollars ARR. The first goal is product market fit. The second goal is go to market fit. And the third goal is growth. So you have to kind of restart the methodology. Hopefully it goes fast. Hopefully you're right. And the go to market playbook is going to apply. I doubt it, but I hope it's close. And you've got to start out if you're going to go in upstream, if you're going to add that new product, you can't jump to a million dollars as that North Star metric. You've got to focus on the lead indicator within that segment or with that new product. And that's what he means by embracing consistency. Okay. Measure the core by PL, measure the new by pace of learning. Okay. All right. Um, so just to wind up here, I know we've got two minutes left. Um, so uh, thank you, Colin, for the intro, just what I've been up to these days. So I'm three years into venture capital firm that I co-founded with uh, Jay Poe. It's the first uh, venture capital co firm called Stage Two Capital. Uh, we're on fund two right now. Um, uh, we uh, uh, we have over 250 investors in that fund, and we essentially went after um, the CROs, CMOs, COOs, CCOs, all the go-to-market execs from the the most famous software companies in the world. Um, so you can see the list here. You know we have the CRO, CMO, COO of either like Atlassian or Snowflake or Zoom or GitHub or Twilio, Dropbox, um, Salesforce, SAP, um, you know, just just a great group. And every day we go out and and assess companies that we think have huge potential and then um, and use the collective network to support them on their go to market uh, strategy and design. Um, if you want, there's a couple assets here that I've um, Oh, by the way, we typically invest when these organizations are not raising money. Usually they're around a million in revenue between the seed and the A. So if you fit that, um, we actually have a very strong lens toward product market fit and customer value creation. So if you fit that, we'd love to hear from you. Um, and then uh, these are just some assets for you all that I've, I'm still, I'm going to build up the content marketing program again, but we've got a pretty, I think, an interesting blog where I interview a lot of these folks. We have the science of scaling ebook, we've got um, a bottoms up um, template that you can use to figure out how fast you can actually go and, and model out how to get to 1 million and 5 million and 10 million. 
I got hiring your first sales leader uh, playbook. So those are some of the assets that you can check out. And then I know, you know, thank you again, uh, Colin, for the kind words in the book. I'm, I'm kind of amazed and, and humbled at how, how many of you continue to see value from it um, and just know that 100% of the proceeds are donated to this awesome organization, build.org. Uh, if you haven't checked out Build, check them out. Um, they're in over a dozen cities across the country, um, playing a, a huge role in, in addressing the inequality divide that we see um, by basically partnering with the worst performing high schools in the major cities, teaching these young kids who uh, haven't been dealt the deck that many of the folks probably on the call have in their life and teaching them entrepreneurship to get them through high school and into college. And I think the graduation rate is like 85% for those that are, or 99% for those involved and like over 80% go to college, which is way higher than the averages for those high schools. So if you bought the book, thank you for the support. 100% of the proceeds go to build.org. And um, if you're looking for some additional soul food in your overall professional curriculum, check out build. It's an awesome place to go and volunteer. Thank you for the time. I hope you extracted some value from that. I was taking so many notes. It's always, um, yeah, always a pleasure getting a chance to <laughs> talk to Thanks, Colin. Man. Yeah, I, I love the, I, I remember the the first time I saw your, and we'll see if my video actually works here. I'm trying to get it going, but we'll see. Yeah, we'll, we'll, take, see. The, we'll take the pinstripes. Yeah. I know, I know you got this weird thing going on, but. Yeah, it's uh, it's just refusing. So we may, may no. Well it looks good. Actually, you didn't even I didn't even notice the pinstripes to set it. And now I've said it to everyone; they're gonna notice. But it looks, yeah, it's all good. <laughs> right, right on. <laughs> yeah, I think the thing that like blew me away that I've I've had so many conversations with revenue leaders. Like I, I think I did 150 episodes on our podcast. Oh gosh, I've I've had probably thousands of sales calls here at Predictable Revenue that I've handled myself. And the thing that that cube concept is something I've tried explaining and I wish I'd seen your, that cube like years ago. Would, <laughs> I'd have been like, look, just look at what Mark says. <laughs> it's so much because you know, you get so, so frequently I talk to people about how to, how to get their, you know, what to do next. And they've got this yeah. product and things are working. They're like, well, should I go for a new market or should I go for a new product? And it's like, it's, it's so easy. You just, you know, this is how you look at it. And it's like, you can yes. either go deeper or you can go higher, yes. but you can't yes. try and do all of the things. And I think the most no. important takeaway is you have to treat all of those different elements separately as differently. They're not exactly the same. It's not just one rev team. And I love Yeah, that. it probably happens all the time. Where, like Colin, when you're seeing these people in the growth mode, cause they're going to hit that ceiling. And hopefully that gives a little framework that you're pointing out, right? Which is first off, most people will just say like this, like, okay, well, I know we're trying to go from 15 million to 30 this year. And I know we, we've got, we have so much forecastability around our current business, which is selling this product to the S and B through inbound marketing. Okay. And unfortunately, when we stretch the spreadsheet out this year, it only takes us to 25. So we're missing $5 million. Mm -hmm. And so what most organizations do is first off, they detect that in December, the month before the, the annual plan, which is way too late. And then they just tell the board, Hey, I got an idea. We're going to go upstream and get $5 million from there. And we're gonna do it by just running the same playbook. And that just doesn't work. So, so to your point, Colin, like I, when you're hitting that 10, 15 million, you've gotta have a part of your investment in business running some experiments. And to your point, eight is too many and zero is too few, right? So, and it's mm -hmm. probably gonna take six to 12 months to get through that sequence, to, to understand how to sell upstream. How long did it take you to find product market fit to begin with, right? And yep. so you gotta have that experiment funnel hoping that in 2021, one of them will hit and be your 22, 2022 growth engine. And I think the timing piece is so critical because if you miss, if you miss that timing piece, you're gonna miss your whole, you're gonna miss everything. You will. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So if you're, if you're thinking about these things, the time to start is as soon as you're thinking, as soon as you're looking like 18 months down the road and not like you said, uh, when you've got a board meeting coming up and it's, it's time to, uh, time to pay the toll, I guess you could say. Yeah. Don't commit to that, that revenue number too early. Yeah. Just even if you're in that jam and you're like, shit, well, we still got to make up for it sometime. At least that expectation of like, I think we can get 5 million from this but I'm not going to say we're going to start selling revenue right now. Our first gate is by the end of this quarter. We want to see 
this percent of our customers achieving this event. Mm -hmm. If that happens, then we'll move forward with the revenue piece. But if it doesn't, we're going to have to reset expectations with you and the board. Mm -hmm. When you said, uh, how inspiring would it be for the uh, for a, for Brian to stand up and say, by the end of the year, we're going to hit a million dollars <laughs> in revenue? And I went, yeah. oh no, I said that. <laughs> <laughs> but did you guys have product market fit? That's okay. I think that's okay if if you are at that stage, you know. But yeah, that's that's kind of a different point too, Colin. It was like that's a little bit more being more mission oriented. And Halligan never did that. He never did that. He was very mission oriented. Like mm -hmm. we want to change the way people market and make it better experience for the buyers. It was very mission oriented. And by the way, yeah, as we do that, we're going to get to like 25 million in revenue. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, the whole point is just like, there's so many of these founders will set that, set that revenue target prematurely when we should be focused on consistent customer value creation. 100%. I recently yeah. read um, Good Strategy, Bad Strategy, and they were talking about a number is not strategy. And that was like <laughs> nice. a similar facepalm moment. Um, <laughs> I was like, I've seen this with, you know, our clients, people I've talked to, friends, I've done it myself. Oh, honestly, almost every year that we've been running PR is like the number is the strategy. And there's yeah. other things, but what you end up communicating to people is here's this number and this is the strategy. And they're like, well, what comes next? It's like, oh, well, we're going to let our people figure that out. It's like, oh, <laughs> okay, I guess I'm out. <laughs> nice. Nice. Yeah. Um, love what you're doing at stage two. What's the best way for people to get in touch with you, find more content? I know you get the blog. Mm -hmm. We've got yeah. a bunch of resources. Yeah, we're going to ramp up the blog again. We spent the last year raising money. Um, so it just like it was a little hard to keep that going. But I literally am working on a PLG article right now that I hope to get out this weekend. Nice. Um, so, yeah, the blog's a great place. Um, there's a bunch of like, cont you know, ways to get in touch with us on stage two if you want to do it that way. And then I'm pretty active on LinkedIn if you want to just pay me there. Sweet. And are you, is your podcast on Spotify or Apple or? I don't have one. Oh, I just blog. Yeah. Gotcha. I, so what I do is like, um, a lot of the, some of the blogs you'll see there is like, obviously I'm, I'm quite humbled by the investors we have around us. You know, many of the CROs from top software companies. And of course I lean into that by, uh, conducting, you know, five or 10 minute interviews, mm -hmm. uh, on certain topics, you know, Hillary Headley who ran, who runs, uh, uh, sales ops at Zoom. We talked a lot about like their crazy year and how she operationalized that. John McMahon, who just published a great book called Qualified Leader and was on the, he has on the board at Snowflake and MongoDB. Um, he talked about like how to run a great pipeline review with a, with a rep, which he's done is probably better than anyone in the world. So we try to like, I talked to the CEO of Asana, OJ, uh, where we talked about um, like in, in integrating CSM with the sales team, right? So I try to get like really tactical with those things. And we don't run it necessarily through a podcast. It's just a video on the on the blog if you want to check out those discussions. Cool, man. I heard interview and I was like, I just assumed podcast or, or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah, sure. Cool, mm -hmm. cool. I hope you won't be offended if I send the link to your blog to my marketing team and say, hey, go find all of these people because we want to talk to them on our podcast. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> it's public information. It's public information. So yeah, go ahead. That'd be, that'd be great. They're all like, it's funny because they're all, they, you know, that's a good place to start because they're people who, because they got involved with us, they they see the value of looking beyond their just they, their day to day operating and and really want to add value to the ecosystem. Um, so it's probably a good starting point to to hit them up. Right on. And fair question, like, is it all B two B or B two C? A little bit of both. Yep, we used to B two B. You know, because we're all we're all you know that's my background and the people that we've gotten in the fund. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's probably ex some cases there's some B2C plays that scale through a sales team. So they look a little more like B2B. So we'll, mm -hmm. we'll do those. Um, that that's, it's pretty much B2B. Yeah, that's fair. It two totally different motions. I'm, you know, yeah. I look at the B2B and I'm like, I kind of get that. I look at B2C and I'm confused. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little of the movie business out there. It's like, you just don't know what's going to stick. And when it goes, it goes and it's big. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's you know to me it's a foreign language that it sounds interesting. I'd like to try and learn about it, but uh, yeah, yeah, I'll stick with what I know for now. Nice, Mark. Thank you so much for coming on. I could keep asking you questions and talk forever, but I know we uh, there's only so much time in the day. So I really appreciate you taking cool. some and giving it to us. Yeah, you bet, Colin. Thanks to you and everyone for putting this this together. I think it's a huge value for the ecosystem. Right on. Yeah, I think the team's done a great job this year. Cool. Right on. Take care. You too. All right. Nice. Good keynote. Oh, uh, uh, the best, the best. I, I think anytime we can get Mark on, yeah, I'm. As you might be able to tell, I'm kind of a Mark Robert super fan. So, you know. 
Um, for good reason. For good reason. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm sitting there taking, I genuinely was like, I could take notes on my phone. <laughs> and I was like, senior team, you guys all better watch this. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Have, have you ever, yeah, what was your, yeah, any, any highlights, any favorites from either Mark's talk or today? Um, oh, that's tough. It, it, it was nice because it was so varied. I feel like we really, we tackled a whole bunch of different um, subjects in this one. Um, uh, for, from Mark's talk in particular, the idea, I don't know, this was right at the tail end. So it's probably the thing sticking in everyone's mind, but just like the revenue number or revenue target is like not your, your strategy and like also not as important as whatever your strategy is. Um, and also you can't have a revenue number without a strategy of how to get there. Like all of that kind of stuff that absolutely of course makes sense. And I think we apply it in some way, but if you actually just like look at it in black and white, it's like, okay, yeah, you're right. Um, <clears throat> that was really interesting for me. Um, and then what else? It was all great to be honest. Yeah. So I really love the variety. I love if you can get a taste of a whole bunch of different stuff in an event. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think for me, it was a mix. It was like a really great mix of, you know, we, we got into onto the sales side with um, with David this morning. Then we, t we got, we had a writer on, like a guy who writes nonfiction books. And I mean, also helps with, and like we talked about community and then we finished off with just like high end, um, you know, speaker like Mark. Um, it's, it's got me excited. Like I'm, I'm definitely going to go back and read or re-listen to it. Cause there's only so many, there's only so much you can capture that first time, especially yeah. when you're monitoring stream labs and like chat and hoping that you don't, you know, you don't want to touch your computer too much cause things might just explode or <laughs> totally. give you a pinstripe video like an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Definitely worth rewatching all of them. So good thing. It's all just ready to rewatch in YouTube the second we stop basically. Totally. Um, last request to, to those still hanging out. Appreciate you, you sticking it up for the day. Or if you're rewatching this, thank you. know, thanks for, for making the time investment. Yeah. Love if you hit that thumbs up button, if we did a good job. And if you, if we didn't do a good job, hit that thumbs down button. If we really, really didn't do a good job, hit it twice. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And reminder as well. Um, don't forget guys to sign up for conversation starter. So that is still something that's very useful for creating meaningful connections, whether it is today, tomorrow, or in an ongoing way. So, um, you'll be able to set up 12 minute video calls with other participants. You'll be able to create those meaning connections. Like I mentioned with like-minded professionals that are also, um, in this, in this event or in the Slack community. Um, and it's your chance to kind of get out there, share your insights. This is really going into what, uh, Jared said about community. It's a chance to share that value meet some people um and if two or more people from the same company join you'll be participating to win that email sequence consult email sequence consultation um by one of our in-house experts which is worth five thousand us big ones so definitely worth joining our conversation starter right on thank you sarah what else do we have mm -hmm. the the conversation starters there's the slack community there's the hit like yep. subscribe etc mm -hmm. there's the see you tomorrow there's see you tomorrow and what's coming up tomorrow yeah, let's talk about that. I'll put this. I'll put the schedule on screen yeah, uh, good. for a little bit. So we're gonna kick it off with Aaron uh, and doing Great. an AMA eight thirty tomorrow morning. That's too early Pacific Standard <laughs> Time. I got kids. They're gonna. They're crawling on me until like eight <laughs> seven fifty nine. <laughs> and then you've got uh, you've got the nine fifteen. So what are we talking about with Nadia? Is it not not so, how much Nadia? I, yeah, Nadia. Okay. <clears throat> Yeah, so we're, uh, gotcha. Nadia is head of business development at Lemlist, and we're going to be talking about oh, um, right. the step-by-step -step guide to fill in your pipeline by building relationships and using combo prospecting. So that's pretty interesting. I'm really, yeah, I'm really excited to talk to uh, Nadia all about that. Um, I think we've had guests from Lemlist before. We like mm -hmm. Lemlist. We know they're they're the real deal and they get it done. So I'm really excited to have Nadia. And then after that, you are going to talk to, no, actually you're going to talk to Nadia and then I'm going to talk to Colin, but why don't you tell everybody about Colin? He's got a great name. <laughs> the guy really knows his stuff when it comes to prospecting. Um, and, uh, yeah, basically what's, what's new in 2021, right? Well, I think this is, this is going to be the interesting thing. Like how have channels adapted? How has, I don't want to spoil too much. What's, what's new, what's changed, what doesn't work, what still works. Cause I think there's some surprising discoveries that are still working despite everybody saying, oh no, they don't work. And I understand this is a little ironic given that Aaron wrote in his book 10 years ago that cold calling doesn't work. Cold calling is dead long sure. with cold calling. 
So there's things that work, there's trends, there's, there's going to be bandwagons to jump on and jump off of. And I think the most important takeaway is just what are some things from this one that I'm excited about is like, what are some things that you can try, right? And Colin's yeah. got a really amazing lens. He's worked for some really incredible companies. And I think we could say the same thing about Justin Michael. Um, in a, sure could. This, this guy is like, imagine your friend who's just got so much energy and then imagine you force them to drink a six pack of Red Bull. <laughs> and then a cup of coffee. That's Justin. And he is going to blow your mind with information. He's got such a, a differentiated lens that he sees the world through. I love mm -hmm. it. And the whole the whole cyborg thing. I took his test and I was like, I wonder how I'm going to do on this. Yeah. Uh, Justin's mom was the, was my answer to a number of his questions. So I, I'm <laughs> curious how people will, will do. Um, then we get another yoga, yoga break. And then uh, you're going to bring us home with Brooklyn? That's right. So that is... Um, as we mentioned, we've got two wonderful sponsors for this event, uh, Rev Genius and Sales Hacker, and Brooklyn Nash is the head of content for Sales Hacker. So we are gonna be talking about um, applying the Pareto principle to SEO. So this is now another interesting, as we're saying, we're full of variety for this conference. So we're going into the world of marketing. Um, so we've got something helpful for really the entire revenue generating organization. But yeah, I'm really excited to speak to Brooklyn about that. Of course, Sales Hacker, again, talking about community, one of those great communities for sharing valuable content um, with all of their members um and another one just to follow like great content great great things to learn from sales hacker and then finally last but not least our second keynote is john tell us about john colin well are you familiar with marketo or you know um oh i'm john a blank ever no, no not ever Fuck. dang it um <laughs> the abm tool so he was the early founder in uh, in Mar or not early founder he was the one of the founders in marketo and um and oh man i'm embarrassed i can't remember this and then he they obviously you know grew that and sold that um and then he went out and he founded a an account-based marketing company that was recently acquired by demand base um and nice. yeah and i'm just i'm totally drawing a blank engageo engageo thank you i kept wanting to say everstring and i knew it wasn't everstring thank you for that yeah um, John, I've, I've had the, the pleasure of talking to John a couple times we, when we updated, um, yeah, when we updated our last book, we, I think we re-interviewed John and it was nice. incredible. The, the guys, um, I mean, he's been part of the in internet infrastructure in the sales and marketing space for so long and he's had a chance to see, uh, I mean, you, you could argue Marketo is one of the most influential sort of sales automation companies up there with Salesforce, or sorry, marketing automations in, in sort of at almost at the same level as Salesforce um, or Outreach or Sales Lab. So um, I'm super excited. He's talking about how he predicted the marketing automation space and uh, and how it changed and how it was going to change. And we're going to talk a little bit about what's next. I'm not going to talk that much. He's going to talk because I don't know what's next other than John. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Yeah, really exciting day coming up again tomorrow, guys. So really looking forward to seeing you guys all there again. Um, once again, hit that subscribe button if you enjoyed, enjoyed what you saw today. And um, please sign up for Conversation Starters so that you can meet some of the wonderful people who are watching there alongside you. Um, and join the Slack community, of course, so that you can ask the speakers questions. That's another great opportunity to have sort of a one-on-one -on -one conversation with those guys. Um, yeah, I think that's everything. Cool. I, I get to check out the conversation starters. I've obviously been in here all day, so I haven't had a chance to do that, but I definitely, yeah. that's such an, like, that's the reason I go to conferences is like that person to person connection. It's one of the things that's missing with the virtual conferences that we wanted to bring back here. So yeah, super excited for those. Big thanks to everybody who hung out with us to the end. Mm -hmm. Stas, good to see you. Alvo, uh, Jonathan, Jeff, um, much appreciated. R2, Neve, Chrissy, Hebran. Great, uh, great chat. And thanks for contributing to the conversation today. And we'll see you all tomorrow. Thanks so much, guys. See ya.